the gloved hand by burton e stevenson chapter one the falling star i was genuinely tired when i got back to the office that wednesday afternoon for it had been a trying day the last of the series of trying days which had marked the progress of the Minturn case and my feeling of depression was increased by the fact that our victory had not been nearly so complete as i had hoped it would be besides there was the heat always during the past ten days there had been the heat unprecedented for june with the thermometer climbing higher and higher and breaking a new record every day as i threw off coat and hat and dropped into the chair before my desk i could see the heat waves quivering up past the open windows from the fiery street below i turned away and closed my eyes and tried to evoke a vision of white surf falling upon the beach of tall trees swaying in the breeze of a brook dropping gently between green banks fountains that frisk and sprinkle the moss they overspill pools that the breezes crinkle and then i stopped for the door had opened i unclosed my eyes to see the office boy gazing at me in astonishment he was a well-trained boy and recovered himself in an instant your mail sir he said laid it at my elbow and went out i turned to the letters with an interest the reverse of lively the words of henley's ballade were still running through my head veil lily and periwinkle wet stone crop on the sill the look of leaves a-twinkle with windlets again i stopped for again the door opened and again the office-boy appeared mr godfrey sir he said and close upon the words jim godfrey entered looking as fresh and cool and invigorating as the fountains and brooks and pools i had been thinking of how do you do it godfrey i asked as he sat down do what keep so fit by getting a good sleep every night do you i groaned as i thought of the inferno i called my bedroom i haven't really slept for a week i said well you're going to sleep tonight. that's the reason i'm here i saw you in court this afternoon one glance was enough yes i assented one glance would be but what's the proposition i'm staying at a little place i've leased for the summer up on the far edge of the bronx i'm going to take you up with me tonight, and i'm going to keep you there till monday that will give you five nights sleep and four days rest don't you think you deserve it yes i agreed with conviction i do and i cast my mind rapidly over the affairs of the office with the minturn case ended there was really no reason why i should not take a few days off you'll come then said godfrey who had been following my thoughts don't be afraid he added seeing that i still hesitated you won't find it dull i looked at him for he was smiling slightly and his eyes were very bright won't i no he said for i've discovered certain phenomena in the neighbourhood which i think will interest you when godfrey spoke in that tone he could mean only one thing and my last vestige of hesitation vanished all right i said i'll come good i'll call for you at the marathon about ten thirty that's the earliest i can get away and in another moment he was gone so was my fatigue and i turned with a zest to my letters and to the arrangements necessary for a three days absence then i went up to my rooms put a few things into a suitcase got into fresh clothes mounted to the astor roof garden for dinner and a little after ten was back again at the marathon i had higgins bring my luggage down and sat down in the entrance porch to wait for godfrey just across the street gleamed the lights of the police station where he and i had had more than one adventure for godfrey was the principal police reporter of the record it was to him that journal owed those brilliant and glowing columns in which the latest mystery was described and dissected in a way which was a joy alike to the intellect and to the artistic instinct for the editorial policy of the record for its attitude toward politics wall street the trusts society i had only aversion and disgust but whenever the town was shaken with a great criminal mystery i never missed an issue godfrey and i had been thrown together first in the holiday case and that was the beginning of a friendship which had strengthened with the years then came his brilliant work in solving the marathon mystery in which i had also become involved i had appealed to him for help in connection with that affair at elizabeth and he had cleared up the remarkable circumstances surrounding the death of my friend philip van Tien in the affair of the boule cabinet 
so i had come to turn to him instinctively whenever i found myself confronting one of those intricate problems which every lawyer has sometimes to untangle reciprocally godfrey sometimes sought my assistance but of course it was only with a very few of his cases that i had any personal connection the others i had to be content to follow as the general public did in the columns of the record certain that it would be the first to reach the goal godfrey had a peculiar advantage over the other police reporters in that he had himself years before been a member of the detective force and had very carefully fostered and extended the friendships made at that time he was looking on rather as an insider and he was always scrupulously careful to give the members of the force every bit of credit they deserved sometimes considerably more than they deserved in consequence he had the entree at times when other reporters were rigorously barred it was nearly eleven o'clock before godfrey arrived that evening but i was neither surprised nor impatient i knew how many and unexpected were the demands upon his time and i always found a lively interest in watching the comings and goings at the station across the way where alas the entrances far exceeded the exits but finally a car swung in from the avenue at a speed that drew my eyes and i saw that godfrey was driving it jump in he said pushing out his clutch and pausing at the curb and as i grabbed my suitcase and sprang to the seat beside him he let the clutch in again and we were off no time to lose he added as he charged into high and turned up seventh avenue at the park he turned westward to the circle and then northward again out amsterdam avenue there was little traffic and we were soon skimming along at a speed which made me watch the cross streets fearfully in a few minutes we were across the harlem and running northward along the uninteresting streets beyond at this moment it occurred to me that godfrey was behaving singularly as though he were hastening to keep an appointment but i judged it best not to distract his attention from the street before us and restrained the question which rose to my lips at last the built-up portion of the town was left behind we passed little houses and little yards then meadows and gardens and strips of woodland with a house only here and there we were no longer on a paved street but on a macadam road a road apparently little used for our lamps sending long streamers of light ahead of us disclosed far empty stretches without vehicle of any kind there was no moon and the stars were half obscured by a haze of cloud while along the horizon to the west i caught the occasional glow of distant lightning and then the sky was suddenly blotted out and i saw that we were running along an avenue of lofty trees the road at the left was bordered by a high stone wall evidently the boundary of an important estate we were soon past this and i felt the speed of the car slacken hold tight said godfrey turning sharply through an open gateway and brought the car to a stop then snatching out his watch he leaned forward and held it in the glare of the side lamp five minutes to twelve he said we can just make it come on lester he sprang from the car and i followed realizing that this was no time for questions this way he said and held out a hand to me or i should have lost him in the darkness we were in a grove of lofty trees and at the foot of one of these godfrey paused up with you he added and don't lose any time and he placed my hand upon the rung of a ladder too amazed to open my lips i obeyed the ladder was a long one and as i went up and up i could feel godfrey mounting after me i am not expert at climbing ladders even by daylight and my progress was not rapid enough to suit my companion for he kept urging me on but at last with a breath of relief i felt that i had reached the top what now i asked do you see that big straight limb running out to your right yes i said for my eyes were growing accustomed to the darkness sit down on it and hold on to the ladder i did so somewhat gingerly and in a minute godfrey was beside me now he said in a voice low and tense with excitement look out straight ahead and remember to hold on to the ladder i could see the hazy mist of the open sky and from the fitful light along the horizon i knew that we were looking toward the west below me was a mass of confused shadows which i took for clumps of shrubbery then i felt godfrey's hand close upon my arm look he said for an instant i saw nothing then my eyes caught what seemed to be a new star in the heavens a star bright sharp steel blue why it's moving i cried he answered with a pressure of the fingers the star was indeed moving not rising not drifting with the breeze but descending descending slowly slowly 
i watched it with parted lips leaning forward my eyes straining at the falling light falling is not the word nor is drifting it did not fall and it did not drift it deliberately descended in a straight line at a regular speed calmly and evenly as though animated by some definite purpose lower and lower it sank then it seemed to pause to hover in the air and the next instant it burst into a shower of sparks and vanished and those sparks fell upon the shoulders of two white-robed figures standing apparently in space their arms rigidly extended their faces raised towards the heavens end of chapter one chapter two a strange neighbor mechanically i followed godfrey down the ladder and guided by the flaring lights made my way back to the car i climbed silently into my seat while godfrey started the motor then we rolled slowly up the driveway and stopped before the door of a house standing deep among the trees wait for me here a minute godfrey said and when i had got out handed me my suitcase and then drove the car on past the house no doubt to its garage he was soon back opened the house door switched on the lights and waved me in here we are he said i'll show you to your room and he led the way up the stairs opening a door in the hall at the top this is it he added and switched on the lights here also the bathroom is right at the end of the hall wash up if you need to and then come down we will have a good night's smoke it was a pleasant room with the simplest of furniture the night breeze ruffled the curtains at the windows and filled the room with the cool odor of the woods how different it was from the odor of dirty asphalt but i was in no mood to linger there i wanted an explanation of that strange light and of those two white robed figures so i paused only to open my grip change into a lounging coat and brush off the dust of the journey then i hastened downstairs godfrey met me at the stair foot and led the way into what was evidently a lounging room a tray containing some cold meat bread and butter cheese and a few other things stood on a side table and to this godfrey added two bottles of bass no doubt you're hungry after the ride he said i know i am and he opened the bottles help yourself and he proceeded to make himself a sandwich you see i live the simple life out here i've got an old couple to look after the place mr and mrs hargis mrs hargis is an excellent cook but to ask her to stay awake till midnight would be fiendish cruelty so she leaves me a lunch in the ice box and goes quietly off to bed i'll give you some berries for breakfast such as you don't often get in new york and the cream wait till you try it have a cigar no i said sitting down very content with the world i've got my pipe and i proceeded to fill up godfrey took down his own pipe from the mantel-shelf and sat down opposite me a moment later two puffs of smoke circled toward the ceiling now i said looking at him go ahead and tell me about it godfrey watched a smoke ring whirl and break before he answered about ten days ago he began just at midnight i happened to glance out of my bedroom window as i was turning in and caught a glimpse of a queer light apparently sinking into the treetops i thought nothing of it but two nights later at exactly the same time i saw it again i watched for it the next night and again saw it just for an instant you understand as it formed high in the air and started downward the next night i was up a tree and saw more of it but it was not until night before last that i found the place from which the whole spectacle could be seen the trees are pretty thick all around here and i doubt if there is any other place from which those two figures would be visible then there were two figures i said for i had begun to think that my eyes had deceived me there certainly were standing in space oh no standing on a very substantial roof but what is it all about i questioned why should that light descend every midnight what is the light anyway that's what i brought you out here to find out you've got four clear days ahead of you and i'll be at your disposal from midnight on if you happen to need me but you must have some sort of idea about it i persisted at least you know whose roof those figures were standing on yes i know that the roof belongs to a man named worthington vaughan ever hear of him i shook my head neither had i said godfrey 
up to the time i took this place even yet i don't know very much he's the last of an old family who made their money in real estate and are supposed to have kept most of it he's a widower with one daughter his wife died about ten years ago and since then he has been a sort of recluse and has the reputation of being queer he has been abroad a good deal and it is only during the last year that he has lived continuously at this place next door which is called elmhurst that's about all i've been able to find out he certainly lives a retired life for his place has a twelve-foot wall around it and no visitors need apply how do you know i tried to make a neighborly call yesterday and wasn't admitted mr vaughan was engaged getting ready for his regular midnight hocus-pocus perhaps i took a meditative puff or two is it hocus-pocus godfrey i asked at last if it is it's a mighty artistic piece of work and if it isn't hocus-pocus what is it godfrey retorted a spiritual manifestation i confess i had no answer ready ideas which seemed reasonable enough when put dimly to oneself became absurd sometimes when definitely clothed with words there are just two possibilities godfrey went on either it's hocus-pocus or it isn't if it is it's done for some purpose two men don't go out on a roof every night at midnight and fire off a roman candle and wave their arms around just for the fun of the thing it wasn't a roman candle i pointed out a roman candle is visible when it's going up and bursts and vanishes at the top of its flight that light didn't behave that way at all it formed high in the air remained there stationary for a moment gradually grew brighter and then started to descend it didn't fall it came down slowly and at an even rate of speed and it didn't drift away before the breeze as it would have done if it had been merely floating in the air it descended in a straight line it gave me the impression of moving as though a will actuated it as though it had a distinct purpose there was something uncanny about it godfrey nodded thoughtful agreement i have felt that he said and i admit that the behavior of the light is extraordinary but that doesn't prove it supernatural i don't believe in the supernatural especially i don't believe that any two mortals could arrange with the heavenly powers to make a demonstration like that every night at midnight for their benefit that's too absurd that is absurd i assented and yet it isn't much more absurd than to suppose that two men would go out on the roof every night to watch a roman candle as you call it come down unless of course they're lunatics no said godfrey i don't believe they're lunatics at least not both of them i have a sort of theory about it but it's a pretty thin one and i want you to do a little investigating on your own account before i tell you what it is it's time we went to bed don't get up in the morning till you're ready to probably i'll not see you till night i have some work to do that will take me off early but mrs hargis will make you comfortable and i'll be back in time to join you in another look at the roman candle he uttered the last words jestingly but i could see that the jest was a surface one and that at heart he was deeply serious evidently the strange star had impressed him even more than it had me though perhaps in a different manner i found that it had impressed me deeply enough for i dreamed about it that night dreamed and woke only to fall asleep and dream and wake again i do not remember that i saw any more in the dream than i had seen with my waking eyes but each time i awoke trembling with apprehension and bathed in perspiration as i lay there the second time staring up into the darkness and telling myself i was a fool there came a sudden rush of wind among the trees outside then a vivid flash of lightning and an instant rending crash of thunder and then a steady downpour of rain i could guess how the gasping city welcomed it and i lay for a long time listening to it as it dripped from the leaves and beat against the house a delightful coolness filled the room an odor fresh and clean and when at last with nerves quieted i fell asleep again it was not to awaken until the sun was bright against my curtains end of chapter two chapter three the drama in the garden i glanced at my watch as soon as i was out of bed and saw that it was after ten o'clock all the sleep i had lost during the hot nights of the previous week had been crowded into the last nine hours i felt like a new man and when half an hour later i ran downstairs it was with such an appetite for breakfast as i had not known for a long time there was no one in the hall and i stepped out through the open door to the porch beyond and stood looking about me 
the house was built in the midst of a grove of beautiful old trees some distance back from the road of which i could catch only a glimpse it was a small house a story and a half in height evidently designed only as a summer residence good morning sir said a voice behind me and i turned to find a pleasant-faced grey-haired woman standing in the doorway good morning i responded i suppose you are mrs hargis yes sir and your breakfast's ready has mr godfrey gone yes sir he left about an hour ago he was afraid his machine would waken you it didn't i said as i followed her back along the hall nothing short of an earthquake would have wakened me ah this is fine she had shown me into a pleasant room where a little table was set near an open window it made quite a picture with its white cloth and shining dishes and plate of yellow butter and bowl of crimson berries and but i didn't linger to admire it i don't know when i have enjoyed a breakfast so much mrs hargis after bringing in the eggs and bacon and setting a little pot of steaming coffee at my elbow sensibly left me alone to the enjoyment of it ever since that morning i have realized that to start the day exactly right a man should breakfast by himself amid just such surroundings leisurely and without distraction a copy of the morning's record was lying on the table but i did not even open it i did not care what had happened in the world the day before at last ineffably content i stepped out upon the driveway at the side of the house and strolled away among the trees at the end of a few minutes i came to the high stone wall which bounded the estate of the mysterious worthington vaughan and suddenly the wish came to me to see what lay behind it without much difficulty i found the tree with the ladder against it which we had mounted the night before it was a long ladder even in the daytime but at last i reached the top and settled myself on the limb against which it rested assuring myself that the leaves hid me from any chance observer i looked down into the grounds beyond the wall there was not much to see the grounds were extensive and had evidently been laid out with care but there was an air of neglect about them as though the attention they received was careless and inadequate the shrubbery was too dense grass was invading the walks here and there a tree showed a dead limb or a broken one near the house was a wide lawn designed perhaps as a tennis court or croquet ground with rustic seats under the trees at the edge about the house itself was a screen of magnificent elms which doubtless gave the place its name and which shut the house in completely all i could see of it was one corner of the roof this however stood out clear against the sky and it was here evidently that the mysterious midnight figures had been stationed as i looked at it i realized the truth of godfrey's remark that probably from no other point of vantage but just this would they be visible it did not take me many minutes to exhaust the interest of this empty prospect more especially since my perch was anything but comfortable and i was just about to descend when two white robed figures appeared at the edge of the open space near the house and walked slowly across it i settled back into my place with a tightening of interest which made me forget its discomfort for that these two were the star worshippers i did not doubt the distance was so great that their faces were the merest blurs but i could see that one leaned heavily upon the arm of the other as much or so it seemed to me for moral as for physical support i could see too that the hair of the feebler man was white while that of his companion was jet black the younger man's face appeared so dark that i suspected he wore a beard and his figure was erect and vigorous in the prime of life virile and full of power he certainly dominated the older man i watched them attentively as they paced back and forth and the dependence of the one upon the other was very manifest both heads were bent as though in earnest talk and for perhaps half an hour they walked slowly up and down then at a sign of fatigue from the older figure the other led him to a garden bench where both sat down the elder man i told myself was no doubt worthington vaughan small wonder he was considered queer if he dressed habitually in a white robe and worshipped the stars at midnight there was something monkish about the habits which he and his companion wore and the thought flashed into my mind that perhaps they were members of some religious order or some oriental cult or priesthood and both of them i added to myself must be a little mad 
as i watched the discussion gradually grew more animated and the younger man springing to his feet paced excitedly up and down touching his forehead with his fingers from time to time and raising his hands to heaven as though calling it as a witness to his words at last the other made a sign of assent got to his feet bent his head reverently as to a spiritual supervisor and walked slowly away toward the house the younger man stood gazing after him until he passed from sight then resumed his rapid pacing up and down evidently deeply moved at last from the direction of the house came the flutter of a white robe for a moment i thought it was the old man returning then as it emerged fully from among the trees i saw that it was a woman a young woman i guessed from her slimness and from the mass of dark hair which framed her face and then i remembered that godfrey had told me that worthington vaughan had a daughter the man was at her side in an instant held out his hand and said something which caused her to shrink away she half turned as though to flee but the other laid his hand upon her arm speaking earnestly and after a moment she permitted him to lead her to a seat he remained standing before her sometimes raising his hands to heaven sometimes pointing toward the house sometimes bending close above her and from time to time making that peculiar gesture of touching his fingers to his forehead whose meaning i could not guess but i could guess at the torrent of passionate words which poured from his lips and at the eager light which was in his eyes the woman sat quite still with bowed head listening but making no sign either of consent or refusal gradually the man drew more confident and at last stooped to take her hand but she drew it quickly away and raising her head said something slowly and with emphasis he shook his head savagely then after a rapid turn up and down seemed to agree bowed low to her and went rapidly away toward the house the woman sat for some time where he had left her her face in her hands then with a gesture of weariness and discouragement crossed the lawn and disappeared among the trees for a long time i sat there motionless my eyes on the spot where she had disappeared trying to understand what was the meaning of the scene what was it the younger man had urged so passionately upon her but at which she had rebelled what was it for which he had pled so earnestly the obvious answer was that he pled for her love that he had urged her to become his wife but the answer did not satisfy me his attitude had been passionate enough but it had scarcely been lover-like it had more of admonition of warning even of threat than of entreaty in it it was not the attitude of a lover to his mistress but of a master to his pupil and what had been the answer wrung from her finally by his insistence the answer to which he had at first violently descended then reluctantly agreed no doubt if these people had been garbed in the clothes of every day i should have felt at the outset that all this was none of my business and have crept down the ladder and gone away but their strange dress gave to the scene an air at once unreal and theatrical and not for an instant had i felt myself an intruder it was as though i were looking at the rehearsal of a drama designed for the public gaze and enacted upon a stage or more properly a pantomime dim and figurative but most impressive might it not indeed be a rehearsal of some sort private theatricals make-believe but that scene at midnight that could not be make-believe no nor was this scene in the garden it was in earnest in deadliest earnest there was about it something sinister and threatening and it was the realization of this the realization that there was something here not right something demanding scrutiny which kept me chained to my uncomfortable perch minute after minute but nothing further happened and i realized at last that if i was to escape an agonizing cramp in the leg i must get down i put my feet on the ladder and then paused for a last look about the grounds my eye was caught by a flutter of white among the trees someone was walking along one of the paths in a moment straining forward i saw it was the woman and that she was approaching the wall and then as she came nearer i saw that she was not a woman at all but a girl a girl of eighteen or twenty to whom the flowing robes gave at a distance the effect of age i caught only a glimpse of her face before it was hidden by a clump of shrubbery but that glimpse told me that it was a face to set the pulses leaping i strained still farther forward waiting until she could come into sight again along the path she came with the sunlight about her kissing her hair her lips her cheeks and the next instant her eyes were staring upwards into mine i could not move 
i could only stare down at her i saw the hot colour sweep across her face i saw her hand go to her bosom i saw her turn to flee then to my amazement she stopped as though arrested by a sudden thought turned toward me again and raised her eyes deliberately to mine for a full minute she stood there her gaze searching and intent as though she would read my soul then her face hardened with sudden resolution again she put her hand to her bosom turned hastily toward the wall and disappeared behind it the next instant something white came flying over it and fell on the grass beneath my tree staring down at it i saw it was a letter End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 Enter Freddy Swain I fell, rather than climbed, down the ladder, snatched the white missile from the grass, and saw that it was indeed a sealed and addressed envelope. I had somehow expected that address to include either Godfrey's name or mine, but it did neither. The envelope bore these words. Mr. Frederick Swain, 1010 Fifth Avenue, New York City if not at this address please try the calumet club i sat down on the lowest rung of the ladder whistling softly to myself for freddy swain's address was no longer ten ten fifth avenue nor was he to be found in the luxurious rooms of the calumet club in fact it was nearly a year since he had entered either place for some eight hours of every weekday he laboured in the law offices of royce and lester he slept in a little room on the top floor of the marathon three hours of every evening saturdays sundays and holidays excepted were spent at the law school of the university of new york and the remaining hours of the twenty-four in haunts much less conspicuous and expensive than the calumet club for freddie swain had taken one of those toboggan slides down the hill of fortune which sometimes happened to the most deserving his father old general orlando swain had all his life put up a pompous front and was supposed to have inherited a fortune from somewhere but when he died this edifice was found to be all facade and no foundation and freddie inherited nothing but debts he had been expensively educated for a career as an ornament of society but he found that career cut short for society suddenly ceased to find him ornamental i suppose there were too many marriageable daughters about i am bound to say that he took the blow well instead of attempting to cling to the skirts of society as a vendor of champagne or an organizer of fetes champetres he to use his own words decided to cut the whole show our firm had been named as the administrators of the swain estate and when the storm was over and we were sitting among the ruins freddie expressed the intention of going to work what will you do mr royce inquired ever had any training in making money no only in spending it retorted freddie easily but i can learn i was thinking of studying law that's a good trade isn't it splendid assented mr royce warmly and there are always so many openings you see nobody studies law lawyers are as scarce as hen's teeth just the same i think i'll have a try at it said freddie sturdily there's always room at the top you know he added with a grin i can go to the night school at the university and i ought to be able to earn enough to live on as a clerk or something i know how to read and write that will help of course agreed mr royce but i'm afraid that right at first anyway you can scarcely hope to live in the style to which you have been accustomed freddie turned on him with fire in his eyes look here he said suppose you give me a job i'll do my work and earn my wages try me and see there was something in his face that touched me and i glanced at mr royce i saw that his gruffness was merely a mantle to cloak his real feelings and the result was that freddie swain was set to work as a copying clerk at a salary of fifteen dollars a week he applied himself to his work with an energy that surprised me and i learned that he was taking the night course at the university as he had planned finally one night i met him as i was turning into my rooms at the marathon and found that he had rented a cubbyhole on the top floor of the building after that i saw him occasionally and when six months had passed was forced to acknowledge that he was thoroughly in earnest i happened to remark to mr royce one day that swain seemed to be making good yes my partner agreed i didn't think he had it in him he had a rude awakening from his dream of affluence and it seems to have done him good but somehow i had fancied that it was from more than a dream of affluence he had been awakened and now as i sat staring at this letter i began to understand dimly what the other dream had been 
the first thing was to get the letter into his hands for i was certain it was a cry for help i glanced at my watch and saw that it was nearly half past twelve swain i knew would be at lunch and was not due at the office until one o'clock slipping the letter into my pocket i turned back to the house and found mrs hargis standing on the front porch i declare i thought you was lost mr lester she said i was just going to send william to look for you ain't you most starved scarcely starved mrs hargis i said but with a very creditable appetite when you consider that i ate breakfast only two hours ago well come right in she said your lunch is ready i suppose there's a telephone somewhere about i asked as i followed her through the hall yes sir in here she opened the door into a little room fitted up as a study it's here mr godfrey works sometimes thank you i said i've got to call up the office i won't be but a minute i found godfrey's number stamped on the cover of the telephone book and then called the office as i had guessed swain was not yet back from lunch and i left word for him to call me as soon as he came in then i made my way to the dining-room where mrs hargis was awaiting me how does one get out here from new york mrs hargis i asked as i sat down that is if one doesn't happen to own a motor-car why very easily sir take the third avenue elevated to the end of the line and then the trolley it runs along dryden road just two blocks over where does one get off at prospect street sir and what is this place called this is the old bennett place sir thank you and let me tell you mrs hargis i added that i have never tasted a better salad her kindly old face flushed with pleasure it's nice of you to say that sir she said we have our own garden and william takes a great pride in it i must go and see it i said i've always fancied i'd like to potter around in a garden i must see if mr godfrey won't let me in on this he spends an hour in it every morning sometimes he can hardly tear himself away i certainly do like mr godfrey so do i i agreed heartily he's a splendid fellow one of the nicest squarest men i ever met and a friend worth having he's all of that sir she agreed and stood for a moment clasping and unclasping her hands nervously as though there was something else she wished to say but she evidently thought better of it there's the bell sir she added please ring if there's anything else you want and she left me to myself i had pushed back my chair and was filling my pipe when the telephone rang it was swain swain i said this is mr lester i'm at a place up here in the bronx and i want you to come up right away very good sir said swain how do i get there take the third avenue elevated to the end of the line and then the trolley which runs along dryden road get off at prospect street walk two blocks west and ask for the old bennett place i'll have an eye out for you all right sir said swain again do you want me to bring some papers or anything no just come as quickly as you can i answered and hung up i figured that even at the best it would take swain an hour and a half to make the journey and i strolled out under the trees again then the thought came to me that i might as well make a little exploration of the neighborhood and i sauntered out to the road along it for some distance ran the high wall which bounded elmhurst and i saw that the wall had been further fortified by ugly pieces of broken glass set in cement along its top i could see a break in the wall about midway of its length and walking past discovered that this was where the gates were set heavy gates of wrought iron very tall and surmounted by sharp spikes the whole length of the wall was i judged considerably over a city block but there was no other opening in it at the farther end it was bounded by a crossroad and turning along this i found that the wall extended nearly the same distance in this direction there was an opening about midway a small opening closed by a heavy iron banded door the servants entrance i told myself the grounds of a row of houses facing the road beyond ran up to the wall at the back and i could not follow it without attracting notice but i could see that there was no break in it it was almost certain that the wall which closed the estate on godfrey's side was also unbroken there were then only the two entrances i walked back again to the front and paused for a glance through the gates but there was nothing to be seen the driveway parted and curved away out of sight in either direction and a dense mass of shrubbery opposite the gate shut off any view of the grounds even of the house there was nothing to be seen except the chimneys and one gable 
evidently mr vaughan was fond of privacy and had spared no pains to secure it opposite the vaughan place a strip of woodland ran back from the road it was dense with undergrowth and i reflected would form an admirable hiding place the road itself seemed little travelled and i judged that the main artery of traffic was the road along which the trolley ran two blocks away i returned to my starting point and assured myself that the wall on that side was indeed without a break some vines had started up it here and there but for the most part it loomed grey and bleak crowned along its whole length by that threatening line of broken glass i judged it to be twelve feet high so that even without the glass it would be impossible for any one to get over it without assistance as i stood there looking at it resenting the threat of that broken glass and pondering the infirmity of character which such a threat revealed it suddenly struck me that the upper part of the wall differed slightly from the lower part it was a little lighter in colour a little newer in appearance and examining the wall more closely i discovered that originally it had been only eight or nine feet high and that the upper part had been added at a later date and last of all of course the broken glass as i turned back at last toward the house i saw someone coming up the drive in a moment i recognized swain and quickened my steps you made good time i said yes sir i was fortunate in catching an express and not having to wait for the trolley we'd better go into the house i added i have a message for you a confidential message he glanced at me quickly but followed silently as i led the way into godfrey's study and carefully closed the door sit down i said and i sat myself down and looked at him i had always thought swain a handsome thoroughbred looking fellow and i thought that in the past few months he had grown more thoroughbred looking than ever his face was thinner than when he had first gone to work for us there was a new line between his eyebrows and the set of his lips told of battles fought and won a year ago it had seemed natural to call him freddy but no one would think of doing so now his father's creditors had not attempted to take from him his wardrobe a costly and extensive one so that he was dressed as carefully if not quite as fashionably as ever in a way that suggested a young millionaire rather than a fifteen dollar a week clerk at this moment his face was clouded and he drummed the arm of his chair with nervous fingers then he shifted uneasily under my gaze which was perhaps more earnest than i realized you said you had a message for me sir he reminded me yes i said have you ever been out this way before yes i have been out this way a number of times you know this place then i have heard it mentioned but i have never been here before do you know whose place that is next door to us yes and his voice sank to a lower key it belongs to worthington vaughan and you know him at one time i knew him quite well sir and his voice was still lower no doubt i went on more and more interested you also knew his very fascinating daughter a wave of colour crimsoned his face why are you asking me these questions mr lester he demanded because i said the message i have is from that young lady and is for a man named frederick swain he was on his feet staring at me and all the blood was gone from his cheeks a message he cried from her from marjorie what is it mr lester for god's sake here it is i said and handed him the letter he seized it took one look at the address then turned away to the window and ripped the envelope open he unfolded the sheet of paper it contained and as his eyes ran along it his face grew whiter still at last he raised his eyes and stared at me with the look of a man who felt the world tottering about him end of chapter four chapter five a call for help for heaven's sake swain i said sit down and pull yourself together but he did not seem to hear me instead he read the letter through again then he turned toward me how did you get this mr lester he asked i found it lying under the trees it had been thrown over the wall but how did you know it was thrown over by miss vaughan that was an easy guess i said sparring feebly who else would attempt to conduct a surreptitious correspondence with a handsome young man but he did not smile the look of intensity in his eye deepened come mr lester he protested don't play with me i have a right to know the truth what right i queried he paused an instant as though nerving himself to speak as though asking himself how much he should tell me then he came toward me impulsively miss vaughan and i are engaged to be married 
he said some persons may tell you that the engagement has been broken off more than once i have offered to release her but she refuses to be released we love each other the word love is a difficult one for us anglo-saxons to pronounce the voice in which swain uttered it brought me to my feet with outstretched hand if there's anything i can do for you my boy i said tell me thank you mr lester and he returned my clasp you have done a great deal already in giving me this letter so promptly the only other thing you can do is to permit me to stay here until to-night until to-night miss vaughan asks me to meet her to-night in her father's grounds yes unknown to him yes he is not friendly to you no i had a little struggle with myself see here swain i said sit down and let us talk this thing over calmly before i promise anything i should like to know more of the story from the glimpse i caught of miss vaughan i could see that she is very beautiful and she also seemed to me to be very young she is nineteen said swain her father is wealthy i suppose very wealthy and her mother is dead yes well i began and hesitated fearing to wound him i know what you are thinking swain burst in and i do not blame you you are thinking that she is a young beautiful and wealthy girl while i am a poverty-stricken nonentity without any profession and able to earn just enough to live on perhaps i couldn't even do that if i had to buy my clothes you are thinking that her father is right to separate us and that she ought to be protected from me isn't that it yes i admitted something like that and i answer mr lester by saying that all that is true that i am not worthy of her and that nobody knows it better than i do there are thousands of men who could offer her far more than i can and who would be eager to offer it but when i asked her to marry me i thought myself the son of a wealthy man when i found myself a pauper i wrote at once to release her she replied that when she wished her release she would ask for it that it wasn't my money she was in love with then i came out here and had a talk with her father he was kind enough but pointed out that the affair could not go further until i had established myself i agreed of course i agreed too when he suggested that it would only be fair to her to leave her free not to see her or write to her or try to influence her in any way i wanted to be fair to her since then i have not seen her nor heard from her but her father's feelings have changed toward me in what way i thought he might be interested to know what i was doing and two or three months ago i called and asked to see him instead of seeing me he sent word back by a black-faced fellow in a white robe that neither he nor his daughter wished to see me again his face was red with the remembered humiliation i wrote to miss vaughan once after that he added but my letter was not answered evidently she didn't get your letter why do you think so if she had got it she would have known that you were no longer at ten ten fifth avenue her father no doubt kept it from her he flushed still more deeply and started to say something but i held him silent he was justified in keeping it i said you had promised not to write to her and i don't see that you have given me any reason why i should assist you against him i haven't swain admitted more calmly and under ordinary circumstances my self-respect would compel me to keep away i am not a fortune hunter but i can't keep away i can't stand on my dignity when she calls for aid i must go to her not for my own sake but for hers because she needs to be protected from her father far more than from me what do you mean by that i demanded mr lester he said leaning forward in his chair and speaking in a lowered voice and with great earnestness her father is mad i am sure of it no one but a madman would live and dress as he does no one but a madman would devote his whole time to the study of the supernatural no one but a madman would believe in the supernatural as he does but i shook my head i'm afraid that won't do swain a good many fairly sane people believe in the supernatural and devote themselves to its study there is william james for instance but william james doesn't dress in flowing robes and worship the sun and live with a hindu mystic no i smiled he doesn't do that and i thought again of the mysterious light and of the two white-clad figures does he live with a hindu mystic yes said swain bitterly an adept or whatever they call it he's the fellow who kicked me out does he speak english better than i do he seems a finely educated man is he a lunatic too 
swain hesitated i don't know he said finally i only saw him once and i was certainly impressed i wasn't one two three with him i suppose mysticism comes more or less natural to a hindu but i'm convinced that mr vaughan has softening of the brain how old is he about sixty has he always been queer he has always been interested in telepathy and mental suggestion and all that sort of thing but before his wife's death he was fairly normal it was her death that started him on this supernatural business he hasn't thought of anything else since are there any relatives who could be asked to interfere none that i know of i thought over what he had told me well i said at last i can see no harm in your meeting miss vaughan and finding out what the condition of affairs really is if her father is really mad he may be a good deal worse now than he was when you saw him last it would of course be possible to have his sanity tested but his daughter would scarcely wish to do that no of course not swain agreed her letter tells you nothing nothing except that she is in great trouble and wishes to see me at once you are to go to the house no there is an arbor in one corner of the grounds she says that she will be there at eleven thirty every night for three nights after that she says it will be no use for me to come that it will be too late what does she mean by too late i have no idea he answered and turned to another anxious perusal of the letter i turned the situation over in my mind evidently miss vaughan believed that she had grave cause for alarm and yet it was quite possible she might be mistaken she was being urged to consent to something against her will but perhaps it was for her own good in any event i had seen no indication that her consent was being sought by violence there must be no interference on our part until we were sure of our ground well swain i said at last i will help you on one condition what is that you will meet miss vaughan to-night and hear her story but you will take no action until you and i have talked the matter over she herself says that she has three days i went on as he started to protest so there is no necessity for leaping in the dark and i would point out to you that she is not yet of age but is still under her father's control she is nineteen he protested in this state the legal age for women as for men is twenty-one the law requires a very serious reason for interfering between a child and its father moreover i added she must not be compromised if you persuade her to accompany you to-night where would you take her in no case will i be a party to an elopement i will do all i can to prevent it he took a short turn up and down the room his hands clenched behind him mr lester he said at last stopping before me i want you to believe that i have not even thought of an elopement that would be too base too unfair to her but i see you are right she must not be compromised and you promise to ask my advice suppose i make such a promise what then if you make such a promise and i agree with you as to the necessity for miss vaughan to leave her father i think i can arrange for her to stay with mr and mrs royce for a time there she will be safe should legal proceedings become necessary our firm will help you i want to help you swain i added warmly but i must be convinced that you deserve help that's reasonable isn't it yes he agreed and held out his hand and i promise good and now for the arrangements two twelve-foot ladders were necessary one for either side of the wall but beyond a short step-ladder the place possessed none except the long one by which godfrey and i had mounted into the tree swain suggested that this might do for one but i felt that it would better stay where it was and sent hargus over to yonkers to buy two new ones instructing him to bring them back with him then swain and i reconnoitred the wall and chose for the crossing a spot where the glass escarpment seemed a little less formidable than elsewhere you can step from one ladder to the other i pointed out without touching the top of the wall a mere touch would be dangerous in the dark he nodded his agreement and finally we went back to the house getting there we found suddenly that we had nothing more to say swain was soon deep in his own thoughts and i must confess that after the first excitement i began to find the affair a little wearying another man's love affair is usually wearying and besides that the glimpse which i had caught of marjorie vaughan made me think that she was worthy of a bigger fish than swain would ever be he was right in saying that there were thousands of men who had more to give her and who would be eager to give i examined swain as he sat there staring at nothing with eyes not wholly friendly he was handsome enough but in a stereotyped way 
and he was only an insignificant clerk with small prospect of ever being anything much better for he had started the battle of life too late honest of course honourable clean-hearted but commonplace with a depth of soul easily fathomed i know now that i was unjust to swain but at the moment my scrutiny of him left me strangely depressed a rattle of wheels on the drive brought us both out of our thoughts it was hargis returning with the ladders i had him hang them up against the shed where he kept his gardening implements for i did not wish him to suspect the invasion we had planned then just to kill time and get away from swain i spent an hour with hargis in his garden and finally came the summons to dinner an hour later as we sat on the front porch smoking and still finding little or nothing to say mrs hargis came out to bid us good night mr swain can use the bedroom next to yours mr lester she said perhaps he won't stay all night i said if he does i'll show him the way to it and thank you very much mrs hargis is there anything else i can do sir no thank you mr godfrey will be here a little before midnight at least that's his usual time we'll wait up for him i said good night mrs hargis good night sir and she went back into the house i have never passed through a longer nor more trying hour than the next one was and i could tell by the way swain twitched about in his chair that he felt the tedium as much as i once or twice i tried to start a conversation but it soon trickled dry and we ended by smoking away moodily and staring out into the darkness at last swain sprang to his feet i can't stand this any longer he said i'm going over the wall i struck a match and looked at my watch it isn't eleven o'clock yet i warned him i don't care perhaps she'll be ahead of me anyway i might as well wait there as here come on then i agreed for i felt myself that another such hour would be unendurable together we made our way back to the shed and took down the ladders a moment later we were at the wall swain placed his ladder against it and mounted quickly to the top as he paused there i handed him up the other one he caught it from my hands lifted it over the wall and lowered it carefully on the other side as he did so i heard him give a muffled exclamation of mingled pain and annoyance and knew that he had cut himself not bad is it i asked no only a scratch on the wrist he answered shortly and the next instant he had swung himself over the wall and disappeared end of chapter five chapter six the scream in the night for some moments i stood staring up into the darkness half expecting that shadowy figure to reappear descend the ladder and rejoin me then i shook myself together the fact that our plot was really moving that swain was in the enemy's country so to speak gave the affair a finality which it had lacked before it was too late now to hesitate or turn back we must press forward i felt as though after a long period of uncertainty war had been declared and the advance definitely begun so it was with a certain sense of relief that i turned away and walked slowly back to the house and sat down again upon the porch to wait now waiting is seldom a pleasant or an easy thing and i found it that night most unpleasant and uneasy for before long doubts began to crowd upon me doubts of the wisdom of the course i had subscribed to it would have been wiser i told myself if it had been i and not swain who had gone to the rendezvous wiser still perhaps to have sought an interview openly and to have made sure of the facts before seeming to encourage what might easily prove to be a girl's more or less romantic illusions a midnight interview savoured too much of melodrama to appeal to a middle-aged lawyer like myself however great its appeal might be to youthful lovers at any rate i would be certain that the need was very great before i consented to meddle further somewhat comforted by this resolution and by the thought that no real harm had as yet been done i struck a match and looked at my watch it was half past eleven well whatever the story was swain was hearing it now and i should hear it before long and then i caught the hum of an approaching car and was momentarily blinded by the glare of acetylene lamps hello lester called godfrey's voice i'll be back in a minute and he ran the car on toward the rear of the house i stood up with a gasp of thankfulness here was someone to confide in and advise with the stretch of lonely waiting was at an end it had been a trying evening 
i think the warmth of my greeting surprised godfrey for he looked at me curiously sit down godfrey i said i've got something to tell you what discoveries already he laughed but he drew a chair close to me and sat down well what are they i began at the beginning and related the day's adventures he listened without comment but i could see how his interest grew so young swain is over in those grounds now he said thoughtfully when i had finished yes he's been there three quarters of an hour why do you suppose miss vaughan named so late an hour i don't know perhaps because she was afraid of being discovered earlier than that or perhaps merely because she's just a romantic girl godfrey sat with his head bent in thought for a moment i have it he said at eleven thirty every night her father and the adept go up to the roof to remain there till midnight that is the one time of the whole day when she is absolutely sure to be alone come along lester he was on his feet now and his voice was quivering with excitement where are you going i asked up the ladder it's nearly twelve if the star falls as usual we'll know that everything is all right if it doesn't he did not finish but hurried away among the trees in a moment we were at the ladder in another moment we were high among the leaves straining our eyes through the darkness i'm going to look at my watch said godfrey in a low voice lean back and screen me i heard the flash of the match and saw a little glare of light against the nearest leaves then godfrey's voice spoke again it's three minutes of twelve he said there was a tension in his voice which sent a shiver through me though i understood but dimly what it was he feared the stars were shining brightly and once i fancied that i saw the strange star appear among them but when i closed my eyes for an instant and looked again it was gone slow minute followed minute and the hand with which i clutched the ladder began to tremble the sight of that mysterious light had shaken me the night before but not half so deeply as its absence shook me now at last the suspense grew unendurable it must be long past midnight i whispered it is agreed godfrey gravely we may as well go down he paused an instant longer to stare out into the darkness then descended quickly i followed and found him waiting a dark shadow he put his hand on my arm and stood a moment as though in indecision for myself i felt as though an intolerable burden had been laid upon my shoulders well i asked at last what now we must see if swain has returned he answered if he has all right if he hasn't we'll have to go and look for him what is it you fear godfrey i demanded do you think swain's in danger i don't know what i fear but there's something wrong over there this is the first night for a week that that light hasn't appeared still i pointed out that may have nothing to do with swain no but it's a coincidence that he should be in the grounds and i'm always afraid of coincidences let us see if he is back and he turned toward the house but i held his arm if he's back i said he'll have taken the ladders down from the wall that's true and together we made our way forward among the trees then we reached the wall and there was the dim white line of the ladder leaning against it without a word godfrey mounted it stood an instant at the top and then came down again the other ladder is still there he said and took off his cap and rubbed his head perplexedly i could not see his face but i could guess how tense it was i had been with him in many trying situations but only once before had i seen him use that gesture it won't do to alarm the house he said at last do you know where he was to meet miss vaughan at an arbor in one corner of the grounds i answered then we'll start from there and take a quiet look for him wait here for me a minute he melted into the darkness and i stood holding on to the ladder as though in danger of falling and staring at the top of the wall where i had last seen swain an hour and a half had passed since then a touch on the arm brought me around with a start here put this pistol in your pocket said godfrey's voice and i felt the weapon pressed into my hand and here's an electric torch do you feel the button yes i said and pressed it a ray of light shot toward the wall but i released the button instantly you'd better keep it in your hand he added ready for action no telling what we'll run across and now come ahead he put his foot on the ladder but i stopped him look here godfrey i said do you realize that what we're about to do is pretty serious swain might have a legal excuse since the daughter of the house invited him to the meeting but if we go over the wall we're trespassers pure and simple 
anybody who runs across us in the darkness has the right to shoot us down without asking any questions and we'd have no legal right to shoot back i could hear godfrey chuckling and i felt my cheeks redden you remind me of tartarin he said the adventure tartarin urging you on the lawyer tartarin holding you back my advice is to shake the lawyer lester he's out of his element here to-night but if he's too strong for you why stay here and he started up the ladder burning with vexation i started after him but suddenly he stopped listen he whispered i heard something rattle against the other side of the wall then a dark figure appeared on the coping i felt godfrey press me back and descended cautiously a moment later something slid down the wall and i knew that the person at the top had lifted the other ladder over then the figure descended and then a distorted face stared into the circle of godfrey's torch for a breath i did not recognize it then i saw that it was swain's i shall never forget the shock it gave me with its starting eyes and working mouth and smear of blood across the forehead godfrey i knew was also startled for the light flashed out for an instant and then flashed on again what is it swain i cried and seized him by the arm but he shook me off roughly stand back he cried hoarsely who is it what do you want it's lester i said and godfrey flashed his torch into my face then back to swain's but you're not alone no this is mr godfrey mr godfrey whose house we're staying at i explained ah said swain and put one hand to his head and leaned heavily against the ladder i think we'd better go to the house godfrey suggested soothingly we all need a bracer then we can talk don't you think so mr swain swain nodded vacantly but i could see that he had not understood his face was still working and he seemed to be in pain i want to wash he said thickly i cut my wrist on that damned glass and i'm blood all over and my head's wrong somehow his voice trailed off into an unintelligible mumble but he held one hand up into the circle of light and i saw that his cuff was soaked with blood and his hand streaked with it come along then said godfrey peremptorily you're right that cut must be attended to and he started toward the house wait swain called after him with unexpected vigour we must take down the ladders we mustn't leave them here why not if they're found they'll suspect they'll know he stopped stammering and again his voice trailed away into a mumble as though beyond his control godfrey looked at him for a moment and i could guess at the surprise and suspicion in his eyes i myself was ill at ease for there was something in swain's face a sort of vacant horror and dumb shrinking that filled me with a vague repulsion and then to see his jaw working as he tried to form articulate words and could not sent a shiver over my scalp very well godfrey agreed at last we'll take the ladders since you think it's so important you take that one lester and i'll take this i stooped to raise the ladder to my shoulder when suddenly cutting the darkness like a knife came a scream so piercing so vibrant with fear that i stood there crouching every muscle rigid again the scream came more poignant more terrible wrung from a woman's throat by the last extremity of horror and then a silence sickening and awful what was happening in that silence i stood erect gaping suffocated rising as from a long submersion godfrey's finger had slipped from the button of his torch and we were in darkness but suddenly a dim figure hurled itself past us up the ladder with a low cry godfrey snatched at it but his hand clutched only the empty air the next instant the figure poised itself on the coping of the wall and then plunged forward out of sight i heard the crash of breaking branches a scramble a patter of feet and all was still it's swain said godfrey hoarsely and that's a twelve-foot drop why the man's mad hand me that ladder lester he added for he was already at the top of the wall i lifted it as i had done once before that night and saw godfrey slide it over the wall come on he said we must save him if we can and he too disappeared the next instant i was scrambling desperately after him the lawyer tartarin had vanished End of chapter six chapter seven the tragedy the wall was masked on the other side by a dense growth of shrubbery and struggling through this i found myself on the gravelled path where i had seen marjorie vaughan before me along this path sped a shadow which i knew to be godfrey and i followed at top speed at the end of a moment i caught a flash of light among the trees and knew that we were nearing the house but i saw no sign of swain 
we came to the stretch of open lawn crossed it and guided by the light found ourselves at the end of a short avenue of trees at the other end a stream of light poured from an open door and against that light a running figure was silhouetted even as i saw it it bounded through the open door and vanished it's swain gasped godfrey and then we too were at that open door for an instant i thought the room was empty then from behind the table in the centre a demoniac blood-stained figure rose into view holding in its arms a white-robed woman with a sort of nervous shock i saw that the man was swain and the woman marjorie vaughan a thrill of fear ran through me as i saw how her head fell backwards against his shoulder how her arms hung limp without so much as a glance in our direction he laid her gently on a couch fell to his knees beside it and began to chafe her wrists it was godfrey who mastered himself first and who stepped forward to swain's side is she dead he asked swain shook his head impatiently without looking up how is she hurt godfrey persisted bending closer above the unconscious girl swain shot him one red glance she is not hurt he said hoarsely she has fainted that's all go away but godfrey did not go away after one burning look at swain's lowering face he bent again above the still figure on the couch and touched his fingers to the temples what he saw or felt seemed to reassure him for his voice was more composed when he spoke again i think you're right swain he said but we'd better call someone call away snarled swain you mean there's no one here surely her father he stopped for at the words swain had burst into a hoarse laugh her father he cried oh yes he's here call him he's over there he made a wild gesture toward a high-backed easy chair beside the table his eyes gleaming with an almost fiendish excitement then the gleam faded and he turned back to the girl godfrey cast one astonished glance at him and strode to the chair i saw his face quiver with sudden horror i saw him catch at the table for support and for an instant he stood staring down then he turned stiffly toward me and motioned me to approach in the chair a man sat huddled forward a gray-haired man clad in a white robe his hands were gripping the chair arms as though in agony his head hung down almost upon his knees silently godfrey reached down and raised the head and a cry of horror burst from both of us the face was purple with congested blood the tongue swollen and horribly protruding the eyes suffused and starting from their sockets and then at a motion from godfrey's finger i saw that about the neck a cord was tightly knotted the man had been strangled godfrey after a breathless moment in which he made sure that the man was quite dead let the head fall forward again it turned me sick to see how low it sagged how limp it hung and i saw that the collar of the white robe was spotted with blood i do not know what was in godfrey's mind but by a common impulse we turned and looked at swain he was still on his knees beside the couch apparently he had forgotten our presence it's plain enough said godfrey his voice thick with emotion she came in and found the body no wonder she screamed like that but where are the servants where is everybody the same thought was in my own mind the utter silence of the house the fact that no one came added somehow to the horror of the moment those wild screams must have echoed from cellar to garret and yet no one came godfrey made a rapid scrutiny of the room which was evidently the library with a double door opening upon the grounds and another opposite opening into the hall on the wall beside the inner door he found an electric button and he pushed it for some moments but there was no response if it rang a bell the bell was so far away that we could not hear it a heavy curtain hung across the doorway godfrey pulled it aside and peered into the hall beyond the hall was dark and silent with face decidedly grim he took his torch from one pocket and his pistol from another come along lester he said we've got to look into this have your torch ready and your pistol god knows what further horrors this house contains he pulled back the curtain so that the hall was lighted to some extent from the open doorway and then passed through i after him the hall was a broad one running right through the centre of the house from front to rear godfrey proceeded cautiously and yet rapidly the whole length of it flashing his torch into every room they were all luxuriously furnished but were empty of human occupants from the kitchen which closed the hall at the rear a flight of stone steps led down into the basement and godfrey descended these with a steadiness i could not but admire we found ourselves in a square stone flagged room evidently used as a laundry 
two doors opened out of it but both were secured with heavy padlocks storerooms or wine cellars perhaps godfrey ventured mounted the stairs again to the kitchen and returned to the room whence we had started everything there was as we had left it the dead man sat huddled forward in his chair swain was still on his knees beside the couch the girl had not stirred godfrey went to the side of the couch and disregarding swain's fierce glance again placed his fingers lightly on the girl's left temple then he came back to me if she doesn't revive pretty soon he said we'll have to try heroic measures but there must be somebody in the house let's look upstairs he led the way up the broad stairs which rose midway of the hall sending a long ray of light ahead of him i followed in no very happy frame of mind for i confess that this midnight exploration of an unknown house with a murdered man for its only occupant was getting on my nerves but godfrey proceeded calmly and systematically the hall above corresponded to that below with two doors on each side opening into bedroom suites the first was probably that of the master of the house it consisted of bedroom bath and dressing-room but there was no one there the next was evidently miss vaughan's it also had a bath and a daintily furnished boudoir but these too were empty then as we opened the door across the hall a strange odour saluted us an odour suggestive somehow of the east which in the first moment caught the breath from the throat and in the second seemed to muffle and retard the beating of the heart a flash of godfrey's torch showed that we were in a little entry closed at the farther end by a heavy drapery godfrey strode forward and swept the drapery aside the rush of perfume was overpowering and through the opening came a soft glow of light it was a moment before i got my breath then a mist seemed to fall from before my eyes and a strange sense of exaltation and well-being stole through me i saw godfrey standing motionless transfixed with one hand holding back the drapery and his torch hanging unused in the other and i crept forward and peered over his shoulder at the strangest scene i have ever gazed upon just in front of us poised in the air some three feet from the floor hung a sphere of crystal glowing with a soft radiance which seemed to wax and wane to quiver almost to darkness and then to burn more clearly it was like a dreamer's pulse fluttering pausing leaping in accord with his vision and as i gazed at the sphere i fancied i could see within it strange elusive shapes which changed and merged and faded from moment to moment and yet grew always clearer and more suggestive i bent forward straining my eyes to see them better to fathom their meaning godfrey turning to speak to me saw my attitude and shook me roughly by the arm don't do that lester he growled in my ear take your eyes off that crystal i tried to move my eyes but could not until godfrey pulled me around to face him i stood blinking at him stupidly i was nearly gone myself before i realized the danger he said a sphere like that can hypnotize a man more quickly than anything else on earth especially when his resistance is lessened as it is by this heavy perfume it was rather pleasant i said i should like to try it some time well you can't try it now you've got something else to do besides it has two victims already two victims look carefully but keep your eyes off the sphere he said and swung me around toward the room again the room was shrouded in impenetrable darkness except for the faint and quivering radiance which the sphere emitted and as i plunged my eyes into its depths in an effort to see what lay there it seemed to me that i had never seen blackness so black as i stared into it with straining eyes a vague form grew dimly visible beside the glowing sphere and then i recoiled a little for suddenly it took shape and i saw it was a man i had a queer fancy as i stood there that it was really a picture into which i was gazing one of rembrandt's for gradually one detail after another emerged from the darkness vague shadows took on shape and meaning but farther back there was always more shadow and farther back still more the man was sitting cross-legged on a low divan his hands crossed in front of him and hanging limply between his knees his clothing i could see but vaguely for it was merged into the darkness about him but his hands stood out white against it he was staring straight at the crystal with unwavering and unwinking gaze and sat as motionless as though carved in stone the glow from the sphere picked out his profile with a line of light i could see the high forehead the strong curved nose the full lips shaded by a faint moustache and the long chin only partially concealed by a close clipped beard it was a wonderful and compelling face especially as i then saw it and i gazed at it for a long moment 
it's the adept i suppose said godfrey no longer taking care to lower his voice it sounded unnaturally loud in the absolute stillness of the room and i looked at the adept quickly but he had not moved can't he hear you i asked no he couldn't hear a clap of thunder that is unless he's faking i looked again at the impassive figure he's not faking i said i don't know said godfrey and shook his head skeptically it looks like the real thing but these fellows are mighty clever do you see the other victim there's no fake about it i see no one else i said after a vain scrutiny look carefully on the other side of the sphere don't you see something there my eyes were smarting under the strain and for a moment longer i saw nothing then a strange gray shape detached itself from the blackness it was an ugly and repulsive shape slender below but swelling hideously at the top and as i stared at it it seemed to me that it returned my stare with malignant eyes screened by a pair of white-rimmed glasses then with a sensation of dizziness i saw that the shape was swaying gently back and forth in a sort of rhythm and then quite suddenly i saw what it was and a chill of horror quivered up my back it was a cobra to and fro it swung to and fro its staring eyes fixed upon the sphere its spectacled hood hideously distended the very soul within me trembled as i gazed at those unwinking eyes what did they see in the sphere what was passing in that inscrutable brain could it too reconstruct the past read the mysteries of the future some awful power greater than my will seemed stretching its tentacles from the darkness i felt them dragging at me certain remorseless growing stronger and stronger with something very like a shriek of terror i tore myself away out of the entry into the hall to the stairs and down them into the lighted room below and as i stood there gasping for breath godfrey followed me and i saw that his face too was livid end of chapter seven chapter eight a fresh enigma godfrey met my eyes with a little deprecating smile put his torch in one pocket took a handkerchief from another and mopped his forehead rather nerve-wracking wasn't it lester he remarked and then his gaze wandered to the couch and he stepped toward it quickly i saw that a change had come in miss vaughan's condition her eyes were still closed but her body no longer lay inert or lifeless for from moment to moment it was shaken by a severe nervous tremor godfrey's face was very grave as he looked at her stop stroking her wrist swain he said that does no good and when swain without answering or seeming to hear kept on stroking them godfrey drew the hands away took swain by the arm and half lifted him to his feet listen to me he said more sternly and shook him a little for swain's eyes were dull and vacant i want you to sit quietly in a chair for a while till you get your senses back miss vaughan is seriously ill and must not be disturbed in any way i'm going to get a doctor and a nurse at once they'll do what needs to be done until then she must be left alone understand swain nodded vaguely and permitted godfrey to lead him to a chair near the outer door where he sat down as his hand fell across the arm of the chair i could see that a little blood was still oozing from the wound on the wrist godfrey saw it too and picked up the hand and looked at it then he laid it gently down again and glanced at his watch i followed his example and saw that it was half past one have you nerve enough to stay here half an hour by yourself lester he asked by myself i echoed and glanced at the dead man and at the quivering girl i've got to run over to my place and get a few things and do some telephoning he explained we must get a doctor up here at once and then there's the police i'll try to get simmons will you stay yes i said of course but please get back as soon as you can i will he promised and after a last look around the room stepped out upon the walk i went to the door and looked after him until the sound of his footsteps died away then feeling very lonely i turned back into the room those regular tremors were still shaking the girl's body in a way that seemed to me most alarming but there was nothing i could do for her and i finally pulled a chair to swain's side he at least offered a sort of companionship he was sitting with his head hanging forward in a way that reminded me most unpleasantly of the huddled figure by the table and did not seem to be aware of my presence i tried to draw him into talk but a slight nod from time to time was all i could get from him and i finally gave up mechanically my hand sought my coat pocket and got out my pipe 
Yes, that was what I needed, and, sitting down in the open doorway, I filled it and lighted up. My nerves grew calmer presently, and I was able to think connectedly of the events of the night, but there were two things which, looked at from any angle, I could not understand. One was Swain's dazed and incoherent manner. The other was the absence of servants. As to Swain, I believed him to be a well-poised fellow, not easily upset, and certainly not subject to attacks of nerves. What had happened to him, then, to reduce him to the pitiable condition in which he had come back to us over the wall, and in which he was still plunged? The discovery of the murder and of Miss Vaughan's senseless body might have accounted for it, but his incoherence had antedated that, unless, indeed, he knew of the murder before he left the grounds. That thought gave me a sudden shock, and I put it away from me, not daring to pursue it farther as to the house its deserted condition seemed sinister and threatening it was absurd to suppose that an establishment such as this could be carried on without servants or with less than three or four but where were they and then i remembered that godfrey and i had not completed our exploration of the house we had stopped at the gruesome room where the adept and his serpent gazed unwinking into the crystal sphere there was at least one suite on the same floor we had not looked into and no doubt there were other rooms on the attic floor above but that any one could have slept on undisturbed by those piercing screams and by our own comings and goings seemed unbelievable perhaps there were separate quarters in the ground somewhere and then without conscious will of my own i felt my body stiffen and my fingers grip my pipe convulsively a slow tremor seemed to start from the end of my spine travel up it and pass off across my scalp there was someone in the room behind me someone with gleaming eyes fixed upon me and i sat there rigidly straining my ears expecting i knew not what a blow upon the head a cord about the neck a rapid step came up the walk and godfrey appeared suddenly out of the darkness well lester he began but i sprang to my feet and faced the room for i could have sworn that i heard behind me the rustle of a silken dress but there was no one there except Swain and Miss Vaughan and the dead man, and none of them had moved. "'What is it?' Godfrey asked, stepping past me into the room. "'There was someone there, Godfrey,' I said. "'I'm sure of it. I felt someone. I felt his eyes on me, and then, as you spoke, I heard the rustle of a dress.' "'Of a dress?' "'Or of a robe,' and my thoughts were on the bearded man upstairs. Godfrey glanced at me, crossed the room, and looked out into the hall. Then he turned back to me well whoever it was he said and i could see that he thought my ears had deceived me he has made good his escape there'll be a doctor and a nurse here in a few minutes and i got simmons and told him to bring goldberger along he can't get here for an hour anyway and i've got a change here for swain he added with a gesture towards some garments he carried over one arm also a bracer to be administered to him and he drew a flask from his pocket and handed it to me maybe you need one yourself he added smiling dryly since you've taken to hearing rustling robes i do i said though not on that account and i raised the flask to my lips and took a long swallow suppose you take swain up to the bathroom godfrey suggested and help him to get cleaned up i'll go down to the gate and wait for the doctor the gate's probably locked i thought of that and he drew a small but heavy hammer from his pocket i'll smash the lock if there's no other way i'd like you to get swain into shape before anyone arrives he added he's not a prepossessing object as he is no he isn't i agreed looking at him and i took the garments which godfrey held out to me then i went over to swain and put the flask into his uninjured hand take a drink of that i said he did not understand at first then he put the flask to his lips and drank eagerly so eagerly that i had to draw it away he watched me longingly as I screwed on the cap and slipped it into my pocket, and there was more color in his face and a brighter light in his eyes. "'Now come along,' I said, and get that cut fixed up. He rose obediently and followed me out into the hall. Godfrey had preceded us, found the light switch after a brief search, and turned it on. "'There's a switch in the bathroom, too, no doubt,' he said. "'Bring him down again as soon as you get him fixed up you'll find some cotton and gauze in one of the pockets of the coat swain followed me up the stair and into the bathroom he seemed to understand what i intended doing for he divested himself of coat and shirt and was soon washing arms and face vigorously then he dried himself and stood patiently while i washed and bandaged the cut on the wrist 
It was not a deep one, and had about stopped bleeding. "'Feel better?' I asked. "'Yes,' he said, and without waiting for me to tell him, slipped into the clean shirt which Godfrey had brought, attached the collar, and tied the tie, all this quite composedly and without hesitation or clumsiness. Yet I felt in some indefinable way that something was seriously wrong with him. His eyes were vacant and his face flabby, as though the muscles were relaxed. It gave me the feeling that his intelligence was relaxed, too. He picked up his own coat, but I stopped him. "'Don't put that on,' I said, speaking to him as I would have spoken to a child. "'The sleeve is blood-stained, and there's a long tear down the side. Take this one,' and I held out the light lounging coat Godfrey had brought with him. Swain laid down his own garment without a word and put on the other one. I rolled the soiled garments into a bundle, took them under my arm, turned out the lights, and led the way downstairs. A murmur of voices from the library told me that someone had arrived, and when I reached the door I saw that it was the doctor and the nurse. The former was just rising from a rapid examination of the quivering figure on the couch. "'We must get her to a bed at once,' he said, turning to Godfrey. "'Her bedroom's upstairs, I suppose?' yes said godfrey shall i show you the way the doctor nodded and lifting the girl carefully in his arms followed godfrey out into the hall the nurse picked up a medicine case from the floor and followed after i had expected swain to rush forward to the couch to make a scene perhaps and had kept my hand upon his arm but to my astonishment he did not so much as glance in that direction he stood patiently beside me with his eyes on the floor and when my restraining hand fell away, he walked slowly to the chair in which he had been sitting, and dropped into it, relaxing limply as with fatigue. Godfrey was back in a moment. "'The doctor was the nearest one I could find,' he said. "'He seems to be all right. But if Miss Vaughan isn't better in the morning, I'll get a specialist out.' "'Godfrey,' I said in a low tone, "'there is something the matter with Swain,' and I motioned to where he sat, flaccid and limp, apparently half asleep. He is suffering from shock or something of that sort. It's something more, anyway, than overwrought nerves. He seems to be only half conscious. I noticed it, said Godfrey with a little nod. We'll have the doctor look at him when he comes down. And he sank wearily into a chair. This has been a pretty strenuous night, Lester. Yes, and it isn't over yet. I wonder what the man with the snake is doing. Still staring into the crystal, no doubt. Do you want to go and see? No, I said decidedly i don't godfrey i added doesn't the absence of servants seem strange to you very strange but i dare say we'll find them around somewhere though they seem to be sound sleepers we didn't look through the whole house you know i'm not going to either i'm going to let the police do that they ought to be here pretty soon i told simmons to bring two or three men with him i glanced at the huddled body of the murdered man with all the night's excitements and surprises, we had not even touched upon that mystery. Not a single gleam of light had been shed upon it, and yet it was the centre about which all these other strange occurrences revolved. Whose hand was it had thrown that cord about the throat and drawn it tight? What motive lay behind? Fearsome and compelling must be the motive to drive a man to such a crime. Would Simmons be able to divine that motive, to build the case up bit by bit until the murderer was found? would godfrey i turned my head to look at him he was lying back in his chair his eyes closed apparently lost in thought and for long minutes there was no movement in the room at last the doctor returned looking more cheerful than when he had left the room he had given miss vaughan an opiate and she was sleeping calmly the nervous trembling had subsided and he hoped that when she waked she would be much better the danger was that brain fever might develop she had evidently suffered a very severe shock yes said godfrey she discovered her father strangled in the chair yonder i saw the body when i came in the doctor remarked imperturbably so it's her father is it yes and strangled you say godfrey answered with a gesture and the doctor walked over to the body glanced at the neck then disengaged one of the tightly clenched hands from the armchair raised it and let it fall i could not but envy his admirable self-control how long has he been dead godfrey asked not more than two or three hours the doctor answered the muscles are just beginning to stiffen it looks like murder he added and touched the cord about the neck it is murder you've notified the police they will be here soon i saw the doctor glance at godfrey and then at me plainly puzzled as to our footing in the house 
but if there was a question in his mind he kept it from his lips and turned back again to the huddled body any clue to the murderer he asked at last we have found none and then the doctor stooped suddenly and picked up something from the floor beside the chair perhaps this is a clue he said quietly and held to the light an object which as i sprang to my feet i saw to be a blood-stained handkerchief he spread it out under our eyes handling it gingerly for it was still damp and we saw it was a small handkerchief a woman's handkerchief of delicate texture it was fairly soaked with blood and yet in a peculiar manner for two of the corners were much crumpled but quite unstained the doctor raised his eyes to godfrey's what do you make of it he asked a clue certainly said godfrey but scarcely to the murderer the doctor looked at it again for a moment and then nodded i'd better put it back where i found it i guess he said and dropped it beside the chair and then suddenly i remembered swain i turned to find him still drooping forward in his chair apparently half asleep doctor i said there is someone else here who is suffering from shock and i motioned toward the limp figure or perhaps it's something worse than that the doctor stepped quickly to the chair and looked down at its occupant then he put his hand under swain's chin raised his head and gazed intently into his eyes swain returned the gaze but plainly in only a half-conscious way it looks like a case of concussion said the doctor after a moment the left pupil is enlarged and he ran his hand rapidly over the right side of swain's head i thought so he added there's a considerable swelling we must get him to bed then he noticed the bandaged wrist what's the matter here he asked touching it with his finger he cut himself on a piece of glass godfrey explained you'd better take him over to my place where he can be quiet i've got my car outside said the doctor and together he and i raised swain from the chair and led him to it he went docilely and without objection and ten minutes later was safely in bed already dozing off under the influence of the opiate the doctor had given him he'll be all right in the morning the latter assured me but he must have got quite a blow over the head i don't know what happened to him i answered you'll come back with me won't you yes i may be useful and he turned the car back the way we had come besides he added frankly i'm curious to learn what happened in that house to-night he had certainly shown himself equal to emergencies i reflected and i liked his voice and his manner which was cool and capable my name is lester i said i'm a lawyer staying with mr godfrey we heard miss vaughan scream and ran over to the house but we don't know any more than you do my name is hinman and i'm just a country doctor said my companion but if i can be of any help i hope you'll call upon me hello he added as we turned through the gate into the grounds of elmhurst and he threw on the brake sharply for a uniformed figure had stepped out into the glare of our lamps and held up his hand the police had arrived end of chapter eight chapter nine first steps we found a little group of men gathered about the chair in which sat the huddled body two of them i already knew one was detective sergeant simmons and the other coroner goldberger both of whom i had met in previous cases simmons was a stolid unimaginative but industrious and efficient officer with whom godfrey had long ago concluded an alliance offensive and defensive in other words godfrey threw what story he could to simmons and simmons such stories as he could to godfrey and so the arrangement was to their mutual advantage goldberger was a more astute man than the detective in that he possessed a strain of semitic imagination a quick wit and a fair degree of insight he was in his glory in a case like this this was shown now by his gleaming eyes and the trembling hand which pulled nervously at his short black moustache goldberger's moustache was a good index to his mental state the more ragged it grew the more baffling he found the case in hand both he and simmons glanced up at our entrance and nodded briefly then their eyes went back to that huddled figure there were three other men present whom i did not know but i judged them to be the plain clothesmen whom simmons had brought along at godfrey's suggestion they stood a little to one side until their superiors had completed the examination i didn't stop to pick up my physician goldberger was saying but the cause of death is plain enough dr hinman here is a physician i said bringing him forward if he can be of any service goldberger glanced at him and was plainly favourably impressed by hinman's dark eager face and air of intelligence and self-control i shall be very glad of dr hinman's help said goldberger shaking hands with him 
have you examined the body sir only very casually answered hinman but it is evident that the cause of death was strangulation how long has he been dead hinman lifted the stiff hand again and ran his fingers along the muscles of the arm about four hours i should say goldberger glanced at his watch that would put his death at a little before midnight the murderer must have come in from the grounds crept up behind his victim thrown the cord about his neck and drawn it tight before his presence was suspected the victim would hardly have remained seated in the chair if he had known his danger after the cord was round his throat he had no chance he could not even cry out there is one thing i don't understand though he added after a moment where did that blood come from and he pointed to the dark spots on the collar of the white robe hinman looked up with a little exclamation i forgot he said did you find the handkerchief no i see you didn't and he pointed to where it lay on the floor i noticed it when i first looked at the body without a word goldberger bent and picked up the blood-stained handkerchief then he and simmons examined it minutely finally the coroner looked at godfrey and his eyes were very bright there can only be one inference he said the dead man is not bleeding the cord did not cut the flesh the blood then must have come from the murderer he must have been injured in some way bleeding profusely look at this handkerchief it is fairly soaked i am sure that at that instant the same thought was in godfrey's mind which flashed through mine for our eyes met and there was a shadow in his which i knew my own reflected then i glanced at hinman he was looking at the handkerchief thoughtfully his lips tightly closed i could guess what he was thinking but he said nothing goldberger laid the handkerchief on the table at last and turned back to the body he bent close above it examining the blood spots and when he stood erect again there was in his face a strange excitement lend me your glass simmons he said and when simmons handed him a small pocket magnifying glass he unfolded it and bent above the stains again scrutinizing each in turn at last he closed the glass with an emphatic little snap this case isn't going to be so difficult after all he said those spots are fingerprints with an exclamation of astonishment simmons took the glass and examined the stains then he handed it to godfrey who finally passed it on to me looking through it i saw that goldberger was right the stains had been made by human fingers most of them were mere smudges but here and there was one in which faint lines could be dimly traced they seem to be pretty vague i remarked passing the glass on to hinman they're plenty clear enough for our purpose said goldberger besides they will come out much clearer in photographs it's lucky this stuff is so smooth and closely woven he added fingering a corner of the robe or we wouldn't have got even those it's as hard and fine as silk how do you suppose those marks came there mr goldberger godfrey asked and there was in his tone a polite scepticism which evidently annoyed the coroner why there's only one way they could come there goldberger answered impatiently they were put there by the murderer's fingers as he drew the cord tight do you see anything improbable in that only that it seems too good to be true godfrey answered quietly and goldberger after looking at him a moment turned away with a shrug of the shoulders see if you can get the cord loose simmons he said the cord was in the form of a running noose which had been knotted to hold it in place after being drawn tight although it had not cut the flesh of the neck it had sunk deeply into it and simmons worked at the knot for some moments without result i suspect his fingers were not quite as steady as they might have been but it was evidently an intricate knot that's a new one on me he said at last i can't get it loose godfrey bent close above it and looked at it it is a peculiar knot he agreed if you'll permit a suggestion mr goldberger you'll cut the cord and leave the knot as it is it may help us to find the man who made it you're right agreed goldberger promptly cut the cord simmons simmons got out his pocket-knife opened it and slipped the blade under the cord cut it and pulled it out of the ridge of flesh he looked at it a moment and then handed it to goldberger the latter examined it carefully it's stained with blood too he remarked and passed it on to godfrey it looks like a curtain rod godfrey said and made a little tour of the room ah he added after a moment from the door opening into the grounds see here he was holding up the end of the cord by which the curtains covering the upper part of the double doors were controlled 
you are right mr coroner he said in thinking that the murderer entered by this door for he stopped here and cut off a piece of this cord before going into the room then he must also have stopped to make it into a noose remarked goldberger if he did that he was certainly a cool customer it's a wonder his victim didn't hear the noise he made making a knot isn't a noisy operation godfrey pointed out besides the back of the chair was toward the door and then of course it's possible his victim did hear him but then he would have jumped from the chair objected simmons not necessarily suppose you were sitting there and heard a noise and looked round and saw me standing there you wouldn't jump from the chair would you no i'd have no reason to jump from you perhaps vaughn thought he had no reason to jump from the man he saw if he saw anyone i'm inclined to think however that he didn't suspect anyone else was in the room until he felt the cord about his neck and of course said goldberger taking the cord again and looking at it it was while the murderer was making it into a noose with his blood-stained fingers that he stained it in that way don't you agree mr godfrey that is a possible explanation godfrey conceded but why did he make the second knot inquired the coroner the knot which holds the noose tight and prevents it from slipping if he hadn't knotted it like that he would have had to stand there holding it until his victim was dead as it was he didn't have to wait i shivered a little at the thought of the scoundrel calmly tying the knot to secure his noose and then leaving his victim to twitch his life out it's no little trick to tie a knot like that godfrey added thoughtfully i should like to study it all right agreed goldberger you can have it whenever you want it and he got a heavy manila envelope out of his pocket and placed the cord carefully inside now we must get that robe off we can't run any risk of having those fingerprints smeared it was a difficult job and a revolting one for the body had stiffened into its huddled posture but at last the robe was removed and the body itself lying at full length on its back on the couch seen thus with the light full on it the face was horrible and goldberger laid his handkerchief over the swollen and distorted features while at a sign from him simmons pulled down the portier from the inner door and placed it over the body then the coroner picked up the robe and held it out at arm's length what kind of a freak dress is this anyway he asked that's a robe said godfrey mr vaughan was a mystic a what a mystic a believer in hinduism or some other oriental religion they do dress this way all the time i believe so it is probably the dress of his order goldberger rolled the robe up carefully and said nothing more but i could see from his expression that he had ceased to wonder why vaughan had come to a strange and violent end surely anything might happen to a mystic then he placed the blood-stained handkerchief in another envelope and finally put his hand in his pocket and brought out half a dozen cigars now he said let's sit down and rest a while simmons tells me it was you who called him mr godfrey how did you happen to discover the crime the question was asked carelessly but i could feel the alert mind behind it i knew that godfrey felt it too from the way in which he told the story for he told it carefully and yet with an air of keeping nothing back of the mysterious light he said nothing but starting with my finding of the letter and summoning swain to receive it told of the arrangements for the rendezvous dwelling upon it lightly as a love affair which could have no connection with the tragedy he passed on to his own arrival from the city to swain's return from the rendezvous and finally to the screams which had reached us and to the discovery we had made when we burst into the house i summoned dr hinman immediately he added for miss vaughan seemed to be in a serious condition then i called simmons and suggested that he stop for you mr coroner for i knew that the case would interest you dr hinman arrived perhaps half an hour ahead of you and had miss vaughan put to bed at once and i guess you know the rest he concluded we had all listened intently i was pretty sure that simmons would make no inferences which godfrey wished to avoid but i feared the more penetrating mind of the coroner his first question proved that i was right to do so where is this man swain he asked he was suffering from the shock said godfrey and lester and dr hinman took him over to my place and put him to bed that's where they were when you got here he seemed to be suffering from a slight concussion hinman explained there was a swelling on one side of his head as though someone had struck him and the pupils of his eyes were unsymmetrical he had also a cut on the wrist he added after an instant's hesitation ah commented goldberger with a glance at godfrey 
had it been bleeding he cut himself when crossing the wall godfrey explained a mere scratch but i believe it did bleed a good deal ah said goldberger again and then he turned to the doctor did i understand you to say that he went to sleep he certainly did i gave him a good strong opiate to make sure of it do you think he'll sleep till morning he'll sleep nine or ten hours at least then that's all right said goldberger and settled back into his chair again but didn't anybody live in this house except that old man and his daughter aren't there any servants there must be some somewhere about answered godfrey to whom the question was addressed but lester and i looked through the lower floor and part of the upper one and didn't find any there's a bell there by the door but nobody answered when i rang we didn't have time to go all over the house we did find one thing though he added as if by an afterthought what was that there's an adept in one of the rooms upstairs goldberger sat up and stared at him an adept he repeated what's that an expert in mysticism i judge that vaughn was his pupil do you mean he's a hindu asked the coroner as though that would explain everything but godfrey was having his revenge i don't know whether he's a hindu or not he said airily i didn't get a very good look at him what was he doing goldberger demanded he was just sitting there again goldberger stared at him this time suspiciously but good heavens man he cried that was three or four hours ago you don't suppose he's sitting there yet yes said godfrey dryly i think he is goldberger's face flushed and he sprang to his feet impatiently show me the room he commanded glad to said godfrey laconically and led the way out into the hall the whole crowd tailed along after him as i rose to follow i saw that the outside world was turning gray with the approaching dawn the nurse hearing our footsteps on the stairs looked out in alarm and held up a warning finger godfrey paused for a word with her how is she he asked sleeping quietly said the nurse but please don't make any more noise than you can help we won't godfrey promised and crossed the hall to the door leading into the little entry then he paused and looked around at goldberger better go slow here he cautioned the adept has a pet cobra the snake the deadliest snake in the world goldberger drew back a little as did all the others i don't think it will bite us though added godfrey cheerfully if we don't crowd it it's sitting there too and he opened the outer door passed through and held back the curtain at the farther end i was just behind goldberger and simmons and i heard their gasp of amazement as they saw what lay beyond the scene had not changed in the slightest detail the crystal sphere still softly glowed with intangible shadows flitting across its surface the adept still sat cross-legged staring into its depths opposite him the cobra its hood distended swayed slowly to and fro but as we stood there staring a single delicate ray of sunlight coming through a pinhole in the curtained window struck the sphere and seemed to extinguish it the glow within it flickered and fluttered and finally vanished and it hung there dull and gray an instant later the motionless figure raised its arms high in the air with a motion somehow familiar then it got slowly to its feet crossed to the window drew back the curtain and flung wide the shutter the sun was just peeping over the trees to the east and for a second its light blinded me then i saw the adept bowing low before it his arms still extended once twice thrice he bowed as before a deity while we stood there staring then he turned slowly toward us enter friends he said calmly the peace of the holy one be on you and his love within your hearts end of chapter nine chapter ten the white priest of siva the adept was an impressive figure as he stood there with the sun behind him throwing a yellow nimbus around his head the robe he wore was of a rich purple and gave an added effect of height and dignity to a figure already tall his hair was dark and crinkled like wind-swept water his complexion dark but with an underblush of red in the cheeks his lips were scarlet and his eyes coal-black and of an arresting brilliance the whole effect he gave was of transcendent energy and magnetism nor did he show the slightest fatigue from his long vigil his eyes swept our faces as we stood crowded there in the doorway 
he did not seem surprised if there was any expression in his face except courteous inquiry it was one of carefully suppressed amusement enter friends he repeated what is it you desire his voice was rich and deep and he spoke with a peculiar intonation but without accent it was something of a shock to hear the ordinary words of english speech coming from his lips for they seemed formed to utter prophecies in unknown tongues goldberger took one step into the room and then stopped abruptly following his eyes i saw that the cobra had also awakened from its trance and was regarding us steadily and hissing slightly the adept smiled as he saw us shrink back do not fear he said come toto and stepping across the room he lifted the cobra in one hand and held it a moment close to him gently stroking the distended hood the snake curled itself about his arm and seemed to cuddle to him but it kept its eyes fixed on us i could not but smile at the incongruity of its name toto was well enough for a french poodle but for a cobra after a moment the adept lifted the lid of a round basket which stood on the floor near the divan dropped the snake gently into it and fastened down the lid then he clapped his hands softly and an instant later the curtains at the rear of the room parted and a strange figure appeared between them it was the figure of a man not over five feet tall and very thin he was almost as dark as a full-blooded negro and the white burnous which was thrown about his shoulders and covered him to just below the hips made him look even darker his legs were bare and seemed to be nothing but skin and bone the flat-nosed face with its full lips and prominent eyes reminded me of an idol i had seen pictured somewhere the newcomer bowed low before the adept and at a sign from him picked up toto's basket and disappeared with it through the curtains he had not even glanced in our direction the adept turned back to us now friends he said will you not enter goldberger led the way into the room and stopped to look about it the walls were hung with black velvet so arranged that windows and doors could be covered also and the room was absolutely devoid of furniture save for a low circular divan in the centre of which stood the crystal sphere supported as i saw now by a slender pedestal i have a few questions to ask you began goldberger at last in a voice deferential despite himself proceed sir said the adept courteously do you know that mr vaughan is dead the adept made a little deprecating gesture not dead he protested a man does not die his soul rejoins the oversoul that is all yes i know that at midnight the soul of my pupil passed over how did you learn that goldberger demanded i saw it in the sphere replied the adept calmly where were you at the time i was gazing at the sphere do you mean asked goldberger incredulously that you sat for five hours and more staring at that thing my vigil began at sundown said the adept with a slight smile last night was the white night of siva it must be spent in meditation by all who follow him goldberger worried his moustache with nervous fingers as he stared at the adept plainly at a loss how to proceed perhaps ventured godfrey softly your crystal could give us some further information which we very much desire the adept turned his dark eyes on the speaker and it seemed to me that they glittered more coldly as though they recognized an adversary what information sir he asked information as to the manner of mr vaughan's passing can you tell us anything about that the adept shook his head i only saw the soul as it passed over i knew however that it had been torn from the body by violence how did you know that broke in goldberger because of its colour answered the adept and then when he saw our benumbed expressions he explained souls which pass in peace are white souls which the body has driven forth by its own hands are black souls which are torn from the body by an alien hand are red my pupil's soul was red i could see that goldberger did not know whether to snort with derision or to be impressed he ended by smiling feebly as for me i admit i was impressed 
when an alien hand as you put it is used said the coroner we call it murder in this country and the law tries to get hold of the alien and to send its soul after its victims that's what we are trying to do now we are officers of the law the adept bowed any assistance i can give you he said softly i shall be glad to give though to do murder as you call it is not always to do wrong our law doesn't make such distinctions said goldberger dryly may i ask your profession i am a white priest of siva said the adept touching his forehead lightly with the fingers of his left hand as in reverence who is siva the holy one the oversoul from whom we come and to whom we all return again goldberger worried his moustache well he said at last until the mystery is cleared up i must ask you not to leave this house i have no wish to leave it sir on the other fellow the fellow who took away the snake where was he last night he slept in a small room opening into this one may i look into it certainly and the adept swept aside the curtains the room into which we looked was not more than ten feet square and empty of furniture except for a mat in the middle of the floor and three or four baskets set against the wall on the mat was squatted the attendant his legs crossed with feet uppermost and his hands held palm to palm before him on the floor in front of him were what looked to me like a strip of cloth a bone and a tooth he did not raise his eyes at our entrance but sat calmly contemplating these relics goldberger's moustache lost a few more hairs as he stood staring down at this strange figure what are those things his grandmother's remains he asked at last those are the attributes of kali said the adept gravely as one rebuking blasphemy very interesting no doubt commented the coroner dryly would it disturb the gentleman too much to ask him a few questions he speaks no english but i shall be glad to translate for you the coroner thought this over for a moment and then shook his head no he said i'll wait for the court interpreter you might tell him though that there will be officers of the law on duty below and that he is not to leave the house i will caution him answered the adept and let the curtain fall as we passed out i suppose there are some other servants somewhere about the place asked goldberger there are three they sleep on the floor above are they hindus too oh no and the adept smiled two of them are german and the other is irish the coroner reddened a little for the words somehow conveyed a subtle rebuke that is all for to-day he said unless mr simmons has some questions and he looked at his companion but simmons to whom all these inquiries had plainly been successive steps into the darkness shook his head then we will bid you good morning added goldberger still a little on his dignity and many thanks for your courtesy the adept responded with a low bow and with a smile decidedly ironical i at least felt that we had got the worst of the encounter goldberger without a word led the way up the stair that mounted to the attic story and there soon succeeded in routing out the three servants the germans proved to be a man and a wife well past middle age the former the gardener and the latter the cook erin was represented by a red-haired girl who was the housemaid all of them were horrified when told their master had been murdered but none of them could shed any light on the tragedy they had all been in bed long before midnight and had not been disturbed by any of the noises of the night this could be the more readily understood when as a little investigation showed we found that they had all slept with doors locked and windows closed and shuttered any sounds from the house would really have to penetrate two doors to reach them for their rooms were at the end of an entry closed by an outer door as to the windows it was the rule of the house that they should always be closed and tightly shuttered during the night they knew of no especial reason for the rule though the irish girl remarked that with heathen in the house and lunatics there was no telling how the nights were spent they were all evidently innocent of any connection with the tragedy but goldberger for some ridiculous reason brought them downstairs with him and made them look at their master's body this had no result except to send the irish girl into hysterics and hinman for a few minutes had another patient on his hands well said goldberger passing his hand wearily across his forehead i guess there's nothing more to be done and i'm dead tired i had just got to bed when simmons called me 
i'll set the inquest for ten o'clock to-morrow morning and i'll hold it here in this room we'll want you here mr godfrey and you mr lester and oh yes he added suddenly we'll want that mr swain whose story i haven't heard yet no doubt of his appearing is there absolutely none i assured him i could put him under guard of course said goldberger pensively for i'm sure he'll prove to be a very important witness but if you will be personally responsible for him mr lester i will i agreed and goldberger nodded have him here at ten o'clock then he said dr henman would better see him again to-day i suggested i'll call about four o'clock this afternoon the doctor promised and leaving goldberger to contemplate his arrangements and simmons to post his men godfrey and i stepped out upon the lawn it was after five o'clock and the sun was already high it scarcely seemed possible that only six hours before swain had crossed the wall for the first time we'd better go out as we came godfrey said and turned across the lawn he walked with head down and face puckered with thought can you make anything of it i asked but he only shook his head we soon reached the ladder and godfrey paused to look about him the shrubbery was broken in one place as though some heavy body had fallen on it and this was evidently the mark of swain's wild jump from the wall at last godfrey motioned to me to precede him and when i was over reached one ladder down to me and descended to my side we replaced the ladders against the shed and then walked on toward the house as we turned to the corner we found mrs hargis standing on the front porch well you are out early she said yes laughed godfrey fact is we haven't been to bed yet will you have something to eat lester before you turn in a glass of milk was all i wanted and five minutes later i mounted to my room i glanced in for a moment at swain who seemed to be sleeping peacefully and then darkened my room as well as i could and tumbled into bed i must have dropped asleep the moment my head touched the pillow for i remember nothing more until i opened my eyes to find godfrey standing over me end of chapter ten chapter eleven swain's story i hate to wake you lester godfrey said smiling but it's nearly four o'clock dr henman will be here before long and if you're going to hear swain's story you'll have to be getting up i sat up in bed at once all trace of sleepiness vanished how is he i asked he seems to be all right he's been up for some time i haven't said anything to him about last night i wanted the doctor to see him first besides i thought you ought to be present i'll be down right away i said and twenty minutes later i found godfrey and swain sitting together on the front porch as swain returned my greeting i was relieved to see that his eyes were no longer fixed and staring but seemed quite normal mrs hargis has your breakfast ready said godfrey and i think i'll join you will you come mr swain no thank you swain replied i had my breakfast only about an hour ago i'll just sit here if you don't mind all right said godfrey we won't be long and together we went back to the dining-room mrs hargis was there and greeted us as though stopping out till dawn and breakfasting at four o'clock in the afternoon were the most ordinary things in the world a copy of the record was lying as usual on the table and a black headline caught my eye worthington vaughan murdered rich recluse strangled to death at his home in the bronx i glanced at godfrey in surprise yes he said reddening a little i was just in time to phone the story in for the last edition i called the doctor first though lester you must give me credit for that and it was a beautiful scoop what time did you get up i asked about noon i sent down the full story for tomorrow morning's paper just before i called you any developments none that i know of of course i haven't heard swain's story yet godfrey i said it seems to me that this thing is going to look bad for swain i think goldberger suspects him already a good deal depends upon his story yes it does godfrey agreed we finished the meal in silence it was not a long one for i at the least was anxious to get back to swain as we rejoined him on the porch dr hinman's car came up the drive he got out and shook hands with us as he greeted swain i saw him glance anxiously into his eyes and saw also that the glance reassured him 
you're feeling better today he said sitting down by swain's side yes said swain quietly i'm feeling all right again how is miss vaughan doctor i asked swain jerked around toward the doctor is miss vaughan ill he demanded she had a shock last night answered the doctor slowly but she's getting along nicely she'll have to be kept quiet for a few days i was looking at swain curiously he was rubbing his head perplexedly as though trying to bring some confused memory to the surface of his mind i seem to remember he said that miss vaughan fainted and that i picked her up then he stopped and stared at us is her father dead yes i said and he fell to rubbing his head again i glanced at hinman and he nodded slightly i took it for assurance that swain might be questioned godfrey who had gone indoors to get some cigars came back with a handful all of us including swain lighted up now swain i began i want you to tell us all that you remember of last night's happenings both mr godfrey and dr hinman are in my confidence and you may speak freely before them i want them to hear your story because i want their advice there was a pucker of perplexity on swain's face i've been trying ever since i woke up this morning to straighten out my remembrance of last night he began slowly but i haven't succeeded very well at least everything seems to stop right in the middle go ahead i said and tell us what you do remember maybe it will grow clearer as you recall it or maybe we can fill in the gaps begin at the moment you went over the wall we know everything that happened up to that time you remember that clearly don't you oh yes cried swain i remember all that and he settled back in his chair well after i went down the ladder i found myself in a clump of shrubbery and beyond that was a path i knew that the arbour where i was to meet miss vaughan was in the corner of the grounds at the back next to mr godfrey's place so i turned back along the wall leaving the path which curved away from it it was very dark under the trees and i had to go slowly for fear of running into one of them but i finally found the arbour i struck a match to assure myself that it was empty and then sat down to wait once or twice i fancied i heard someone moving outside but it was only the wind among the trees i guess for it was fully half an hour before miss vaughan came i could see how his hand was trembling on the arm of his chair and he paused a moment to collect himself what miss vaughan told me he went on at last and i saw that of the details of the meeting he did not intend to speak convinced me that her father was quite mad much worse than i had suspected i knew of course that he was a student of the supernatural but since the coming of this yogi this what hinman interrupted a yogi swain answered turning toward him is as nearly as i can make out a sort of high priest of hinduism he knows all its secrets and is supposed to be able to do all sorts of supernatural things this fellow who lived with mr vaughan is a yogi mr vaughan was his disciple where did the yogi come from godfrey asked i don't know i don't think miss vaughan knows he arrived with his attendant about six months ago and since then things have gone from bad to worse there has been crystal gazing and star worship and necromancy of all sorts i confess i didn't understand very much of it he added it was all so wild and weird but it ended not only in mr vaughan's becoming a convert to whatever religion it is the yogi practices but in a determination that his daughter should become a priestess of the cult it was from that she wished me to help her escape he stopped and again rubbed his head slowly as i tell it he went on at last it sounds absurd and unbelievable but as she told it there in the darkness with those strange rustlings around us it sent the chills up and down my spine perhaps those orientals do know more about the supernatural than we give them credit for at any rate i know that miss vaughan had been impressed with the yogi's power it fascinated and at the same time horrified her she said he had a hideous snake a cobra which he petted as she would pet a kitten his voice broke off again and he wiped the perspiration from his forehead i myself felt decidedly nervous godfrey threw away his cigar which had broken in his fingers at any rate swain went on i was so upset by what she told me that i could think of nothing to do except to beg her to come away with me at once i remembered my promise to you mr lester but i was sure you would approve i told her about you that it was into your hands the letter had fallen she said she had seen you looking at her from a tree and had known at a glance that she could trust you you didn't tell me you were in a tree 
he added. Yes, I said awkwardly. I was just taking a little look over the landscape. Rather foolish of me, wasn't it? Well, it was mighty fortunate, anyway. She had written the letter, but she had no idea how she was going to get it to me. You mean she couldn't go out when she wanted to? demanded Godfrey. I gathered from what she told me, said Swain, his face flushing with anger, that she has been practically a prisoner ever since the yogi arrived. Besides, even if she had succeeded in mailing the letter, it wouldn't have reached me until too late. In what way too late? Her father seems to have had a sudden turn for the worse yesterday. He became almost violent in insisting that she consent to his plan. He told her that the life of his own soul, as well as that of hers, depended upon it. He threatened, I don't know what. The yogi talked to her afterwards. He, of course, believed, or pretended to believe, as her father did. Moreover, he told her that her father would certainly suffer a serious mental shock if she refused, perhaps a fatal one. In despair, she finally agreed on the condition that she be given three days in which to prepare herself. If she did not hear from me in that time, she made up her mind to consent. Swain stopped again, and I lay back in my chair, wondering if such things were possible in this twentieth century, here within the boundaries of greater New York. My brain reeled at the absurdity of it. Vaughn was undoubtedly suffering from mania, said Dr. Hinman in a low voice. The symptoms, as Mr. Swain describes them, are unmistakable. It was that argument I used, said Swain. I told her that since he was clearly mad, she must in self-defense place herself beyond his reach. But she refused to leave him. Then I argued, in kindness to him, she must have him committed to some institution, where he would be taken care of, and where he might, in time, regain his sanity. I told her that it would be criminal folly to permit him to remain longer under the influence of the yogi. She had to agree with me, and she finally consented to sign an affidavit to the facts as I have told them, and a petition asking that a commission be appointed to examine her father. You were to have drawn up the papers today, Mr. Lester, and I was to have taken them to her for signature tonight. That would have settled the matter, said Godfrey thoughtfully. It's too bad it wasn't settled in that way. What else happened to Mr. Swain? Miss Vaughan had grown very nervous with all this discussion, and at last she sprang to her feet and said she must go, or her father would discover her absence. We rose to leave the arbor, and at that instant a white-robed figure sprang to her side, seized her, and tore her away from me. I was too startled for an instant to resist. Then, as I started toward them, Marjorie pushed me back. "'Go, go!' she cried. "'It is my father!' But he stopped me, in a voice shaking and husky with rage. He warned me that if I entered the place again, my life would be forfeit. I can't repeat the horrible things he said. I could see his eyes gleaming like a wild beast's. He cursed me. I had never been cursed before. And Swain smiled thinly. And I confess it wasn't pleasant. Then he led his daughter away. I stood staring after them. I didn't know what to do. I felt like a madman myself. I sat down and tried to collect my thoughts. I saw that some new plan must be made that there was no hope of meeting marjorie again i was sick with fear for her i thought of following to the house and compelling her to come with me at once and then suddenly i saw two eyes gleaming at me they were not human eyes they were too close together and they were swaying gently back and forth in the air about a foot from the ground i gazed at them fascinated and then i heard a soft low whistle followed by a faint hissing as the eyes fell forward in a flash, I knew what it was, the cobra. I knew why it was there. Vaughn had said my life was forfeit. I sprang up with a shriek, dashed along the seat to the door and out into the darkness. I struck my head against something, a tree, I suppose, but I kept on and I reached the wall and got over it somehow. It is all confused after that. I seem to remember hearing Marjorie scream and finding her lying beside her father, who was dead, but I can't put things together. And he rubbed his head helplessly. I'll put them together for you, said Godfrey. When you ran into the tree, you suffered a partial concussion. It's lucky it wasn't Toto, or Toto would have got you. Toto? That, I believe, is the cobra's name, explained Godfrey with a smile. Unless, of course, there are two of them. And he told Swain in detail of the events which had followed. Swain listened with staring eyes. I did not blame him. Indeed, I felt that my own eyes were staring a little, though I already knew the story. But Godfrey, with a gift of narration born of long newspaper experience, 
told it in a way that made its horrors salient and left one gasping there is one question i want to ask you swain he said in conclusion and i want you to think carefully before you answer it during your altercation with mr vaughan did you at any time touch him touch him no of course not and swain shook his head decidedly you are sure of that asked godfrey earnestly perfectly sure said swain looking at him in astonishment i was never within three feet of him godfrey sprang to his feet with a gesture of relief i seem to need a cocktail he said in another tone isn't that the prescription for all of us doctor yes assented hinman smiling and after that complete change of subject End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 Guesses at the Riddle We tried to follow Dr. Hinman's prescription, but not with any great success, for it is difficult to talk about one thing and think about another. So the doctor took himself off before long, and Swain announced that he himself would have to return to the city. He had come out without so much as a toothbrush, he pointed out his trousers were in a lamentable condition and while godfrey's coat was welcome it was far from a perfect fit which reminds me he added that i don't know what has become of my own coat and shirt i looked at godfrey quickly no i forgot them he said they're over in the library at elmhurst he added to swain you can get them to-morrow i shall have to be there to-morrow then yes at the inquest i've promised to produce you there i said at what time you'd better be there by ten very well that's all the more reason for getting back to my base of supplies if i went on the stand looking like this the jury would probably think i was the murderer he added laughing my answering smile was decidedly thin godfrey did not even try to force one wait a few minutes he suggested and i'll take you down in my car i'll try to get back early lester he added apologetically i'm far from an ideal host but you'll find some books on my desk that may interest you i got them up to-day take a look at them after dinner he went back to bring out his car and swain sat down again beside me mr lester he said in a low voice i hope you haven't forgotten your promise what promise to put miss vaughan in a safe place and to look after her interests no i said i haven't forgotten i am going to ask to see her after the inquest to-morrow if she wishes us to represent her we will and to protect her he added quickly she hasn't even a mad father now she's safe enough for the present i pointed out dr hinman has employed another nurse so that one is with her all the time i won't be satisfied said swain till you get her out of that house and away from those damned hindus one nurse or even two wouldn't stop them stop them from what i don't know and he twisted his fingers helplessly well the police will stop them there are three or four men on duty there with orders to let no one in or out his face brightened ah that's better he said i didn't know that how long will they be there till after the inquest anyway and you will see miss vaughan after the inquest yes and urge her to go to mr and mrs royce yes but i don't think she'll need much urging i'll get a note from mrs royce i'll telephone to mr royce now and you can stop and get the note as you come up in the morning godfrey's car glided up the drive and stopped at the porch swain held out his hand and clasped mine warmly thank you mr lester he said and a moment later the car turned into the driveway and passed from sight then i went in got mr royce on the phone and gave him a brief outline of the incidents of the night before he listened with an exclamation of astonishment from time to time and assented heartily when i suggested that miss vaughan might be placed in mrs royce's care temporarily she's a beautiful girl i concluded and very young i agree with swain that she mustn't be left alone in that house certainly she mustn't said my partner i'll have mrs royce write the note and get a room ready for her of course i said it's possible she won't come though i believe she'll be glad to or there may be a family lawyer who will want to look after her only she didn't appear to know of any when she was talking to swain well bring her along if you can said mr royce we'll be glad to have her and take your time about coming back if you're needed up there we're getting along all right i thanked him and hung up and presently mrs hargis came to summon me to dinner 
that meal over i went into godfrey's desk to see what the books were he had suggested that i look at there was quite a pile of them and i saw that they all related to mysticism or to the religions of india there was sir monier williams's brahmanism and hinduism hopkins's the religions of india a work on crystallomancy mr lloyd tuckey's standard work on hypnotism and suggestion and some half dozen others whose titles i have forgotten and as i looked at them i began to understand one reason for godfrey's success as a solver of mysteries no detail of a subject ever escaped him i lit my pipe sat down and was soon deep in the lore of the east i must confess that i did not make much of it in that maze of superstition the most i could do was to pick up a thread here and there the yogi had referred to the white knight of siva and i soon found out that siva is one of the gods of hinduism one of a great trilogy brahma the creator vishnu the preserver and siva the destroyer he had also spoken of the attributes of kali and after a little further research i discovered that kali was siva's wife a most unprepossessing and fiendish female but when i passed on to hinduism itself and tried to understand its tenets and its sects i found myself out of my depth they were so jumbled so multitudinous and so diverse that i could get no clear idea of them i read of the vedas the upanishads the brahmanas of metaphysical abstractions too tenuous to grasp of karna or action of maya or illusion and i knew not what tangled jumble of ghosts and demons demigods and deified saints household gods village gods tribal gods universal gods with their countless shrines and temples and din of discordant rites at last in despair i gave it up and turned to the book on crystallomancy here at least was something comprehensible if not altogether believable and i read with interest of the antiquity of crystal gazing as a means of inducing hallucination for the purpose of seeking information not to be gained by any normal means i read of its use in china in assyria in egypt in arabia in india in greece and rome of how its practitioners in the middle ages were looked upon as heretics and burnt at the stake or broken on the wheel of the famous dr d and so down to the present time the scryers or seers sometimes used mirrors sometimes vessels filled with water but usually a polished stone and beryl was especially esteemed the effect of gazing at these intently for a time was to abstract the mind from normal sensory impressions and to induce a state of partial hypnosis during which the scryer claimed he could perceive in the crystal dream pictures of great vividness scenes at a distance occurrences of the past and of the future i was still deep in this when i heard a step outside the door opened and godfrey came in he smiled when he saw what i was doing how have you been getting along he asked not very well and i threw the book back on the table the crystal gazing isn't so bad one can understand that but the jumble of abstractions which the hindus call religion is too much for me i didn't know it was so late i added and looked at my watch but it was not yet eleven o'clock i'm earlier than usual said godfrey i cut loose as soon as i could because i thought we'd better talk things over i saw simmons in town tonight. ah i said and what did he tell you nothing i didn't know already the police have discovered nothing new or if they have they're keeping it dark until tomorrow simmons did however regale me with his theory of the case he says the murder was done either by one of the hindus or by young swain what do you think i asked i'm inclined to agree with simmons said godfrey grimly with the emphasis on the hindus he added seeing the look on my face i don't believe swain had any hand in it neither do i i agreed heartily in fact such a theory is too absurd to discuss just the same said godfrey slowly i'm glad he didn't touch vaughn if he had happened to seize him by the neck while they were struggling together in other words if those fingerprints goldberger found had happened to be swain's things would have looked bad for him i'm hoping they'll turn out to belong to one of the hindus but as i said to goldberger i'm afraid that's too good to be true which one of the hindus i asked oh the thug of course i sat bolt upright the thug i echoed didn't you get that far and godfrey picked up one of the books and ran rapidly through the pages you remember we found him squatting on the floor with a rag and a tooth and a bone in front of him yes 
and do you remember how the yogi described them when goldberger asked him about them very distinctly he called them the attributes of kali now listen to this the thugs are a religious fraternity committing murders in honor of kali the wife of siva who they believe assists them and protects them legend asserts that she presented her worshippers with three things the hem of her lower garment to use as a noose a rib to use as a knife and a tooth to use as a pickaxe in burying the victims he glanced at me and then went on but the knife was little used for the religious character of an assassination came to depend more and more upon its bloodless character and for this a noose was used with which the victim was strangled the aversion to bloodshed became in time so great that many sects of thuggy consider it defiling to touch human blood he closed the book and threw it on the table don't you think that proves the case yes i said thoughtfully and the yogi is he also a thug oh no a white priest of siva could never be a thug the worship of siva and of kali are the very opposites of each other the saivas are ascetics that is he added in another tone if the fellow is really a saiva and not just a plain fraud all those fellows are frauds more or less aren't they i questioned no was godfrey's unexpected answer the real yogin are no doubt sincere but a real yogi wouldn't waste his time on a soft-brained old man and fire skyrockets off at midnight to impress him my own opinion is that this fellow is a faker a juggler a sleight-of-hand man and of course a crook well i asked as godfrey stopped and failed to communicate well that's as far as i've got oh yes there's toto a cobra is one of a faker's stock properties but godfrey i protested he is no ignorant roadside juggler he's a cultivated man an unusual man certainly he is most unusual but that doesn't disprove my guess it only makes the problem harder even a roadside juggler doesn't do his tricks for nothing what reward is it this fellow's working for it must be a big one or it wouldn't tempt him i suppose vaughn paid him well i ventured yes but did you look at him lester you've called him unusual but that word doesn't begin to express him he's extraordinary no doubt vaughn did pay him well but it would take something more than that to persuade such a man to spend six months in a place like that and i think i can guess at the stake he's playing for you mean miss vaughn just that and godfrey leaned back in his chair i contemplated this theory for some moments in silence it was at least a theory and an interesting one but it rested on air there was no sort of foundation for it that i could see and at last i said so i know it's pretty thin godfrey admitted but it's the best i've been able to do there's so little to build a theory out of but i'm going to see if i can't prove one part of it true tonight. which part about his being a faker here's my theory that hocus-pocus on the roof at midnight was for the purpose of impressing vaughn no doubt he believed it a real spiritual manifestation whereas it was only a clever bit of jugglery now that vaughn is dead that particular bit of jugglery will cease until there is some new victim to impress in fact it has ceased already there was no star last night but you know why i pointed out the yogi spent the night in contemplation we can bear witness to that we can't bear witness to when he started in said godfrey dryly we didn't see him till after half-past twelve however accepting his explanation there would be no reason for omitting the phenomenon to-night if it's a genuine one no i agreed and if it is omitted godfrey went on it will be pretty conclusive evidence that it isn't genuine although he went on hurriedly i don't need any proof of that anything else would be unbelievable he glanced at his watch it's ten minutes to twelve he said come along i followed him out of the house and through the grove with very mixed sensations if the star didn't fall it would tend to prove that it was as godfrey had said merely a fake arranged to impress a credulous old man but suppose it did fall that was a part of the test concerning which godfrey had said nothing suppose it did fall what then so it was in silence that i followed godfrey up the ladder and took my place on the limb but godfrey seemed to have no uneasiness we won't have long to wait he said we'll wait till five minutes after twelve just to make sure 
it must be twelve now i wish i could persuade that fellow to show me how the fake was worked for it was certainly a good one one of the best he stopped abruptly staring out into the darkness i was staring too for there against the sky a light began to glow and brighten it hung for a moment motionless and then began slowly to descend steadily deliberately as of set purpose lower and lower it sank in a straight line hovered for an instant and burst into a million sparks in the flare of light a white-robed figure stood gazing upwards its arms strained toward the sky as we went silently down the ladder a moment later it seemed to me that i could hear godfrey's theory crashing about his ears end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen francisco silva it was not quite ten o'clock when godfrey and i turned in at the gates of elmhurst next morning and found our way up the drive to the house but in the library we found a considerable company already assembled goldberger was there with freiling Huysen, his physician his clerk his stenographer and then the men who were to constitute the jury simmons was there and with him was an alert little man in glasses who godfrey told me in an aside was sylvester the head of the identification bureau and the greatest expert on fingerprints in america the district attorney had sent up an assistant also with a stenographer and altogether the room was decidedly crowded it became impossible a moment later when a string of automobiles puffed up the drive and disgorged a mob of reporters and photographers as many as the room would hold pushed into it and the others stood outside in the drive and complained loudly the complaints of the photographers were especially varied and forceful goldberger looked around him in despair mopping his face angrily for the crowded room was very hot you fellows will have to get out of here he said to the reporters there's no room i'll give you a transcript of the proceedings after they're over the protests redoubled how were they to get any human interest out of a transcript besides there were the photographers what did he expect them to do photograph the transcript and finally the law required that the hearing be public so they had a right to be present it was a tense moment the more so since goldberger was by no means insensible of the value of newspaper popularity to a man in public life why not go out on the lawn godfrey suggested it's only a question of moving some chairs and tables and the boys will all lend a hand the boys applauded almost forgiving godfrey his scoop protested their entire willingness to lend two hands if necessary and when goldberger nodded his approval fell to work with a will the lower floor of the house was denuded the garden seats pressed into service and at the end of five minutes the court was established amid the circle of trees the reporters had their coats off and their pipes lighted the photographers ditto and their cameras placed good humor was restored peace reigned and goldberger smiled again for he knew that the adjectives with which the reporters would qualify his name would be complimentary ones he took his place rapped for order and instructed his clerk to swear the jury nobody paid much attention to the jury for it was a recognized device for paying small political debts and its verdict was usually in strict accordance with the wishes of the presiding officer then goldberger looked at the vacant chair which i had kept beside me by the way mr lester he said i don't see mr swain he had to go back to the city last night i explained to get some fresh clothes he had an errand or two to do this morning and may have been detained i left word at the house for him to come over here at once you seem to have a good deal of confidence in him goldberger remarked i have i answered quietly a great deal goldberger frowned a little but proceeded to open the case without further delay godfrey was the first witness and told his story much as he had told it the night before i followed him but contributed no new details both of us were excused without cross-examination to my great satisfaction swain arrived while i was testifying and i could not deny myself a triumphant glance at goldberger but he was studying some memoranda and affected not to notice it as soon as i left the stand swain came and sat down beside me and gave me a letter it was addressed to miss vaughan it's from mrs royce he said she's a trump she's determined that marjorie shall come to her she says if you don't bring her she'll come after her herself do you know how she is this morning no i said i haven't seen hinman but how are you oh i'm all right again head a little sore where i bumped it but otherwise fit as a fiddle 
you look it i said and i was glad because i wanted him to make a good impression on the stand i knew what weight appearances often had and no jury i told myself would believe that this bright-eyed fresh-coloured boy could have had any hand in a brutal murder just then hinman's name was called and an officer hurried away to the house after him they returned together almost at once and hinman was placed on the stand he told of being summoned by godfrey and of the events which followed he said that the murder had been committed about midnight that death had been due to strangulation and identified the cord and the blood-stained handkerchief which the coroner submitted to him i fancied that swain lost a little of his colour when he saw the handkerchief and learned where it had been found but he made no remark will miss vaughan be able to testify goldberger inquired just before the doctor stepped down unless it is absolutely necessary i think she would better be excused henman answered she is still very nervous the ordeal might cause a serious collapse we will try to get along without her assented goldberger if necessary i can take her deposition is she in bed yes i am keeping her as quiet as possible very well we won't disturb her said goldberger and hinman was excused and freilinghuisen called he merely testified to the cause of death and that the autopsy had shown that the deceased was in fair health and without organic disease then the servants were called but their evidence was unimportant they had gone to bed about ten o'clock and had not awakened until the coroner himself had pounded at the door they had heard no unusual sound yes they had slept with their doors locked and the windows shuttered because that was the rule of the house yes even in the hottest weather that made no difference since each of their rooms was fitted with a ventilator questioned as to the manner of life of the other inmates of the house the german and his wife were non-committal they had been with the family a long time had taken care of the place when their master was abroad only after his return had it been necessary to get another servant he had been at home for a year and the hindus had arrived about six months later yes they knew their master was studying some strange religion but that was no affair of theirs and they had never seen anything wrong he had always treated them well was a little strange and absent-minded at times but neither of them really saw much of him he never interfered in the household affairs miss vaughan giving such instructions as were necessary the man spent most of his time in the grounds and the woman in the kitchen she was a little petulant over the fact that one of the hindus the ugly one refused to eat her cooking but insisted on preparing his own food also the housemaid had told her that there was a snake but she had never seen it from the irish housemaid a little more information was obtained neither mr vaughan nor the yogi ate any breakfast indeed they rarely left their rooms before noon the other hindu mixed himself up some sort of mess over the kitchen stove miss vaughan breakfasted alone at nine o'clock at such times she was accustomed to talk over household affairs with the maid and after breakfast would visit the kitchen and make a tour of the grounds and garden the remainder of her day would be spent in reading in playing the piano in doing little household tasks or in walking about the grounds with her father yes sometimes the yogi would join them and there would be long discussions after dinner in the library there would also be long discussions but the girl had no idea what they were about she heard a fragment of them occasionally but had never been able to make anything of them in fact from the way they dressed and all she had come to the conclusion that mr vaughan and the yogi were both a little crazy but quite inoffensive and harmless and how about miss vaughan asked the coroner miss vaughan bless her heart wasn't crazy said the girl quickly not a bit of it she was just sad and lonely and who wouldn't be she never went out in the five months i've been here she's never been off the place and them front gates was never opened to let anybody in the only people who came in were the grocer and milkman and such like through the little door at the side you say you have been here five months yes sir and how did you come to apply for the place i didn't apply for it i was sent here by an employment bureau miss marjorie engaged me i didn't see the hindus till afterwards or i don't think i'd have took it after that i stayed for miss marjorie's sake you thought she needed you yes i did with her father moonin around in a kind of trance and the yogi lookin at her with eyes like live coals and a snake that stood on its tail and the other niger goin around with nothin on but a diaper i thought she needed somebody to look after her and says i annie krogan you're the girl to do it 
there was a ripple of laughter and the pencils of the reporters flew across their paper it was the first gleam to enliven a prosaic and tiresome hearing were the hindus intrusive in any way asked the coroner oh no they minded their business i have no complaint on that score did you see any of their religious practices i wouldn't call them religious quite the contrary i've seen them waving their arms and bowing to the sun and settin in the dark staring at a glass globe with a light in it that's about all i got used to it after a while just went on about my work without taking any notice there was little more to be got from her and finally she was excused the reporters yawned the jury twitched nervously worthington vaughan was dead he had been strangled so much was clear but not a scintilla of evidence had as yet been introduced as to who had strangled him then a movement of interest ran through the crowd for a policeman came from the direction of the house accompanied by two strange figures one was the yogi in robes of dazzling white the other was his attendant wearing something more than a diaper indeed but with his thin brown legs bare the yogi bowed to goldberger with grave courtesy and at a word from the attendant policeman sat down in the witness chair everybody was leaning forward looking at him and the cameras were clicking in chorus but he seemed scarcely aware of the circle of eager faces hold up your right hand please began goldberger after contemplating for a moment for what purpose asked the yogi i'm going to swear you i do not understand i'm going to put you on oath to tell nothing but the truth explained the coroner an oath is unnecessary said the yogi with a smile to speak the truth is required by my religion there was something impressive in the words and goldberger slowly lowered his arm what is your name he asked francisco silva you are not a hindu i am of their faith but by birth i am a portuguese born in india born at goa the coroner paused he had never heard of goa neither had i neither i judged had any one else present in this however i was wrong godfrey had heard of it and afterwards referred me to marryat's phantom ship as his source of information goa silva explained seeing our perplexity is a colony owned by portugal on the malabar coast some distance below bombay how does it come that you speak english so well i was educated at bombay and afterwards at oxford and at paris but are you by religion a hindu i am a saiva a follower of siva the lord of life and death as he spoke he touched his forehead with the fingers of his left hand there was a moment's silence goldberger's moustache i noted with a smile was beginning to suffer again you are what is called an adept he asked at last some may call me that said silva but incorrectly among my fellow saivas i am known as a white priest a yogi a teacher of the law mr vaughan was your pupil yes for six months he was my pupil in what way did you come to accept this position two years ago mr vaughan visited the monastery of our order in crete he was at that time nearly a student of orientalism and came to us from curiosity but his interest grew and after a year spent in studying the holy books he asked that a teacher be sent to him there was none at that time who could be spared but six months ago having completed a task which occupied me in paris i was assigned to this do you always go to so much trouble to secure converts questioned goldberger a little cynically usually we require that the period of study be passed at one of our monasteries but this case was exceptional in what way it was our hope explained the yogi calmly that mr vaughan would assist us in spreading the great truth by endowing a monastery for us in this country ah said goldberger looking at him did he agree to do so he did answered the yogi still more calmly this estate was to have been given to us for that purpose together with an endowment sufficient to maintain it mr vaughan himself hoped to gain the white robe and become a teacher what was to become of his daughter it was his hope that she would become a priestess of our order 
you hoped so too no doubt inquired goldberger sweetly i did it is an office of high honour and great influence she would walk all her days in the shadow of the holy one so sweet a cup is offered to few women the number of priestesses is limited to nine goldberger pulled at his moustache helplessly evidently the witness's calm self-control was not to be broken down or even ruffled please tell me where you were night before last said the coroner finally i was in this house did you see mr vaughan i did not how did you spend the night in contemplation it was as i have told you the white night of siva sacred to him from sunset to sunrise do you mean that you spent the whole night sitting before that crystal asked the coroner incredulously that is my meaning you know nothing then of the death of mr vaughan i saw his soul pass in the night more than that i know not again goldberger twitched at his moustache he was plainly at a loss how to proceed was your attendant with you he asked at last he was in his closet at his devotions too perhaps the white knight of siva is also the black knight of kali said the yogi gravely as one rebuking an unworthy levity what do you mean by that goldberger demanded mabu is of the cult of kali who is the wife of siva said the yogi touching his forehead reverently as he spoke the words he spent the night in adoration of her attributes goldberger's stenographer was having his difficulties the pencils of the reporters were racing wildly in unison everyone was listening with strained attention there was somehow a feeling in the air that something was about to happen i saw godfrey write a line upon a sheet of paper fold it and toss it on the table in front of goldberger the coroner opened it read the line and stared at the impassive mahbub who stood beside his master with folded arms staring over the heads of the crowd in other words said goldberger slowly your attendant is a thug the yogi bowed yes he said calmly mahbub is a thuggy end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen the fingerprints a shiver ran through the crowd like a gust of wind across a field of wheat the words mahbub is thuggy seemed to rend the veil which obscured the tragedy surely it was clear enough now here was a man killed by a thuggy's peculiar method and here was the thug it was as simple as two and two every eye was on the bare-legged hindu impassive as ever staring straight before him the cameramen hastily pushed in fresh plates and trained their machines upon him two policemen edged close to his side but francisco silva looked ahead about him with scornful eyes and presently he opened his lips as though to speak and then he closed them goldberger seemed perplexed he looked as though while rolling smoothly along the road toward a well understood goal he had suddenly struck an unforeseen obstacle the possibility of mahbub's guilt seemed to interfere with some theory of his own he called simmons and the district attorney to him and they exchanged a few low words then they turned back to the witness i should like to question your attendant he said will you translate for me i have not been able to find a hindu interpreter silva bowed his consent ask him please where he spent thursday night there was a brief interchange between silva and mahbub then the former turned to goldberger it was as i thought he said he spent the night in the worship of the attributes of kali the coroner opened an envelope which lay on the table at his elbow and took out a piece of knotted cord ask him if he ever saw this before he said and passed it to the witness i notice that it is stained said silva looking at it is it with blood yes and mahbub will not touch it for him to do so would be to defile himself he doesn't need to touch it show it to him silva spoke to his servant holding up the cord the latter glanced at it and shook his head without a word silva handed the cord back to the coroner are there any further questions he asked goldberger pulled at his moustache impatiently there are a lot of questions i'd like to ask he said but i feel a good deal as though i were questioning the sphinx isn't it a little queer that a thug should be so particular about a few blood stains 
i fear that you are doing mahboob an injustice in your thoughts silva said gravely you have heard certain tales of the thugs perhaps tales distorted and magnified and untrue in the old days as worshippers of kali they did sometimes offer her a human sacrifice but that was long ago to say a man is a thug is not to say he is also a murderer it will take more than that to convict him anyway assented goldberger quickly that is all for the present professor i bit back a smile at the title which came so unconsciously from goldberger's lips silva bowed and walked slowly away toward the house mahboob following close behind at a look from simmons two of his men strolled after the strange couple goldberger stared musingly after them for a moment then shook his head impatiently and turned back to the business in hand will mr swain please take the stand he said and swain took the chair now mr swain goldberger began after swearing him please tell us in your own way of what part you had in the incidents of thursday night swain told his story much as he had told it to godfrey and me and i noticed how closely both goldberger and the district attorney followed it when he had finished goldberger asked the same question that godfrey had asked while you were having the altercation with mr vaughan did you grasp hold of him no sir i did not touch him you are quite sure yes sir you didn't touch him at any time then or afterwards no sir i didn't see him afterwards what were your feelings when he took his daughter away i was profoundly grieved and angry yes i suppose i was angry he was most unjust to me he had used very violent language to you had he not yes he had threatened your life if you tried to see his daughter again yes now mr swain as you stood there angry and humiliated didn't you make up your mind to follow him to the house and have it out with him swain smiled i'm lawyer enough to know he said that a question like that isn't permissible but i'll answer it i may have had such an impulse i don't know but the sight of the cobra there in the arbor put it effectually out of my head you still think there was a cobra i am sure of it and you ran out of the arbor so fast you bumped your head i suppose that's what's happened it's mighty sore anyway and swain put his hand to it ruefully mr swain went on the coroner slowly are you prepared to swear that after you hurt your head you might not in a confused and half-dazed condition have followed your previous impulse to go to the house and see mr vaughan yes answered swain emphatically i am although i was somewhat dazed i have a distinct recollection of going straight to the wall and climbing back over it you cut your wrist as you were crossing the wall the first time yes and swain held up his hand and showed the strip of plaster across the wound your right wrist yes it bled freely did it not very freely what became of the clothes you took off when you changed into those brought by mr godfrey i don't know mr lester told me they were left here i intended to inquire for them at a sign from goldberger simmons opened a suitcase and placed a bundle on the table goldberger unrolled it and handed it to swain are these the clothes he asked yes said swain after a moment's examination will you hold the shirt up so the jury can see it swain held the garment up and everybody's eyes were fixed upon the blood-soaked sleeve there seems to have been a good deal of blood remarked goldberger it must have run down over your hand it did it was all over my fingers so that it would probably stain anything you touched yes very probably did you think of that when you were in the arbor with miss vaughan swain's face suddenly crimsoned and he hung his head i'm afraid not he said how was she dressed in a white robe of some silk-like material a robe that would show a blood-stain undoubtedly goldberger paused for an instant and then produced a pad such as one uses for inking rubber stamps opened it and placed it on the table before him have you any objection to giving me a set of your fingerprints he asked none whatsoever and swain stepped toward the table and placed the tips of his fingers on the pad then he pressed each one carefully upon the pad of paper which the coroner placed before him goldberger watched him curiously until all ten impressions had been made you did that as though you had done it before he remarked 
i made a set once for mr vaughan said swain sitting down again he had a most interesting collection goldberger passed the prints over to the head of the bureau of identification then he turned back to the witness mr swain he said have you ever seen this cord before and he handed him the knotted cord swain took it and examined it curiously without hesitation or repugnance no he said finally i never saw it before do you know what it is and goldberger watched him closely i infer that it is the cord with which mr vaughan was strangled that is so you did not see it around his neck i have no recollection of having done so please look at the cord again mr swain said goldberger still watching him you will see that it is knotted can you describe those knots for me swain looked at the knots and i was glad to see that his hands were absolutely steady and his face free from fear no murderer could handle so unconcernedly the instrument of his crime surely the jury would see that the knots said swain at last seem to be an ordinary square knot with which the cord was made into a noose and then a double bowline to secure it a double bowline can you tie such a knot certainly any one who has ever owned a boat can do so it is the best knot for this purpose the coroner reached out for the cord and replaced it in the envelope then he produced the handkerchief can you identify this he asked and handed it to the witness swain changed color a little as he took it i cannot identify it he said in a low voice but i will say this when miss vaughan found that my wrist was bleeding she insisted upon tying her handkerchief around it this may be the handkerchief again a little shiver ran through the crowd and goldberger's eyes were gleaming you notice that two corners of the handkerchief are free from stain he said and are crumpled as though they had been tied in a knot the handkerchief miss vaughan used would probably be in that condition would it not yes swain answered his voice still low you heard dr hinman testify that he found the handkerchief beside the chair in which mr vaughan was murdered yes can you explain its presence there i cannot unless it dropped from my wrist when i stooped to raise miss vaughan goldberger looked at the witness for a moment then he glanced at sylvester who nodded almost imperceptibly that is all for the present mr swain the coroner said and swain sat down again beside me very pale but holding himself well in hand then simmons took the stand his story developed nothing new but he told of the finding of the body and of its appearance and manner of death in a way which brought back the scene to me very vividly i suspected that he made his story deliberately impressive in order to efface the good impression made by the previous witness finally the coroner dipped once more into the suitcase brought out another bundle and unrolled it it proved to be a white robe with red stains about the top he handed it to simmons can you identify this he asked yes said simmons it is the garment worn by mr vaughan at the time of his murder how do you identify it by my initials in indelible ink on the right sleeve where i placed them there are stains on the collar of the robe what are they blood stains human blood yes sir how do you know i have had them tested did any blood come from the corpse no sir the skin of the neck was not broken where then in your opinion did this blood come from from the murderer answered simmons quietly there was a sudden gasp from the reporters as they saw whether this testimony was tending i glanced at swain he was a little paler but was smiling confidently goldberger his face hawk-like stooped again to the suitcase produced a third bundle and unrolling it disclosed another robe also of white silk this too he handed to simmons can you identify that he asked yes said simmons it is the robe worn by miss vaughan on the night of the tragedy my initials are on the left sleeve that also has blood marks on it i believe yes sir and indeed we could all perceive the marks human blood yes sir i had it tested too that is all said goldberger quickly and placed on the stand the head of the identification bureau mr sylvester he began you have examined the marks on these garments yes sir what did you make of them they are all unquestionably finger marks but most of them are mere smudges however the fabric of which these robes are made is a very hard and finely meshed silk with an unusually smooth surface 
and i succeeded in discovering a few marks on which the lines were sufficiently distinct for purposes of identification these i have photographed the lines are much plainer in the photographs than on the cloth have you the photographs with you i have and sylvester produced them from a pocket these are the prints on the robe belonging to the murdered man he added passing four cards to the coroner you will notice that two of them show the right thumb though one is not very distinct another shows the right forefinger and the fourth the right middle finger you consider these plain enough for purposes of identification undoubtedly any one of them would be enough goldberger passed the photographs to the foreman of the jury who looked at them vacantly and the other photographs he asked i only got two prints from the other robe said sylvester all but these were hopelessly smudged as though the hand had moved while touching the garment you mean they were all made by one hand said goldberger yes sir by the right hand again i have a print of the thumb and one of the third finger he passed the photographs over and again goldberger handed them on to the jury mr sylvester said the coroner you consider the fingerprint method of identification a positive one do you not absolutely so even with a single finger perhaps with a single finger there may be some doubt if there is no other evidence somebody has computed that the chance of two prints being exactly the same is one in sixty-four millions and where there is other evidence i should say that a single finger was enough suppose you have two fingers then it is absolutely certain and three fingers sylvester shrugged his shoulders to indicate that proof could go no further goldberger took back the photographs from the foreman of the jury and ranged them before him on the table now mr sylvester he said did you notice any correspondence between these prints yes answered the witness in a low voice the thumb prints on both robes were made by the same hand the audience sat spellbound staring scarcely breathing i dared not glance at swain i could not take my eyes from that pale-faced man on the witness stand who knew that with every word he was riveting an awful crime to a living fellow-being one question more said goldberger have you any way of telling by whom these prints were made yes said sylvester again and his voice was so low i could scarcely hear it they were made by frederick swain the prints he made just now correspond with them in every detail end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen the chain titans an instant silence followed sylvester's words and then a little murmur of interest and excitement as the reporters bent closer above their work i heard a quick deep intaking of the breath from the man who sat beside me and then i was on my feet your honor i said to goldberger it seems that an effort is to be made to incriminate mr swain in this affair and he should therefore be represented by counsel i myself intend to represent him and i ask for an hour's adjournment in order to consult with my client goldberger glanced at his watch i intended to adjourn for lunch he said as soon as i had finished with mr sylvester we will adjourn now if you wish until one thirty he added the battery of cameras was clicking at swain and two or three artists were making sketches of his head there was a great bustle as the reporters gathered up their papers and hurried to their cars to search for the nearest telephone the jury walked heavily away in charge of an officer to get their lunch at some nearby roadhouse sylvester was gathering up his prints and photographs and putting them carefully in his pocket simmons was replacing the blood-stained clothing in the suitcase to be held as evidence for the trial but swain sat there with arms folded staring straight before him apparently unconscious of all this goldberger looked at him closely as he came down to speak to me but swain did not glance up i can parole him in your custody i suppose mr lester the coroner asked yes certainly i assented sylvester's evidence makes it look bad for him will you introduce me to sylvester i should like to go over the prints with him certainly and a moment later with the prints spread out before us sylvester was showing me their points of similarity godfrey came forward while he was talking and stood looking over his shoulder i had heard of fingerprint identification of course many times 
but had made no study of the subject, and, I confess, the blurred photographs which Sylvester offered for my inspection seemed to me mighty poor evidence upon which to accuse a man of murder. The photograph showed the prints considerably larger than life-size, but this enlargement had so exaggerated the threads of the cloth, so that the print seemed half concealed by a heavy mesh. To the naked eye the lines were almost indistinguishable, but under Sylvester's powerful glass they came out more clearly. "'The thumb,' said Sylvester, following the lines first to the right and then to the left with the point of a pencil, "'is what we call a double whirl. It consists of fourteen lines or ridges. With the micrometer,' and he raised the lid of a little leather box which stood on the table, took out an instrument of polished steel and applied it to one of the photographs. "'We get the angle of these ridges. See how I adjust it?' and I watched him, as with a delicate thumbscrew, he made the needle-like points of the finder coincide with the outside lines of the whirl. Now here is a photograph from the other robe, also showing the thumb, and he applied the machine carefully to it. It also is a double whirl of fourteen lines, and you see the angles are the same. And here is the print of the right thumb, which our client made for me. He applied the micrometer and drew back that I might see for myself. "'But these photographs are enlarged,' I objected. "'That makes no difference. Enlargement does not alter the angles. Here are the other prints.' He compared them one by one in the same manner. When he had finished, there was no escaping the conviction that they had been made by the same hand, that is, unless one denied the theory of fingerprint identification altogether, and that, I knew, would be absurd. As he finished his demonstration, Sylvester glanced over my shoulder with a little deprecating smile, as of a man apologizing for doing an unpleasant duty, and I turned to find Swain standing there, his face lined with perplexity. "'You heard?' I asked. "'Yes, and I believe Mr. Sylvester is right. I can't understand it.' "'Well,' I said, "'suppose we go and have some lunch, and then we can talk it over.' And thanking Sylvester for his courtesy, I led Swain away." Godfrey fell in to step beside us, and for some moments we walked on in silence. "'There is only one explanation that I can see,' said Godfrey at last. "'Swain, you remember, got to the library about a minute ahead of us, and when we reached the door he was lifting Miss Vaughan to the couch. In that minute he must have touched the dead man.' Swain shook his head doubtfully. "'I don't see why I should have done that,' he said. "'It isn't a question of why you did it,' Godfrey pointed out. It's a question of whether you did it. Go over the scene in your mind, recalling as many details as you can, and then we'll go over it together, step by step, after lunch. It was a silent meal, and when it was over, Godfrey led the way into his study. Now, he began, and we were seated, where was Miss Vaughan at the moment you sprang through the door? She was lying on the floor by the table in front of her father's chair, Swain replied. You are sure of that? Yes. I didn't see her until I ran around the table. I was hoping, said Godfrey, that she had fainted with her arms clasped about her father's neck, and that in freeing them you made those marks on his robe. But Swain shook his head. No, he said. I'm positive I didn't touch him. Then how did the marks get there? I don't know, said Swain helplessly. Now see here, Swain, said Godfrey a little sternly. There is only one way in which those fingerprints could have got on that garment, and that is from your fingers. If you didn't put them there, consciously, you must have done so unconsciously. If they aren't explained in some way, the jury will very probably hold you responsible for the crime. I understand that, Swain answered thickly. But how can they be explained? I don't see why I should put my hands on Mr. Vaughn's throat, even unconsciously. And then there's the fact that at no time during the evening was I really unconscious. I was only confused and dazed. Goldberger's theory is plain enough, said Godfrey, turning to me, and I must say that it's a good one. He realizes that there wasn't provocation enough to cause a man like Swain to commit murder with all his senses about him, but his presumption is that the crime was committed while Swain was in a dazed condition and not wholly self-controlled. Such a thing is possible. No, it isn't, cried Swain, his face livid. It isn't possible. I'm not a murderer. I remember everything else. Do you think I wouldn't remember a thing like that? I don't know what to think, Godfrey admitted, a straight line between his brows. Besides, there's the handkerchief. I don't see any mystery about that, said Swain. There's only one way that could have come there. It dropped from my wrist when I stooped over Miss Vaughan. 
Godfrey looked at me, and I nodded. Swain might as well know the worst. That would be an explanation, sure enough, said Godfrey slowly. But for one fact, you didn't have any bandage on your wrist when you came back over the wall. Both Lester and I saw your wrist and the cut on it distinctly. Therefore, if you dropped the handkerchief there, it must have been before that. The blood had run from Swain's cheeks, as though drained by an open artery, and for a moment he sat silent, staring at the speaker. Then he raised his trembling right hand and looked at it, as though it might bear some mark to tell him whether it were indeed guilty. "'But I don't understand,' he cried thickly. "'You—you you don't mean to intimate. You don't believe. But I wasn't unconscious, I tell you. I wasn't near the house until after we heard the screams. I'm sure of it. I'd stake my soul on it.' get a grip on yourself swain said godfrey soothingly don't let yourself go like that no i don't believe you killed worthington vaughan consciously or unconsciously i said goldberger's theory was a good one and it is but i don't believe it my belief is that the murder was done by the thug but there's nothing to support it except the fact that he was on the ground and that a noose was used there's not a bit of direct evidence to connect him with the crime and there's a lot of direct evidence to connect you with it it's up to us to explain it away now think carefully before you answer my questions have you any recollection however faint of having seen mahbub before this morning swain sat for quite a minute searching his consciousness then to my great disappointment he shook his head no he said i am sure i never saw him before nor silva no nor silva except of course the time three or four months ago when he gave me mr vaughan's message have you a distinct recollection that the library was empty when you sprang into it yes very distinct i remember looking about it and then running past the table and discovering miss vaughan you saw her father also yes but i merely glanced at him i realized that he was dead and you also have a distinct recollection that you did not approach him or touch him i am quite certain of that answered swain positively then i give it up said godfrey and lay back in his chair there was a queer boiling of ideas in my mind ideas difficult to clothe with words and composed of i know not what farrago of occultism mysticism and oriental magic but at last i managed to simmer them down to a timid question i know it sounds foolish but wouldn't it be possible godfrey to explain all this by hypnosis or occult influence or something of that sort godfrey turned and looked at me silva seems to have impressed you he said he has but isn't such an explanation possible i don't think so i don't deny that the orientals have gone farther along certain paths of psychology than we have but as to their possessing any occult power it is my opinion all bosh as for hypnosis the best authorities agree that no man can be hypnotized to do a thing which in his normal condition would be profoundly repugnant to him indeed few men can be hypnotized against their will to be hypnotized you have to yield yourself of course the more you yield yourself the weaker you grow but that doesn't apply to swain i shouldn't advise you to use that line of argument to a jury he added with a smile you'd better just leave the whole thing up in the air well i said i'll make the best fight i can i was hoping swain could help me since he can't we'll have to trust to luck godfrey left us to get his story of the morning hearing into shape and i fell into a gloomy reverie i could see no way out of the maze either swain had touched vaughan's body or it had been touched by another man with the same finger markings i sat suddenly upright for if there was such a man he must be one of two what is it swain asked looking at me a long shot i said an exceedingly long shot a three hundred million to one shot how many people are there in the world swain i'm sure i don't know and he stared at me in bewilderment i think it's something like a billion and a half if that is true then it's possible that there are four people in the world beside yourself with the thumb and two fingers of the right hand marked exactly as yours are we must have a reunion some day swain remarked with irony but i refused to be diverted allowing for imperceptible differences i went on i think it is safe to assume that there are ten such people well said swain bitterly i know one thing that it isn't safe to assume and that is that either of those hindus is one of those ten i suppose that is the assumption you will make next 
"'It is an assumption I intend to put to the proof, anyway,' I answered somewhat testily. "'And if it fails, I'm afraid you'll have to go to jail till I can dig up some more evidence.' He turned toward me quickly, his face working. "'See here, Mr. Lester,' he said. "'Don't misunderstand me. I am awfully grateful for all you're doing for me, but I don't mind going to jail, not on my own account. I'm innocent, and I'll be able to prove it in time. But Marjorie mustn't be left alone. I'd be ready to face anything if I knew that she was safe. She mustn't be left in that house, not a single night. Promise me that you'll take her with you as soon as the inquest's over.' "'I'll promise that, Swain, gladly,' I said, provided, of course, the doctor consents. "'We must get him.' and swain sprang to his feet we must explain to him how important it is perhaps i can get him on the phone i said but the person who answered told me that he had already started for the inquest and a moment later mrs hargis tapped at the door of the study and said that the doctor was outside i told her to show him in at once the truth is said hinman shaking hands with both of us i thought i'd drop in to find out if there was anything i could do no reasonable person he went on turning to swain believes you killed that defenceless old man but those fingerprints certainly do puzzle me they puzzle me too said swain but i'll prove my innocence though it will take time it looks to me said the doctor slowly that about the only way you can prove your innocence is to catch the real murderer that's exactly what we're going to try to do i assented and meanwhile mr swain will be in jail asked the doctor i'm afraid there's no help for it i admitted ruefully i was just telling mr lester that i didn't mind that said swain earnestly that i could stand anything if i was only sure that miss vaughan was safe she isn't safe in that house mr lester has arranged to place her with the family of his partner mr royce where she will be properly taken care of is there any reason why she can't be taken there to-day the doctor considered for a moment ordinarily he said at last I would advise that she be left where she is for a few days, but under the circumstances perhaps she would better be moved. You can get an easy riding carriage, or a car will do if you drive carefully. The nurses will, of course, go along. The only thing is, she will probably wish to attend her father's funeral, which takes place tomorrow. Swain bit his lips nervously. I have a horror of her staying in that house another night, he said, but I hadn't thought of the funeral. There is one nurse on duty all the time, isn't there, doctor? yes all right then we'll risk one more night but you promise me that she will be taken away immediately after the funeral yes i said i promise and i said the doctor then he looked at his watch it is time we're getting back he added he took us over in his car and we found the jury under the guidance of simmons just coming out of the house each member smoking a fat black cigar at the expense of the state they had been viewing the body and the scene of the crime but as they filed back into their seats i noted that they seemed anything but depressed the lunch had evidently been a good one sylvester was recalled to finish his testimony he explained the system of curves and angles by which fingerprints are grouped and classified and the various points of resemblance by which two prints could be proved to have been made by the same finger there was first of all the general convolution whether a flexure a stria a sinus a spiral a circle or a whirl there was secondly the number of ridges in the convolution and there was thirdly the angles which these ridges made if two prints agreed in all these details their identity was certain he then proceeded to show that the prints made that morning by swain did so agree with the photographs of prints on the garments finally the witness was turned over to me for cross-examination mr sylvester i began are you willing to assert that those fingerprints could have been made by no man in the world except mr swain sylvester hesitated just as i hoped he would do no he answered at last i can't assert that mr lester there may be three or four other men in the world with fingerprints like these but the probabilities against any of these men having made these prints are very great besides it is a thing easily proved the number of persons who might have committed the crime is limited and it is an easy thing to secure prints of their fingers that is what i was about to propose i agreed i should like the fingerprints taken of every one who was in the house thursday night do i understand that your case stands or falls upon this point asked the coroner your honour i answered my client cannot explain how the prints of his fingers if they are his came to be upon the robe the one thing he is certain of is that they were not placed there by him 
not once during the entire evening was my client near enough to mr vaughan to touch him not once did he so far lose consciousness as to be unable to remember what occurred we have racked our brains for an explanation and the only possible one seems to be that the prints of the real murderer resemble those of my client and when i say the real murderer i added i do not necessarily mean one of the persons whom we know to have been in the house outside of these fingerprints there has been absolutely no evidence introduced here to prove that the crime might not have been committed by some person unknown to us you can scarcely expect the jury to believe however goldberger pointed out that this supposititious person had fingertips like your clients no i agreed i make no such assertion my hope is that we shall soon have the prints of the real murderer and when i say the real murderer i added looking at the jury i believe every one present understands who i mean the coroner rapped sharply but i had said what i wished to say and sat down the witnesses of the morning were ordered to be brought out sylvester arranged his ink pad and sheets of paper it seems to me remarked the coroner with a smile that you and mr godfrey would better register too you were within striking distance that is right i agreed and was the first to register but sylvester after a glance at my prints shook his head your left thumb is a sinus he said you're cleared mr lester godfrey came forward and registered too and after him the three servants in each case a shake of sylvester's head told the result then simmons came from the house with silva and mahbub after him and the coroner explained to silva what was wanted i fancied that the yogi's brow contracted a little the registration of the fingers he said of the foot or of the palm is with us a religious ceremony not to be lightly performed by some it is also held that the touch of ink unless compounded by a priest of the temple according to a certain formula is defiling and above all it is impossible for a believer to permit such relics of himself to remain in the hands of an infidel the relics as you call them goldberger explained won't need to remain in our hands my expert here can tell in a minute whether your prints resemble those of his photographs if they do not they will be returned to you and if they do goldberger laughed well you can have them back anyway in that case i guess we can persuade you later on to make another set the yogi flushed angrily but controlled himself i rely upon your promise sir he said and laid his fingers first upon the pad and then upon the paper he stood with closed eyes and moving lips his inked fingers held carefully away from him during the breathless moment that sylvester bent above the prince then the expert looked up and shook his head no resemblance at all he said and held out the sheet of paper on which the prints were silva accepted it silently and rolled it into a ball in the palm of his hand now for the other fellow said goldberger silva glanced at his follower doubtfully i am not sure that i can make him understand he said and for some moments talked energetically to mahbub in a language which i suppose was hindu mahbub listened scowling fiercely speaking a brief sentence now and then he would know silva asked at last turning to the coroner whether blood is a constituent of that ink it is a purely chemical compound sylvester explained there is no blood in it nor any other animal matter this was repeated to mahbub and after some further hesitation he advanced to the table a moment later sylvester was bending above the prince then he looked up his face red with astonishment and motioned me to approach look at that he said and laid the prince before me my heart was leaping with hope that the incredible had happened that here lay the clue to the mystery but the first glance told me that such was not the case the prince resembled swain's not at all and then when i looked at them again i perceived that they resembled no other prints which i had ever seen for the prints of all ten fingers were exactly alike and consisted not of whorls and spirals but of straight lines running right across the finger sylvester was staring at them in bewilderment these he said when he could find his voice are the most remarkable prints i ever saw do they resemble those on the robe asked the coroner not in the least and that settles that point said goldberger with what seemed to me a sigh of relief there is one thing though said sylvester eyeing mahbub curiously i wish i knew the secret of these extraordinary prints 
i can tell it to you said silva with a little smile it is not at all extraordinary the system of fingerprint identification has been in use among the hindus for many centuries and was adopted by the english courts in india nearly a hundred years ago after every other method had failed the caste of thuggy which was at war with all other castes and especially at war with the english evaded it by stimulating on the fingers of their male children the formation of these artificial ridges it became a sacred rite performed by the priests and has been maintained by the more devout members of the caste although the need for it has ceased sylvester looked at the prince again i should like to keep these he said they would be a great addition to my collection silva bowed mahbub will have no objection he said to him they are of no importance since there are many hundreds of men in the world with finger-tips identical with his that is all goldberger nodded and the two strange figures walked slowly away toward the house end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen miss vaughan's story sylvester was still bending in ecstasy over those strange fingerprints the absorbed ecstasy of the collector who has come unexpectedly upon a specimen wonderful and precious well he said looking up at last i have learned something new to-day these prints shall have the place of honour they might not be a means of identification among the thugs but i'll wager there's no collection in america that has a set like them they're unique but not in the least like the photographs put in goldberger dryly no and sylvester flushed a little as he felt himself jerked from his hobby none of the prints we have taken this afternoon resemble the photographs in any way but those made by swain do resemble them it is more than a resemblance they are identical with them what inference do you draw from that it is more than an inference sylvester retorted it is a certainty i am willing to swear that the fingerprints on the robe worn by the murdered man were made by frederick swain you realize the serious nature of this assertion asked the coroner slowly i realize it fully and that realization does not cause you to modify it in any way it cannot be modified said sylvester firmly however serious it may be however reluctant i may be to make it it cannot be modified because it is the truth there was a moment's silence then goldberger turned to me have you any questions to ask the witness mr lester no i answered i have none sylvester bent again above his prints while the coroner and the prosecutor held a brief consultation then goldberger turned back to me have you anything further mr lester he asked our evidence is all in i believe i was driven to my last entrenchment i should like to call miss vaughan i said if dr hinman thinks she is strong enough swain's chair creaked as he swung toward me no no he whispered angrily don't do that spare her that but i waved him away for it was his honour and welfare i had to consider not miss vaughan's convenience and turned to dr hinman who was evidently struggling between two duties one was his duty to his patient the other his duty to a man cruelly threatened whom his patient's testimony might save well what do you say doctor asked the coroner miss vaughan is no doubt able to testify said the doctor slowly but i should like to spare her as much as possible couldn't her deposition be taken privately i think you mentioned something of the sort goldberger looked at me i shall be satisfied i said to question her in the presence of mr goldberger reserving the right to put her on the stand should i deem it necessary to do so very well agreed the doctor i will prepare her and he hurried away toward the house swain was gripping my arm savagely see here mr lester he said in my ear his voice shaking with anger i'm in deadly earnest about this take miss vaughan's deposition if you wish but under no circumstances shall she be hauled before this crowd in her present condition and compelled to testify why not i asked surprised at his vehemence because in the first place her testimony can't help me and in the second place i won't have her tortured she wouldn't be tortured look around at these reporters and these photographers and then tell me she wouldn't be tortured how do you know her evidence won't help you how can it 
it will confirm your story can it explain away the fingerprints at the words i suddenly realized that there was one person within striking distance of the murdered man whose prints we had not taken his daughter not that they were necessary dr hinman appeared at the edge of the lawn and beckoned as i arose from my chair swain gave my arm a last savage grip remember he said but i kept my lips closed if miss vaughan really loved him and could help him i would not need to urge her to the stand goldberger joined me and together we followed hinman into the house and up the stairs he opened the door at the stairhead waited for us to precede him followed us into the room and closed the door gently miss vaughan was half sitting half reclining in a large chair the blinds were drawn and the room in semi-darkness but even in that light i could see how changed she was from the girl of whom i had caught a glimpse two days before her face was dead white as though every drop of blood had been drained from it her eyes were heavy and puffed as from much weeping and it seemed to me that there still lingered in their depths a shadow of horror and shrinking fear this is mr goldberger said the doctor and this is mr lester she inclined her head up to each of us as we took the chairs the doctor drew up and i fancied that her cheeks flushed a little as her eyes met mine i have explained to miss vaughan the doctor continued that an inquiry is in progress as the law requires to determine the manner of her father's death and that her story of what happened that night is essential to it it will at least be a great help to us said goldberger gently and i saw how deeply the girl's delicate beauty appealed to him it was a beauty which no pallor could disguise and goldberger's temperament was an impressionable one i shall be glad to tell you all i know said miss vaughan but i fear it will not help you much will you tell us something first of your father's mental state i suggested for many years she began father had been a student of mysticism and until quite recently he remained merely a student i mean by that that he approached the subject with a detached mind and with no interest in it except a scientific interest i understand i said and that has changed recently it has changed completely in the last few months he became a disciple a convert anxious to win other converts a convert to what to hinduism to the worship of siva that is the cult to which francisco silva belongs yes he is a white priest of siva and this change in your father has been since the coming of this man yes do you know anything of him only that he is a very wonderful man you know nothing of his past no did your father wish you to become a convert yes he desired it deeply a priestess of siva i believe it is called yes and the yogi also desired it he believed it would be a great destiny but he urged it only for my father's sake so you determined to appeal to mr swain the colour deepened in her cheeks again i decided to ask his advice she said please tell us what happened that evening mr swain met me at the arbour in the corner of the grounds as i had asked him to and convinced me that my father's mind had given way under his long study of the occult we decided that he should be placed in a sanitarium where he could have proper attention and mr swain was to make the necessary arrangements all i would have to do would be to sign some papers we were just saying good night when my father appeared at the entrance of the arbour that was about midnight was it not yes why did you choose that hour for the meeting because at that hour my father and the yogi were always engaged in invoking an astral benediction even i who knew the significance of the words paused a little at them the doctor and goldberger were hopelessly at sea after all the words were a very good description of the weird ceremony well i said and after your father appeared what happened he was very excited and spoke to mr swain in a most violent manner mr swain attempted to take me away from him not knowing at first who it was had seized me but i pushed him back and led my father away toward the house did mr swain touch your father no i was between them all the time i was determined that they should not touch each other i was afraid if they came together that something terrible would happen goldberger glanced at me something terrible to your father he asked oh no she answered quickly mr swain would not have harmed my father but father did not know what he was doing and might have harmed mr swain it was my turn to look at goldberger after you left the arbour i asked 
did you see mr swain again no i did not see him again you went straight to the house yes father was still very violent he had forbidden me to see mr swain or to write to him he had taken a violent dislike to him do you know why yes and she flushed a little but went on bravely he believed that mr swain wished to marry me as in fact he did i commented yes or at least he did before his financial troubles came after that he wished to give me up but you refused to be given up yes she said and looked at me with eyes beautifully radiant i refused to be given up i felt that i was rushing in where angels would hesitate to enter and beat a hasty retreat was your father always opposed to your marriage i asked no he has wanted me to wait until i was of age but he never absolutely forbade it until a few months ago it was at the time he first tried to persuade me to become a convert to hinduism what occurred after you and your father reached the house father was very angry and demanded that i promise never to see mr swain again when i refused to promise he sent me to my room forbidding me to leave it without his permission i came up at once more than ever convinced that father needed medical attention i was very nervous and overwrought and i sat down by the window to control myself before going to bed and then suddenly i remembered something the yogi had told me that father was not strong and that a fit of anger might be very serious i knew the servants had gone to bed and that he must be downstairs alone since i had heard no one come up you had heard no one in the hall at all i asked no i had heard no one but i remember as i started down the stairs a curious feeling of dread seized me it was so strong that i stood for some moments on the top step before i could muster courage to go down at last i did go down and and found my father she stopped her hands over her eyes as though to shut away the remembrance of that dreadful night have you the strength to tell me just what happened miss vaughan i asked gently she controlled herself with an effort and took her hands from her face yes she said i can tell you i remember that i stood for a moment at the door looking about the room for at the first glance i thought there was no one there i thought for an instant that father had gone into the grounds for the curtain at the other door was trembling a little as though someone had just passed ah i said and looked at goldberger it might have been merely the breeze might it not he asked i suppose so the next instant i saw my father huddled forward in his chair i was sure he had had a seizure of some sort i ran to him and raised his head again she stopped her eyes covered and a slow shudder shook her from head to foot i could guess what a shock the sight of that horrible face had been i do not remember anything more she added in a whisper for a moment we all sat silent the only portion of her evidence which could in any way help swain was her discovery of the swaying curtain and even that as goldberger had pointed out might easily mean nothing miss vaughan i said at last how long a time elapsed from the moment you left your father in the library until you found him i don't know perhaps fifteen minutes was he dead when you found him yes i i think so then i said to goldberger the murder must have been committed very soon after miss vaughan came upstairs yes agreed goldberger in a low tone and by somebody who came in from the grounds since she met no one in the hall and heard no one miss vaughan leaned toward him her hands clasping and unclasping do you know who it was she gasped have you found out who it was we suspect who it was answered goldberger gravely tell me she began wait a minute miss vaughan i broke in tell me first did you hear anyone following you across the garden yes she answered thoughtfully once or twice i fancied that someone was following us it seemed to me i heard a step but when i looked back i saw no one did that fact make you uneasy no she said with a little smile i thought it was mr swain i saw goldberger's sudden movement i myself could not repress a little shudder you thought that would be the natural thing for mr swain to do did you not the coroner inquired yes i thought he might wish to see me safe then she stopped leaning forward in her chair and staring first at goldberger and then at me what is it she whispered her hands against her heart oh what is it you don't mean you can't mean oh tell me it isn't fred you suspect it can't be fred it was dr hinman who laid a gentle and quieting hand upon her shoulder and it was his grave voice which answered her yes 
he said there are some things which seem to implicate mr swain but both mr lester and i are certain he isn't guilty we're going to prove it she looked up at him with a grateful smile thank you she gasped i wait a moment i was silly to give away so of course you will prove it it's absurd and then she stopped and looked at goldberger do you believe it she demanded goldberger flushed a little under her gaze i don't know what to believe miss vaughan he said i am searching for the truth so are we all i said i am counsel for mr swain miss vaughan and i have come to you hoping that your story would help to clear him oh i wish it might she cried you know mr swain cut his wrist as he came over the wall that night yes he told me he didn't know it was bleeding at first then he felt the blood on his hand and i wrapped his wrist in my handkerchief was it this handkerchief asked goldberger and took from his pocket the blood-stained square and handed it to her she took it with a little shiver looked at it and passed it back to him yes she said that is it then she sat upright her clenched hands against her breast staring at us with starting eyes i remember now she gasped i remember now i saw it a blotch of red lying on the floor beside my father's chair how did it get there mr lester had he been there did he follow us she stopped again as she saw the look in goldberger's eyes and then the look in mine with a long indrawn breath of horror she cowered back into the chair shaking from head to foot oh what have i done she moaned what have i done there could be no question as to what she had done i told myself bitterly she had added another link to the chain of evidence about her lover i could see the same thought in the sardonic gaze which goldberger turned upon me but before either of us could say a word the doctor with a peremptory gesture had driven us from the room End of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen the verdict goldberger paused at the stairhead and looked at me an ironical light in his eyes i know he suspected that miss vaughan's story of the handkerchief was no great surprise to me well he asked will you wish to put her on the stand i shook my head and started down the stairs for i was far from desiring an argument just then but he stopped me with a hand upon the sleeve you realize mr lester he said more seriously that it is plainly my duty to cause swain's arrest yes i assented i realize that under the circumstances you can do nothing else he nodded and we went downstairs together i saw swain's eager eyes upon us as we came out upon the lawn and his lips were at my ear the instant i had taken my seat well he whispered she cannot help you i said i did not think it necessary to say how deeply she would hurt him when her testimony was called for in open court as of course it would be and you won't put her on the stand no i answered and he sank back with a sigh of relief then something in my face seemed to catch his eye for he leaned forward again you don't mean that she believes i did it he demanded hoarsely oh no i hastened to assure him she says such an accusation is absurd she was greatly overcome when she learned that you were even suspected she said but the coroner rapped for order have you any other evidence to introduce mr lester he asked no your honor i answered and i saw the cloud of disappointment which fell upon the faces of the reporters and photographers to have been able to feature miss vaughan would have meant an extra column i could also see from the expressions on the faces of the jury that my failure to put her on the stand made an unfavorable impression there was indeed only one inference to draw from it goldberger turned aside for a few words with the prosecutor and i suspected that he was telling him of miss vaughan's discovery of the blood-stained handkerchief but there was no way to get the story before the jury without calling her they seemed to agree at last that they had evidence enough for the jury was instructed to prepare its verdict its members withdrew a little distance under the trees and gathered into a group to talk it over i watched them for a moment and then i turned to swain i suppose you know i said that they're certain to find against you even if they don't the district attorney will cause your arrest right away he nodded i'm not worrying about that i'm worrying about miss vaughan you won't forget your promise no she'll have no one but you he went on rapidly neither will i you mustn't fail us i shan't i promised but you'd better think about yourself a little swain 
plenty of time for that when i'm sure that marjorie's safe the minute you tell me she's at the royce's i'll begin to think about myself i'm not afraid i didn't kill that man no jury would convict me i might have told him that convictions are founded on evidence and that the evidence in this case was certainly against him but i thought it better to hold my peace the more confident he was the less irksome he would find imprisonment so i sat silent until the members of the jury filed back into their places have you reached a verdict gentlemen the coroner asked after his clerk had polled them yes your honour the foreman answered what is the verdict the foreman held out a folded paper to the clerk who took it opened it and read we the jury in the inquest held this thirteenth day of june nineteen o eight into the death of one worthington vaughan residing in the borough of the bronx city of new york do find that the deceased came to his death by strangulation at the hands of one frederick swain there was an instant silence and then goldberger turned to the jury is this your verdict gentlemen he asked quietly and each juryman replied in the affirmative as his name was called i thank you for your services goldberger added directed his clerk to give them their vouchers on the city treasurer and dismissed them simmons and the assistant district attorney came toward us and i arose to meet them swain got up also and when i glanced at him i saw that he was smiling i don't know whether you have met mr blake mr lester said simmons and the prosecutor and i shook hands i introduced him to swain but swain did not offer his hand i suppose you've come to take me along he said the smile still on his lips i'm afraid we'll have to would bail be considered i asked i'm afraid not and blake shook his head it isn't a bailable offence i knew of course that he was right and that it was of no use to argue or protest swain turned to me and held out his hand then i'll say good-bye mr lester he said i hope to see you monday you shall i promised and with good news he added yes and with good news can we give you a lift blake asked no i said thank you but i'm staying out here for the present i watched them as they climbed into a car goldberger blake simmons and swain i saw the latter take one last look at the house then he waved to me as the car turned into the high road at least he was taking it bravely the coroner's assistants climbed into a second car and the four or five policemen into a third then the reporters and photographers piled into others the few stragglers who had straggled in straggled on again and in five minutes the place was deserted as i looked around i was surprised to see that even godfrey had departed there was something depressing about the jumble of chairs and tables the litter of paper on the grass something sordid as of a banquet hall deserted by the diners i turned away and started for the gate and then suddenly i wondered who was in charge of the house who would give orders to clear away this litter who would arrange for the funeral on the morrow how could miss vaughan do it ill as she was with quick resolution i turned back toward the house as i did so i was surprised to see a man appear at the edge of the lawn and run toward me it was hinman i was afraid i'd missed you he said miss vaughan wishes to see you she's all alone here and needs some help i'd thought of that i said i was just coming to offer it is she better yes much better i think she has realized the necessity of conquering her nerves of course we must still be careful i nodded and followed him into the house then i stopped in astonishment for miss vaughan was sitting in a chair in the library she arose as i entered came a step toward me and held out her hand you must not think too badly of me mr lester she said i won't give way again i promise you you have had a great deal to bear i protested taking her hand in mine i think you have been very brave i only hope that i can be of some service to you thank you i am sure you can let us all sit down for we must have quite a talk dr hinman tells me that i shall need a lawyer undoubtedly i assented your father's estate will have to be settled and that can only be done in the courts besides in the eyes of the law you are still a minor will you be my lawyer mr lester it will be a great privilege i answered then we will consider that settled yes i agreed we will consider that settled but it is not business i wish to discuss to-day she went on quickly there are other things more urgent first i wish to get acquainted with you have you not wondered mr lester why it was that i chose you to deliver my letter 
i suppose it was because there was no one else i answered looking at her in some astonishment for the way she was rattling on the colour was coming and going in her cheeks and her eyes were very bright i wondered if she had escaped brain fever after all no she said smiling audaciously it was because i liked your face i knew you could be trusted of course for a moment i was startled at seeing you looking down at me from a tree i wondered afterwards how you came to be there just idle curiosity i managed to stammer my face very hot i am sorry if i annoyed you oh but it was most fortunate she protested and a great coincidence too that you should be mr swain's employer and able to get hold of him at once it didn't do much good i said gloomily and it has ended in putting swain in jail i happened to glance at her hands folded in her lap and saw that they were fairly biting into each other in jail she whispered and now there was no colour in her face forgive me miss vaughan i said hastily that was brutal i forgot you didn't know tell me she panted tell me i can stand it oh you foolish man didn't you see i was trying to nerve myself i was trying to find out i caught the hands that were bruising themselves against each other and held them fast miss vaughan i said listen to me and believe that i am telling you the whole truth the coroner's jury returned a verdict that swain was guilty of your father's death as the result of that verdict he has been taken to the tombs but the last words he said to me before the officers took him away were that he was innocent and that he had no fear surely she assented eagerly he should have no fear but to think of him in prison it tears my heart don't think of it that way i protested he is bearing it bravely when i saw him last he was smiling but the stain the disgrace there will be none he shall be freed without stain i will see to that but i cannot understand she said how the officers of the law could blunder so all of the evidence against him i said was purely circumstantial except in one particular he was in the grounds at the time the murder was committed your father had quarrelled with him and it was possible that he had followed you and your father to the house perhaps not knowing clearly what he was doing and that another quarrel had occurred but that amounted to nothing young men like swain even when half unconscious don't murder old men by strangling them with a piece of curtain cord to suppose that swain did so would be absurd but for one thing no for two things what are they she demanded one is that the handkerchief which you had tied about his wrist was found beside your father's chair but it was not upon that the jury made its finding what was it then it was this swain swore positively that at no time during the evening he had touched your father yes yes and that was true he could not have touched him and yet i went on slowly prints of swain's blood-stained fingers were found on your father's robe but she gasped pulling her hands away from me and wringing them together how could that be that is impossible i should think so too i agreed if i had not seen the prints with my own eyes you are sure they were his you are sure i am afraid there can be no doubt of it and i told her how sylvester had proved it she listened motionless mute scarce breathing searching my face with distended eyes then suddenly her face changed she rose from her chair flew across the room opened a bookcase and pulled out a bulky volume bound in vellum she turned the pages rapidly giving each of them only a glance suddenly she stopped and stared at a page her face livid what is it i asked and hastened to her it is the book of fingerprints she gasped a great many oh a great many my father had collected and studied them for years he believed i do not know what he believed she paused struggling for breath well i said what then mr swain's was among them she went on in the merest whisper they were here page two hundred and thirty see there is an index swain f page two hundred and thirty she pointed at the entry with a shaking finger well i said again striving to understand what of it look she whispered holding the book toward me that page is no longer there it has been torn out then with a convulsive shudder she closed the book thrust it back into its place and ran noiselessly to the door leading to the hall she swept back the curtain and looked out oh is it you annie she said and i saw the irish maid standing just outside i was about to call you please tell henry to bring those tables and chairs in from the lawn yes ma'am said the girl and turned away 
Miss Vaughan stood looking after her for a moment, then dropped the curtain and turned back again into the room. I saw she had mastered her emotion, but her face was still dead white. As for me, my brain was whirling. What if Swain's fingerprints were missing from the book? What connection could that have with the blood stains on the robe? What was the meaning of Miss Vaughan's emotion? Who was it she had expected to find listening at the door? I could only stare at her, and she smiled slightly as she saw my look. "'What is it you suspect?' I stammered. "'I don't see.' "'Neither do I,' she broke in. "'But I am trying to see. I am trying to see.' And she wrung her hands together. "'The disappearance of the prince seems plain enough to me,' said Hinman, coming forward. "'Mr. Vaughan no doubt tore them out himself when he took his violent dislike to Swain. The act could be characteristic of a certain form of mania. Nobody else could have any motive for destroying them. In fact, no one else would dare mutilate a book he prized so highly.' Miss Vaughan seemed to breathe more freely, but her intent inward look did not relax. "'At least it is an explanation,' I agreed. "'It is the true explanation,' said Hinman confidently. "'Can you suggest any other, Miss Vaughan?' "'No,' she said slowly. "'No,' and walked once or twice up and down the room. Then she seemed to put the subject away from her. "'At any rate, it is of no importance. I wish to speak to you about my father's funeral, Dr. Hinman,' she went on in another tone. It is to be to-morrow? Yes, at eleven o'clock. I have made such arrangements as I could without consulting you, but there are some things you will have to tell me. What are they? Do you desire a minister? No, he would not have wished it. If there was any priest, it will be his own. You mean the yogi? Yes. Are there any relatives to inform? No. Where shall the body be buried? It must not be buried. It must be given to the flames. That was his wish. "'Very well. I will arrange for cremation. Will you wish to accompany it?' "'No, no!' she cried, with a gesture of repugnance. "'That is all, then, I believe,' said Hinman slowly. "'And now I must be going. I beg you not to overtax yourself.' "'I shall not,' she promised, and he bowed and left us. The afternoon was fading into evening, and the shadows were deepening in the room. I glanced about me with a little feeling of apprehension. "'The nurses are still here, are they not?' I asked. "'Yes, but I shall dismiss them to-morrow.' I hesitated a moment, but did not wish to alarm her, and yet— "'After they are gone, it will be rather lonesome for you here,' I ventured. "'I am used to being lonesome.' "'My partner's wife, Mrs. Royce, would be very glad if you would come to her,' I said. "'I have a letter from her,' and I gave it to her. She stood considering it with a little pucker of perplexity between her brows. She did not attempt to open it. "'She is very kind,' she murmured, and her tone surprised and disappointed me. "'May I see you to-morrow?' "'If you wish.' "'I shall come some time during the afternoon,' I said, and took up my hat. "'There is nothing else I can do for you?' "'No, I believe not.' She was plainly preoccupied, and answered almost at random, with a coldness in sharp contrast to the warmth of her previous manner. "'Then I will say good-bye.' "'Good-bye, Mr. Lester, and thank you.' She went with me to the door, and stood for a moment looking after me. Then she turned back into the house, and I went down the avenue with a chill in my heart. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 Building a Theory I was surprised when I came down for dinner an hour later to find Godfrey awaiting me. "'I always try to make it Saturday night,' he explained. The chief throws the work on the other fellows, if he can. That's the reason I hustled away after the inquest. The story's all in, and now we'll have a good dinner, if I do say it myself, and then a good talk. I feel the need of a talk, Lester. So do I, I said, though I'm afraid talking won't help us much. The funny thing about this case is, mused Godfrey, that the farther we get into it, the thicker it grows. Yes, I agreed and the more one thinks about it, the less one understands. "'Well, suppose we get away from it for a while,' said Godfrey, and turned the talk to other things. No man could talk more delightfully of music, of art, of letters. How he managed it I could never guess, but he seemed to have read everything, to have seen everything, to have heard everything. Marriott, for instance. Who reads Marriott nowadays? And yet he had read The Phantom Ship, and so knew something of Goa. An hour passed very quickly, but at last he rose and led the way into his study. 
a friend of mine dropped in to see me to-day at the office he remarked a cuban planter who comes up to new york occasionally and whom i happened to help out of a rather serious difficulty a few years ago perhaps some day i'll tell you about it he always brings me a bundle of his own special cigars i didn't see him to-day but he left the cigars and i want you to try one perhaps it will give you an inspiration he went to his desk opened a tin-foiled package that lay there and carefully extracted two long cigars of a rich and glowing brown perhaps you've heard of the special cigars that are made for pierpont morgan he went on as he handed one to me after carefully replacing the wrappings of the bundle well i smoked one of morgan's cigars once it was good mighty good but it wasn't in the same class with these light up i did never before had i drawn between my lips a breath so satisfying so rich so smooth so full of flavour i exhaled the fragrant smoke slowly godfrey i said i never knew what tobacco was before are these cigars purchasable i'm only a poor lawyer but even one a month would be a thing to look forward to and dream about but godfrey shook his head i've felt like that he said but they're not to be had for money and now about swain let's postpone it a little longer i begged i don't want my mind distracted godfrey laughed but fell silent and for the next half hour no sound was heard now i said at last i'm ready to listen so fire ahead whatever you want to i haven't much to tell he began nothing new about the case but i stopped at the tombs before i started back to make sure that swain had everything he wanted they'd given him an upper cell and sent over to the marathon and got him his things and i arranged to have his meals sent in to him from moquin's i ought to have thought of that i said contritely i'm much obliged to you godfrey did you see him only for a minute he seemed fairly cheerful he'd had them bring some of his law books to him and remarked that he'd have plenty of time to study i like the way he's taking it he gave me a message for you what was it that you are not to forget your promise i smoked on for a few moments in silence i promised him i'd get miss vaughan away from that house i said at last i had mrs royce write her a note inviting her to stay with her i gave it to her this afternoon what did she say she didn't say anything but i could see the idea didn't impress her and i had thought all along that she would jump at it godfrey gave a little grunt whether of surprise or satisfaction i could not tell why didn't you put her on the stand to-day lester he asked afraid of upsetting her i wouldn't have stopped for that if her evidence would have helped swain but it would only have put him deeper in the hole in what way well in the first place she says that as she and her father returned to the house she heard footsteps behind them and thought it was swain following them because that would be a natural thing for him to do and in the second place she saw that blood-stained handkerchief on the floor beside her father's chair when she came to the room and found him dead so said godfrey slowly it couldn't have been dropped there by swain when he stooped to pick her up no besides we know perfectly well that it wasn't about his wrist when he came back over the wall goldberger knows it too and will be asked about it next time it might have been pushed up his sleeve we weren't absolutely certain but this new evidence settles it i assented miserably and godfrey smoked on thoughtfully but my cigar had lost some of its flavour how did miss vaughan come to find the body he asked at last and i told him the story as she had told it to me he thought it over for some moments then he leaned forward and laid his hand on my knee now lester he said let's review this thing it can't be as dark as it seems there's light somewhere here is the case bared of all inessentials swain crosses the wall about eleven o'clock cutting his wrist as he does so miss vaughan meets him about eleven thirty and after a time finds that his wrist is bleeding and ties her handkerchief about it they agree to have her father examined for lunacy arrange a meeting for the next night and are about to separate when her father rushes in upon them savagely berates swain and takes his daughter away that must have been about twelve o'clock swain according to his story sits there for ten or fifteen minutes finally sees the cobra or thinks he does and makes a dash for safety striking his head sharply against a tree he tumbles over the wall in a half-dazed condition the handkerchief is no longer about his wrist 
that you will remember was about twelve twenty almost at once we heard miss vaughan's screams after that swain isn't out of our sight for more than a minute too short a time anyway for anything to have happened we don't know about meanwhile miss vaughan has returned with her father to the house hearing steps behind her and taking it for granted that it is swain following at a distance she goes to her room stays there fifteen minutes or so and comes downstairs again to find her father dead now let us see what had happened you were right in saying that her father must have been strangled immediately after she left him otherwise he would still have been twitching in such a way that she must have noticed it no doubt he dropped into the chair exhausted by his fit of rage the murderer entered through the garden door stopped to cut off the end of the curtain cord and made a noose of it that would have taken at least a minute and then strangled his victim then he heard her coming down the stairs and escaped through the garden door again just as she entered at the other she saw the curtain still shaking then she fainted now what are the clues to the murderer a string tied with a peculiar knot the blood-stained handkerchief and the fingerprints on the dead man's robe godfrey paused for a moment freed of its inessentials in this way the case was beautifully clear and beautifully baffling it was a paved way smooth and wide and without obstruction of any kind but it ended in a cul-de-sac one thing is certain godfrey went on at last the murder was committed by somebody either by swain or by one of the hindus or by some unknown let us weigh the evidence for and against each of them against swain it may be urged that he was on the ground that he had time to do it and some provocation though the provocation as we know it seems to be inadequate provided swain was in his right mind a handkerchief which was tied about his wrist is found beside the body and his fingerprints are found upon it miss vaughan believed he was following them he admits that he thought of doing so in his favor it may be urged that a man like swain doesn't commit murder though as a matter of fact this is a dangerous generalization for all sorts of men commit murder but if he should do so it would be only under great provocation and in the heat of anger certainly not in cold blood with a noose and finally if the motion of the curtain miss vaughan noticed was made by the murderer it couldn't possibly have been swain because he was with us at that moment you will see that there is a mass of evidence against him and practically the whole defence is that such a crime would be impossible to one of his temperament you know yourself how flimsy such a defence is against the hindus on the other hand practically the only basis for suspicion is that such a crime might be temperamentally possible to them they may have been on the ground and the method of the murder savours strongly of the thuggy though don't forget that swain admitted he could have tied that knot besides if it was the thug who followed them he wouldn't have made any noise and most certainly he couldn't have left the prints of swain's fingers on the body but if swain is right in his assertion that he saw the snake in the arbor it is probable that the thug wasn't far away against an unknown it may be urged that neither swain nor the hindus could have committed the crime but i don't see how an unknown could either unless he happened to be one of the three or four people in the world with fingerprints like swain's and that is too far-fetched to be believable but this i am sure of lester and godfrey leaned forward again the murder was committed either by swain or by someone anxious to implicate swain we agreed that it wasn't swain very well then the person who committed the murder made a noise in following miss vaughan and her father so that she should think it was swain who was following them he picked up the blood-stained handkerchief which swain had dropped perhaps when he fled from the arbor and placed it beside the body and in some way inconceivable to me he pressed the prints of swain's fingers on the dead man's robe now to do that he must have known that swain was injured the blood-stained handkerchief would tell him that but he must also have known that it was his right hand that was injured there was no blood on swain's left hand again godfrey paused i was following his reasoning with such absorbed attention that i could feel my brain crinkle with the effort now listen said godfrey and i could have smiled at the uselessness of the admonition as if i were not already listening with all my faculties there is only one way in which the murderer could have known that it was swain's right hand and that was by overhearing the conversation in the arbor but if he overheard that much he overheard it all and he knew therefore what it was swain proposed to do 
he knew that vaughan's sanity was to be questioned he knew that he would probably be placed in a sanitarium he knew that miss vaughan would probably marry swain presuming that it was silva he knew that unless something was done to stop it a very few days would place both vaughan and his daughter beyond his reach that is true i admitted but vaughan was beyond his reach a good deal more certainly dead than he would have been in a sanitarium besides it isn't at all certain that he would have been sent to a sanitarium that's an objection surely godfrey agreed but i must find out if vaughan is really beyond his reach dead i stared at him you don't mean i don't know what i mean lester i can feel a sort of dim meaning at the back of my mind but i can't get it out into the light besides i went on if the yogi did it how did he get back into the house before we got there he peeped in at the door saw the coast was clear and went back through the library remember miss vaughan was unconscious that doesn't bother me and another thing lester how did miss vaughan's father come to burst in on her and swain like that how did he know they were in the arbor it was dark and he couldn't have seen either of them he might have been walking about the grounds and overheard them i don't believe it i believe somebody told him they were there and only one person could have told him that is silva no there's only one point i can't get past that's the fingerprints and then i remembered godfrey i cried there's one thing i forgot to tell you you heard swain remark that vaughan was a collector of fingerprints yes and that he had a set of swains yes well when i told miss vaughan about the prints on her father's robe she ran to a bookcase and got out a book it had vaughan's collection in it all bound together but the page on which swain's were had been torn out godfrey sat for a moment staring at me spellbound and then he began pacing up and down the study like a tiger in its cage up and down up and down i'm bound to add i went on finally that hinman suggested a very plausible reason for their disappearance what was it he said they were probably destroyed by vaughan himself because of his dislike for swain he said that would be characteristic of vaughan's form of insanity godfrey took another turn up and down then he stopped in front of my chair what did miss vaughan think of that explanation he asked it didn't seem to impress her but i don't remember that she made any comment he stood a moment longer staring down at me and i could feel the intense concentration of his mind then he ran his fingers impatiently through his hair i can't get it lester he said i can't get it but i will get it it's there it's there just out of reach he shrugged his shoulders and glanced at his watch i'm getting dippy he added in another tone let's go out and get a breath of air i followed him out into the yard i knew where he was going among the trees and up the ladder silently we took our places on the limb silently we stared out into the darkness and there presently the strange star glowed and burned steel blue and floated slowly down and burst above a white-robed figure standing as though carved in marble its arms extended its head thrown back that fellow is certainly an artist godfrey muttered as he led the way back to the house End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 The Yogi Conquers The events of the day that followed, Sunday, I shall pass over as briefly as may be. It was for me a day of disappointment, culminating in despair, and, looking back at it, I remembered it as a grey day, windy, and with gusts of rain. Dr. Hinman stopped for us, and Godfrey and I accompanied him to the service over the body of the murdered man we were the only outsiders there besides the undertaker and his assistants and they were not admitted to the ceremony this was witnessed only by miss vaughan mahbub and us three the servants were not there and neither were miss vaughan's nurses i have never seen a more impressive figure than selva made that morning his robes were dead black and in contrast to them and to his hair and beard his face looked white as marble but after the first moments the ceremony failed to interest me for silva spoke a language which i supposed to be hindustani and there was a monotony about it and about his gestures which ended in getting on my nerves it lasted half an hour and the moment it was over miss vaughan slipped away the yogi and mahbub followed her and then we three stepped forward for a last look at the body it was robed all in white the undertaker had managed to compose the features and the high stock concealed the ugly marks of the neck so there was nothing to tell of the manner of his death and there was a certain majesty about him as he lay with hands crossed and eyes closed 
we left the room in silence and hinman signed to the undertaker that the service was ended i am going with the body to the crematory he said and presently drove away with the undertaker ahead of the hearse godfrey and i stood gazing after it until it passed from sight then in silence we walked down the drive to the entrance the gardener was standing there and regarded us with eyes which seemed to me distinctly unfriendly he made no sign of recognition and the moment we were outside he closed the gates and locked them carefully as though obeying precise instructions so said godfrey in a low tone as we went on together the lock has been repaired i wonder who ordered that done miss vaughan no doubt i answered she wouldn't want those gates gaping open perhaps not godfrey assented but would she want the barrier intact remember lester it's as much a barrier from one side as from the other well she won't be inside it much longer i assured him i'm going to get her out this afternoon the words were uttered with a confidence i was far from feeling and i rather expected godfrey to challenge it but he walked on without replying his head bent in thought and did not again speak of miss vaughan or her affairs he drove into the city shortly after lunch and it was about the middle of the afternoon when i presented myself again at the gates of elmhurst and rang the bell i waited five minutes and rang again finally the gardener came shuffling down the drive and asked me what i wanted i told him i had an appointment with his mistress but instead of admitting me he took my card and shuffled away with it i confess that i grew angry as i stood there kicking my heels at the roadside for he was gone a long time and all these precautions and delays were incomprehensible to me but he came back at last unlocked the gate without a word and motioned me to enter then he locked it again and led the way up the drive to the house the housemaid met us at the door of the library as though she had been stationed there if you will wait here sir she said miss vaughan will see you i hope she is well i ventured thinking the girl might furnish me with some clue to all this mystery but she was already at the door quite well sir she said and the next instant had disappeared after ten minutes elapsed and then just as i was thinking seriously of putting on my hat and leaving the house i heard a step coming down the stair a moment later miss vaughan stood on the threshold i had taken it for granted that relieved of her father's presence she would return to the clothing of every day but she still wore the flowing white semi-grecian garb in which i had first seen her I could not but admit that it added grace and beauty to her figure, as well as a certain impressiveness impossible to petticoats, and yet I felt a sense of disappointment. For her retention of the costume could only mean that her father's influence was still dominant. "'You wish to see me?' she asked, and again I was surprised, for I had supposed she would apologize for the delay to which I had been subjected. Instead she spoke almost as to a stranger." i had an appointment for this afternoon i reminded her striving to keep my vexation from my voice oh yes and she came a few steps into the room but her face lost none of its coldness i had forgotten it is not to speak of business no i said it is to speak of your going to friends of mr swain and me for a time at least you will thank your friends for me she answered calmly but i have decided to remain here but but i stammered taken aback at the finality of her tone do you think it wise yes far wiser than going to people i do not know and who do not know me and safe i persisted do you think it safe safe she echoed looking at me in astonishment certainly what have i to fear i had to confess that i myself did not know very clearly what she had to fear so i temporized are you keeping the nurses no i do not need them they left an hour ago but the servants i said in panic they are here they are going to stay again she looked at me your questions seem most extraordinary to me mr lester of course the servants will stay and the hindus i blurted out yes and the hindus as you call them this is their home it was my father's wish i gave it up her manner indicated that all this was no concern of mine and that my interference was a mere impertinence but i tried one parting shot mr swain is very anxious that you should not stay here i said he will be deeply grieved when he learns of your decision to this she made no answer and finding nothing more to say sore at heart and not a little angry and resentful i started to leave the room there is one thing more i said turning back at the threshold i shall have to go into the city to-morrow but i shall come out again in the evening would it be convenient to have our business conference after dinner 
yes she agreed that will do very well at eight o'clock then i shall expect you at that time she assented and with that i took my leave it was in a most depressed state of mind that i made my way back to godfrey's and i sat down on the porch and smoked a pipe of bitter meditation for i felt that somehow miss vaughan was slipping away from me that there had been a barrier between us to-day which had not been there before a barrier of coldness and reserve which i could not penetrate some hostile influence had been at work in death even more than in life perhaps her father's will weighed upon her i could imagine how a feeling of remorse might grow and deepen and urge her toward foolish and useless sacrifice and just then mrs hargis came out and told me that someone wanted me on the phone it was swain they let me come out here to the office to phone to you he said as he heard my exclamation of surprise simmons happened in and told them it would be all right he's here now and they're treating you all right they're treating me like the star boarder he laughed and then his voice grew suddenly serious have you seen miss vaughan yes i answered for i knew of course that the question was coming well miss vaughan refuses to go to royce's swain there was a moment's silence and where will she go she won't go anywhere you don't mean he cried panic in his voice that she's going to stay out there yes she laughed when i mentioned danger there's one consolation the servants will stay did you tell her how anxious i was for her yes i did my best swain and it made no difference no it made no difference the fact is swain i fancy she's a little remorseful about her father his death has unnerved her and there was the funeral to-day and as a sort of atonement she's trying to do what she imagines he would wish her to do he wished her to become a priestess said swain his voice ghastly oh well she won't go that far i assured him cheerfully and no doubt in a few days when the first impression of the tragedy has worn off she will be ready to go to the royces i'll keep suggesting it and i'm going to have mrs royce call on her thank you mr lester he said but his voice was still shaking i this sort of knocks me out i hadn't foreseen it i'll have to think it over but there's one thing you can do what is it watch the house he cried watch the house and be ready if she screams again all right i said soothingly i'll do that but tell me swain what is it you fear i fear silva said swain in a voice husky with emotion it isn't remorse for her father it's silva who's working on her i feel it some way i'm sure of it god knows what he'll try any villainy you must watch the house mr lester day and night you must watch the house all right i said again strangely impressed by his words you may count on me thank you he said remember we've only you good-bye swain's words gave me plenty to think over and left me so troubled and uneasy that i made a trip to the top of the ladder to take a look over elmhurst but everything appeared as usual perhaps swain was right perhaps it was silva who was using every minute to increase his influence but what could i do so long as he committed no overt act there was no excuse for interference and miss vaughan would undoubtedly resent it as swain had said there was nothing that i could do but watch two hours later just as i was getting up from a dinner to which in my perturbed condition i had done small justice i heard a ring at the bell and presently mrs hargis entered to tell me that there was a gentleman asking for me i went out to meet him and was astonished to find that it was simmons i don't wonder you're surprised he said as we sat down fact is i'm surprised myself for i don't know exactly what i'm to do out here but swain after he got back to his cell was like a crazy man he was sure something dreadful was going to happen to miss vaughan if she stayed in the house with those hindus in the end he got me kind of scared too and made me promise to come out and help you keep watch i went down to the record office and had a talk with godfrey before i started i half expected him to laugh at me but he seemed to think i'd better come the fact is concluded simmons shifting his cigar to the other side of his mouth he was so serious about it that i brought two men along one of them's patrolling the road in front of the house and the other the road along the side i've arranged for two others to relieve them at midnight now what's it all about anyway well i said in the first place neither godfrey nor i believes that swain strangled that man i can't hardly believe it myself agreed simmons for he seems a nice young feller but it's a clear case there's the motive he was on the ground and there's the fingerprints how can you explain them away i can't explain them away 
but just the same godfrey believes the murder was committed by one of those hindus he intimated something of the sort to me said simmons but there's no evidence against them no i conceded that's what we've got to find where are we going to look for it there's only one place to look for it and that's in the house where the murder was committed i only wish we could get miss vaughan out of it that would give us a freer hand what's the matter with the fool girl anyway demanded simmons i should think she'd jump at a chance to get away so should i but she isn't reasonable just now i can't make her out perhaps she'll come round in a day or two but meanwhile if she should happen to need help i don't see how your men out on the road on the other side of a twelve-foot wall could do any good simmons rubbed his chin thoughtfully what would you suggest he asked at last why not put them in the grounds as soon as it is dark and let them conceal themselves near the house they can get over the wall on this side we've got ladders besides i added it would be a great mistake to give silva any reason to suspect he's being watched he'd see the men out on the road sooner or later but they could keep out of sight among the shrubbery simmons considered this for a moment i don't know but what you're right he agreed at last we'll arrange it that way then and he went away presently to call in his men he soon came back with them and gave them careful and detailed instructions as to what he wanted them to do dwelling especially upon the importance of their keeping carefully concealed then we got the ladders and put them in place be careful not to touch the top of the wall i cautioned them there's broken glass on top and the merest touch may mean a bad injury when you get down on the other side simmons added take down the ladder and hide it in the shrubbery at the foot of the wall somebody might see it if you left it standing there but for heaven's sake don't get mixed up so you can't find it again be back here at eleven thirty and your relief will be ready you've got your whistles well blow them good and hard if there's any trouble and be mighty careful not to let anyone see you or you may get snake bit the men mounted the ladder crossed the wall and disappeared on the other side and simmons and i turned back to the house i felt as though a great load had been lifted from my shoulders with those two men so close at hand surely nothing very serious could happen to miss vaughan simmons and i spent the remainder of the evening in discussing the case but neither of us was able to shed any new light upon it shortly after eleven the two men who were to form the relief arrived and just as we started for the wall godfrey drove in from the highway it needed but a moment to tell him our arrangements which he heartily approved he joined us and we were soon at the foot of the ladder while we waited simmons gave the new men the same minute instructions he had given the others and presently we heard a slight scraping against the wall and the men who had been on duty recrossed it they had nothing of a special interest to report the yogi and miss vaughan had taken a stroll through the grounds early in the evening and my heart sank as the detective added that they seemed to be talking earnestly together then they had re-entered the house and miss vaughan had remained in the library looking at a book while her companion passed on out of sight at the end of an hour she had closed the book shut and locked the outer door and turned out the light another light had appeared shortly afterwards in a room upstairs it too had been extinguished half an hour later and the detectives presumed that she had gone to bed after that the house had remained in complete darkness the servants had spent the evening sitting on a porch at the rear of the house talking together but had gone in early presumably to bed when the men had finished their report simmons dismissed them and the two who were to take up the watch crossed the wall and passed from sight and now simmons said godfrey come along and i'll show you what started me to watching that house and caused me to get lester out here simmons followed him up the ladder without a word and i came along behind we were soon on the limb of course godfrey added when we were in place it is just possible that nothing will happen but i think the show will come off as usual look straight over the trees simmons ah high in the heavens that strange star sprang suddenly into being glowed brightened burned steel blue then slowly and slowly it floated down straight down hovered burst into a thousand sparks and scarcely able to believe my eyes i saw standing there against the night two white robed figures with arms extended and faces raised and then they vanished again into the darkness for an instant we sat there silent still staring then godfrey drew a deep breath i feared so he said miss vaughan has become a convert and he led the way down the ladder end of chapter nineteen chapter twenty checkmate 
i was honestly glad to get back to the office next morning for i felt the need of work absorbing work to take my mind off the problem of worthington vaughan's death and especially to relieve me from the depression into which his daughter's inexplicable conduct had plunged me when i thought of her it was with impatience and aversion for i felt that she had deserted to the enemy and turned her back upon the man who loved her in the hour of his utmost need as i saw it her conduct was little short of heartless she had summoned her lover to her side and he had come instantly and without hesitation without pausing to consider the danger to himself he had answered her call in consequence of that high devotion he was now in prison charged with a dreadful crime but instead of hastening to him instead of standing by his side and proclaiming to the whole world her belief in his innocence she deliberately stood aloof it was almost as if she herself believed in his guilt the world at least could draw no other inference but she had done more than that she had abandoned herself to the fate from which he had tried to save her her presence at silva's side could have only one meaning she had become his disciple had accepted his faith was ready to follow him the thought turned me sick at heart for her as well as for swain but for swain most of all for he had done nothing to merit such misfortune while she at least had chosen her road and was following it with open eyes small wonder that i thought of her with anger and resentment yes and with a vague distrust for at the very back of my mind was the suspicion that she had been a decoy to lure swain to his destruction i threw myself feverishly into the work which had accumulated at the office in order to tear my mind away from thoughts like these but when mr royce called i had to go over the case with him and i have seldom seen a man more puzzled or astonished i shall defend swain of course i concluded and i'm hoping that something in his favour will turn up before long but i haven't the remotest idea what it will be he can't be tried till fall and meanwhile i'm afraid he'll have to stay in jail yes i see no way of getting him out agreed my partner but the girl's danger is much more serious can't we do something for her it's difficult to do anything against her will i pointed out besides i've lost interest in her a little don't blame her too much we must do everything we can since she isn't of age she'll have to have a guardian appointed he might do something i had thought of that i'll suggest to her tonight that she let me arrange for a guardian but if we wait for a court to take action i'm afraid we'll be too late swain seems to think that the danger is very pressing at least we can make one more effort said royce i'll have my wife drive out to see her this afternoon perhaps she can do something and he went to the phone to make the arrangements i turned back to my work but found myself unable to take it up for my conscience told me that i ought to see swain make sure that he was comfortable and do what i could to relieve his anxiety it was not a pleasant task for i should have to admit my failure but at last i put my work aside made my way reluctantly to the tombs and asked to see him they had given him a well-lighted cell on the upper tier and some of his own things had been brought in to soften its bareness but my first glance at swain told me that he was in a bad way is she all right was his first question and his eyes seemed to burn into me yes i answered a little testily she's all right that is if you mean miss vaughan for heaven's sake swain be a little sensible what's the use of working yourself up into a state like this did you sleep any last night no said swain after thinking a minute no i believe not how about breakfast i don't seem to remember about breakfast he answered after another moment's thought i stepped to the door called the guard and putting a bill into his hand asked him to send up the prison barber and to have a good meal sent in in the course of half an hour when the barber arrived i had him take swain in hand give him a shave and shampoo and general freshening up then i saw that he got into clean things and then the breakfast arrived and i made him sit down and eat he obeyed passively and i could see the food did him good when he had finished his coffee i handed him a cigar now swain i began sitting down opposite him i'm going to talk to you seriously in the first place miss vaughan is in no danger simmons had two men in the grounds watching the house all last night ready to interfere at the least sign of anything wrong that watch will be kept up as long as miss vaughan remains there that's good he said i didn't know that but just the same she mustn't remain there even with the men on guard you may be too late 
just what is it you're afraid of i asked him curiously do you think her life's in danger worse than that said swain thickly his face suddenly livid oh worse than that i confess that i caught something of his horror but i shook myself impatiently i can't believe that i said but in any case our men will be at hand at the least outcry they will burst into the house and remember the three servants are there they cut no figure if they didn't hear those screams the other night do you think they will hear any others you must get her away from there mr lester he went on rapidly if she won't come of her own accord you must use force but my dear swain i objected i can't do that do you want me to kidnap her just that if it's necessary then i'd soon be occupying a cell here too i don't see what good that would do it would save her he asserted doggedly it would save her that's the only thing to consider but i rose to my feet in sudden impatience what consideration was she showing for him or for me or for any one you're talking foolishly i said you'd much better be thinking of your own danger it's much more real than hers i had an impulse to add that since she had chosen her path it was folly to waste pity upon her but i managed to check the words has any new light on the case occurred to you no he answered listlessly i haven't thought about it when do you see her again mr lester i'm seeing her to-night will you give her a note from me yes i agreed his face lighted again at that and he cleared a corner of his table and sat down to write the note it was evidently difficult to compose for he tore up two drafts before he got one to suit him but at last it was done and he folded it rummaged an envelope out of a pile of papers on a chair slipped the note into it and handed it to me there he said and his face was bright with hope i think that will settle it i was far from sharing his certainty but i put the envelope in my pocket assured myself that there was nothing more i could do for him and returned to the office just as i was getting ready to leave mr royce came in a chagrined look on his face mrs royce just telephoned me he said she drove out there as i asked her to but miss vaughan refused to see her i had expected it but the certainty that we had failed again did not add to my cheerfulness swain wants us to kidnap her i said with a twisted smile i'm not sure but that he's right said my partner and went thoughtfully away i went to my rooms changed had dinner at a quiet restaurant and then took the elevated for the long trip to the bronx it was after eight o'clock when i pulled the bell beside the tall gates to elmhurst the gardener was evidently expecting me for he appeared almost at once and admitted me without waiting for him i walked up the drive toward the house the lights were on in the library and i stepped up to the open door then i stopped and my heart fell for there were two white-robed figures in the room one was miss vaughan and the other was francisco silva the girl was sitting at his feet they had evidently heard my footsteps for they were looking toward the door and miss vaughan arose as soon as i came within the circle of light but if i expected her to show any embarrassment i was disappointed come in mr lester she said i believe you have not met senor silva the yogi had risen and now he bowed to me our encounters heretofore have been purely formal he said smiling i am happy to meet you mr lester his manner was friendly and unaffected and imperceptibly some of my distrust of him slipped away i have told senor silva miss vaughan continued when we were seated that you have consented to act as my man of business and it is my intention broke in silva to beseech mr lester to consent to act as my man of business also i am sure that i shall need one i was not at all sure of it for he seemed capable of dealing with any situation it would not be possible for me to represent divergent interests i pointed out my dear sir protested the yogi there will be no divergent interests suppose we put it in this way you will represent miss vaughan and will dispose of my interests from that standpoint there could be no objection to that i suppose no i answered slowly but before we go into that let me understand exactly what these interests are mr vaughan's estate i understand is a large one silva shrugged his shoulders i have understood so he said but i know nothing about it beyond what mr vaughan himself told me what was that that it was his intention to give this place as a monastery for the study of our religion and to endow it did he mention the amount of the endowment he asked me not long ago if a million dollars would be sufficient had he drawn up a deed of gift 
i do not know or made a will again silva shrugged indifferently to indicate that he was also ignorant on that point and i turned to miss vaughan if there is a will i asked where would it probably be there is a safe here she said in which my father kept his papers of value and she went to the wall and swung out a hinged section of shelving the door of a safe appeared behind it i approached and looked at it then tried the door but it was locked to open this we must know the combination i said or else we shall have to get an expert i know the combination she broke in it is but i stopped her my dear miss vaughan i laughed one doesn't go around proclaiming the combination of a safe how do you happen to know it my father often had me open the safe for him does anyone else know it i do not think so well suppose we see what is in the safe i suggested and as she knelt before it turned away i at least did not wish to know the combination that silva already knew it i accepted as certain i heard the twirling of the knob and a sharp click as the bolts were thrown back then i walked to miss vaughan's side and knelt beside her the interior of the safe was divided into the usual compartments one of them equipped with a yale lock the key was in the lock and i turned it swung the little door open and drew out the drawer which lay behind it if there is a will it is probably here i said let us see and i carried the drawer over to the light miss vaughan followed me but silva had sunk back into his chair and was staring abstractedly through the open door out into the darkness as though our proceedings interested him not at all then as i looked into the drawer i gave a little gasp of astonishment for it was almost filled with packets of bills there were five of them neatly sealed in wrappers of the national city bank each endorsed to contain ten thousand dollars why did your father require all this money i asked but miss vaughan shook her head he always kept money there she said though i never knew the amount i glanced at the yogi but his reverie remained unbroken then i laid the packets on the table and dipped deeper into the drawer there were two bank books some memoranda of securities a small cash book and at the very bottom an unsealed envelope endorsed last will and testament of worthington vaughan here we are i said took it out and replaced the rest of the contents shall we read it now yes i should like to read it she answered quietly the document was a short one it had evidently been drawn by vaughan himself for it was written simply and without legal phrases it had been witnessed by henry and catherine schneider and was dated only a week previously but three days before the murder who are these witnesses i asked they are the cook and the gardener do you recognize your father's writing oh yes there can be no question as to that it was a peculiar writing and a very characteristic one not easy to read until one grew accustomed to it but at the end of a few minutes i had mastered it the provisions of the will were simple elmhurst and the sum of one million dollars in negotiable securities were left absolutely to my dear and revered master francisco silva priest of the third circle of siva and yogi of the ninth degree to whom i owe my soul's salvation the bequest to be used for the purpose of founding a monastery for the study of the doctrines of saivism and as an asylum for all true believers the remainder of his estate was left absolutely to his daughter to dispose of as she saw fit it is however my earnest wish the will concluded that my daughter marjorie should enter upon the way and accept the high destiny which the master offers her as a priestess of our great lord may the all-seeing one guide her steps aright there was a moment's silence as i finished then i glanced at miss vaughan her eyes were fixed her face was rapt and shining she felt my gaze upon her and turned to face me as your attorney miss vaughan i said it is my duty to advise you that this will would probably not hold in law i think it would be comparatively easy to convince any court that your father was not of sound mind when he drew it you see senor silva i added that there is at once a conflict of interests but silva shook his head with a little smile there is no conflict he said if miss vaughan does not approve her father's wishes they are as though they were not i do approve them the girl cried passionately her hands against her heart i do approve them all of them i asked she swung full upon me her eyes aflame yes all of them she cried oh master receive me and she flung herself on her knees by silva's chair 
End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 The Vision in the Crystal Silva laid a hand tenderly upon the bowed head, as though in benediction, but I could have sworn there was unholy triumph in his eyes. I caught but a glimpse of it, for he veiled them instantly and bowed his head, and his lips moved as if in prayer. The kneeling figure was quivering with sobs. I could hear them in her throat, and my heart turned sick as I saw how she permitted his caressing touch. Then suddenly she sprang erect, and, without a glance at me, hurried from the room. There was silence for a moment. Then Silva arose and faced me. "'You see how it is, Mr. Lester?' he said. "'Yes,' I answered dryly. "'I see how it is.' I refolded the will, slipped it back into its envelope, restored it to the drawer, made sure that all the packets were there, too, replaced the drawer in the safe, closed the door, twirled the knob, swung the shelves into place in front of it, and finally, my self-control partially regained, turned back to Silva. "'Well,' I said, and my voice sounded very flat, let us sit down and talk it over. He wheeled his chair around to face me and sat down. I looked at him in silence for a moment. The man was virile, dominant. There was in his aspect something impressive and compelling. Small wonder this child of nineteen had found herself unable to stand against him. I know what is in your mind, he said at last, but after all it was her father's wish. That should weigh with you. Her father was mad i deny it he was very sane he found the way and he has set her feet upon it what way i demanded where does it lead the way of life it leads to peace and happiness he uttered the words as with finality but i shrugged them impatiently away don't float off into your mysticism i said let us keep our feet on the earth you may be sincere or you may not it is impossible for me to say but I know this, it is not fair to that child to take her at her word. She doesn't realize what she is doing. I don't know what it is you plan for her, but before you do anything, she must have a chance to find herself. She must be taken out of this atmosphere into a healthier one until she has rallied from the shock of her father's death and emerged from the shadow of his influence. She must have time to get back her self-control. Then if she chooses to return, well and good." to all your musts mr lester retorted silva i can only say that i am willing i have not lifted a finger to detain her but what if she will not go then she must be made to go another must he rejoined lightly i would remind you that she is mistress of her own actions neither you nor i can compel her to do anything she does not wish to do it has been a great happiness to me that she has chosen as she has it would have been a great sorrow to me had she decided differently but i should have acquiesced now it is for you to acquiesce after all what claim have you upon her i admit that i have no claim i said more calmly but there is one who has a claim and to whom she is bound to listen you refer no doubt to that misguided young man who is now in prison i refer to frederick swain yes i retorted hotly it is true he is in prison and how did he get there by coming when she called him by trying to assist her was it assisting to kill her father queried silva and his lips were curled with scorn i paused a moment to make sure of my self-control for it seemed to be slipping from me senor silva i said at last how her father came to his death i do not know but i do know that swain had no hand in it yet he is in prison he reminded me innocent men have been in prison before this i will get him out by what means by finding the real murderer i said and looked at him with eyes which i knew were bloodshot he returned my gaze steadily so you think i am the murderer he asked quietly i got a grip of myself i saw that i had gone too far i do not know what to think i answered i am seeking light in any event swain merits some consideration miss vaughan should at least listen to what he has to say she promised to marry him she has withdrawn that promise she has never said so she has withdrawn it in choosing as she has chosen they who serve in the temple of siva turn their backs on marriage i put the words away from me with a gesture that means nothing to me i said i know nothing of the temple of siva i wish to know nothing for mysticism repels me but i do know that she gave her word i do know that she loved him earthly love fades and passes said the yogi solemnly she has given her heart to the master 
and he made his gesture of reverence there was anger in my eyes as i looked at him how was one to reply to such jargon i would point out to you senor silva i said that miss vaughan is not yet of legal age and so not quite her own mistress does your law interfere in matters of the heart he inquired blandly or in matters of religion no i said flushing at his irony but the law demands that until she is of age she have a guardian to protect her interests i shall ask that one be appointed at once to that said the yogi mildly i have not the least objection in fact mr lester i do not know why you should tell me your plans but for some reason you seem to regard me as an adversary i am not i am no man's adversary i object to nothing i have no right to object to anything i am simply miss vaughan's friend and well-wisher and seek her happiness i should like to be your friend also and swain's i queried a little brutally the friend of all men said the yogi simply they are all my brothers we are children of the same great spirit i was silent for a moment then i took swain's letter from my pocket if you are sincere i said you can easily prove it i have a letter here from swain he gave it to me to-day and i promised to give it to miss vaughan to-night without a word he crossed to the bell and rang it the maid answered mr lester has a letter which you will give to your mistress he said and you will wait for an answer i added the girl took the letter and went away silva sat down again and when i glanced at him i saw that his eyes were closed five minutes passed and the girl appeared again at the door miss vaughan says there is no answer sir she said and let the curtain fall into place i made a gesture of despair i felt that the game was lost after all mr lester said silva kindly what is this fate that you would prepare for her you seek her marriage with a young man who when i saw him appeared to me merely commonplace admitting for the moment that he is innocent of this crime you would nevertheless condemn her to an existence flat and savourless differing in no essential from that of the beasts of the field it is the existence of all normal people i pointed out and the one which they are happiest in but miss vaughan would not be happy she has too great a soul that young man is not worthy of her you yourself have felt it i could not deny it few men are worthy of a good woman i said lamely faugh good woman and he snapped his fingers i abhor the words they are simply cant but a great woman a woman of insight of imagination ah for such a woman the way that i prepare is the only way there she will find joy and inspiration there she will grow in knowledge there she will breathe the breath of life mr lester and he leaned forward suddenly you have the courage to consult the sphere what do you mean you saw how i spent the white night of siva he made his gesture of reference will you gaze for an hour on the crystal for what purpose i do not know what may be revealed to you he answered that is in the keeping of the holy one perhaps nothing perhaps much will you make the trial his eyes were distended with excitement his lips were trembling with eagerness i feel that it will not be in vain he added there was something compelling in his gaze after all why not i struggled to my feet with a strange smile he held back the curtain and i passed before him into the hall and up the stairs as i hesitated at the top he opened the door into the entry and again my senses were assaulted by a heavy numbing odour in the middle of the room the crystal sphere glowed softly take your place upon the couch he said sit thus with your legs crossed and your hands folded before you but first listen to me there is in this no magic this sphere is merely a shell of crystal in which a small lamp burns it serves only to concentrate the mind to enable it to forget the world and to turn in upon itself the visions which will come to you if any come will come from within and not from without they will be such visions as the holy one may will and by the holy one i mean the spirit which pervades the universe even to its farthest bound the spirit which is in all of us alike the spirit which is in good men and in bad men like you and me and men like the one who slew my pupil it is with this spirit if the holy one so wills that you will commune so that you will see no longer with the poor eyes of the body 
but with eyes from which nothing is concealed, either in the past or in the future. Do you understand? I think so, I murmured, unable to take my eyes from the glowing circle. Then to the Holy One I commend thee, said the yogi, and sat down on the couch opposite me. I felt that his eyes were upon me, but mine were upon the sphere, and in a moment I was no longer aware of him. I was aware only of the glowing circle which seemed to widen and widen until the whole universe revolved within it. The sun and the moon and the stars were there, and I gazed at them as from a great distance. I saw stars glow and fade. I saw great nebulae condense to points of light and disintegrate to dust. Then, slowly, slowly, but growing clearer and more clearer, until I was looking down upon its seas and continents, and suddenly, as it turned before me, I recognized the earth. Europe, Asia, the broad Pacific swung below me. Then land again, America. I saw great mountains, broad plains, and mighty rivers. The motion ceased. I was gazing down upon a great city built upon a narrow spur of land between two rivers, a city of towering buildings and busy streets. Then upon a single house set in the midst of lofty elms. Then I was in a room, a room with books against the walls and a door opening upon a garden from the garden the light faded and the darkness came and a clock somewhere struck twelve then suddenly at the door appeared two white-robed figures an old man and a girl the man was talking violently but the girl crossed the room without a backward glance and passed through a door on its farther side the man stood for a moment looking after her then flung himself into a chair and put his hands before his face with creeping flesh i looked again at the outer door waiting who would enter and slowly slowly the drapery was put aside and a face peered in i could see its flashing eyes and working mouth a hand in which a knife gleamed was raised cautiously to the cord and when it was lowered it held a piece of the cord within its grasp i could see the eager fingers fashioning a knot then with head bent the figure crept forward foot by foot it was at the chair back and even as the old man conscious at last of the intruder raised his head the cord was cast about his throat and drawn tight there was a moment's struggle and i saw that the hand which held the cord was red with blood from the wrist a stained handkerchief fell softly to the floor and then the assassin turned to steal away but as he went he cast one awful glance over his shoulder the light fell full upon his face and i saw that it was swain's i opened my eyes to find myself extended full length on the divan with silva standing over me a tiny glass of yellow liquid in his hand drink this he said and i swallowed it obediently it had a pungent unpleasant taste but i could feel it running through my veins and it cleared my mind and steadied my nerves as though by magic i sat up and looked at the crystal the other lights in the room had been switched on and the sphere lay cold and lifeless I passed my hand before my eyes and looked at it again. Then my eyes caught Silva's. He was smiling softly. "'The visions came,' he said. "'Your eyes tell me that the visions came. Is it not so?' "'Yes,' I answered. "'Strange visions, Senor Silva. I wish I knew their origin.' "'Their origin is in the universal spirit,' he said quietly. "'Even yet you do not believe.' "'No, and I looked again at the crystal.' there are some things past belief nothing is past belief he said still more quietly you think so because your mind is wrapped in the conventions amid which you exist free it from those wrappings and you will begin really to live you have never known what life is how am i to free it senor silva i questioned he took a step nearer to me by becoming a disciple of the holy one he said most earnestly but i was myself again and i rose to my feet and shook my head with a smile no i said you will get no convert here i must be going i will open the gate for you he said in another tone and led the way down the stairs through the library and out upon the gravelled walk after the drugged atmosphere of his room the pure night air was like a refreshing bath and i drew in long breaths of it silva walked beside me silently he unlocked the gate with a key which he carried in his hand and pulled it open good night mr lester he said the sphere is at your service should you desire again to test it think over what i have said to you good night i answered and stepped through into the road the gate swung shut and the key grated in the lock 
Mechanically I turned my steps toward Godfrey's house, but I seemed to be bending under a great burden, the burden of the vision. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 The Summons I was confused and shaken. I had no idea of the hour. I did not know whether that vision had lasted a minute or a thousand years. But when I blundered up the path to Godfrey's house, I found him and Simmons sitting on the porch together. I had Godfrey bring me out, said Simmons, as he shook hands, because I wanted another look at those midnight fireworks. Did you come up on the elevated? Yes, I answered, and I felt Godfrey turn suddenly in his chair at the sound of my voice and scrutinize my face. I had dinner in town and came up afterwards. What time was that? asked Godfrey quietly. I got up here about eight o'clock. I had an engagement with Miss Vaughan. You have been with her since? With her and Silva, and I dropped into a chair and mopped my face with my handkerchief. The experience was almost too much for me, I added, and told them all that had occurred. They listened, Godfrey motionless and intent, and Simmons with a murmur of astonishment now and then. I am bound to confess, I concluded, that my respect for Silva has increased immensely. He's impressive, he's consistent, I almost believe he's sincere. Have you considered what that belief implies? asked Godfrey. What does it imply? if silva is sincere said godfrey slowly if he is really what he pretends to be a mystic a priest of siva intent only on making converts to what he believes to be the true religion then our whole theory falls to the ground and swain is guilty of murder i shivered a little but i saw that godfrey was right we are in this dilemma godfrey continued either silva is a faker and charlatan or swain is a murderer I wish you could have witnessed that horrible scene as I did, I broke in. It would have shaken your confidence, too. I wish you could have seen his face as he glanced back over his shoulder. It was fiendish, Godfrey, positively fiendish. It made my blood run cold. It makes it run cold now to remember it. How do you explain all that crystal sphere business, anyway? asked Simmons, who had been chewing his cigar perplexedly. It stumps me. Lester was hypnotized, and saw what Silva wanted him to see, answered Godfrey. You'll remember he sat facing him. But, I objected, no one remembers what happens during hypnosis. They do if they are willed to remember. Silva willed you to remember. It was cleverly done, and his explanation of the origin of the vision was clever, too. Moreover, it had some truth in it, for the secret of crystal-gazing is that it awakens the subjective consciousness, or great spirit, as Silva called it, but you weren't crystal-gazing to-night, Lester. You were simply hypnotized. You may be right, I admitted. I remember how his eyes stared at me, but it was wonderful. I'm more impressed with him than ever. It isn't the fact that he hypnotized you that bothers me, said Godfrey after a moment. It's the fact that he has also hypnotized Miss Vaughan. The words startled me. You think that's the reason of her behavior? I asked quickly. "'What other reason can there be?' Godfrey demanded. "'Here we have a girl who thinks herself in danger, and summons to her aid the man who loves her and whom, presumably, she loves. And two days later, when he has been imprisoned for a crime of which she declares it is absurd to suspect him, instead of hastening to him or trying to carry out his wishes, she turns her back on him and deliberately walks into the danger from which, up to that moment, she had shrunk with loathing.' contrast her behavior of saturday when she declared her faith in swain and begged your assistance with her behavior of yesterday and today when she throws you and swain aside and announces that she is going to follow silva to become a priestess of siva do you know what that means lester to become a priestess of siva no i answered slowly i don't know silva said that it was a great destiny yes and that it meant turning one's back on marriage that is right said godfrey in an indescribable tone there is no marriage there are only revolting abominable unspeakable rites and ceremonies i ran across professor sutro the orientalist today and had a talk with him about it he says the worship of siva is merely the worship of the reproductive principle as it runs through all creation and that the details of this worship are inconceivably disgusting that is the sort of destiny miss vaughan has chosen my hands were clammy with the horror of it. "'We must save her,' I said hoarsely. "'Of course she doesn't know, doesn't suspect. 
we must get her away from silva undoubtedly we must do something godfrey agreed i don't know how we can get her away from silva but we might get silva away from her couldn't you arrest him on suspicion and keep him locked up for two or three days simmons i might simmons grunted and while he's away you can work with her lester take mrs royce to see her give her a hint of what saivaism really is or get mrs royce to if that doesn't have any effect we can try stronger measures but i believe if we can get her away from silva's influence for a few days she will be all right again i hope so i agreed but i'm not at all certain she didn't behave like a hypnotized person godfrey she seemed to be acting of her own free will i couldn't see that silva was trying to influence her in any way she said she was trying to carry out her father's wishes and it certainly was his wish the will proves that if anybody is hypnotizing her i should say it was he well i can't arrest him said simmons with a grin her father's wishes may have had some weight with her at the outset admitted godfrey but they couldn't have driven her to the length to which she has gone and about the will if vaughan had not been killed if he had been found insane the will would have been at once invalidated don't you get the glimmer of a motive for his murder there lester it can be invalidated now if miss vaughan contests it i pointed out yes but unless she does contest it it will stand but if vaughan had been declared insane the will could never have been probated no contest would have been necessary do you see the difference i see what you mean but i don't think it amounts to much silva declares that if miss vaughan contests the will he will not defend it but he knows perfectly well that she will not contest it the surest way to prevent a contest is by adopting just such an attitude besides if we don't save her he'll get her share too vaughan's estate and vaughan's daughter and everything else that was vaughan's will disappear into his maw oh he's playing for a big stake lester and it looks to me as though he were going to win it it looked so to me too and i fell into gloomy thought you've got your men watching the house i suppose i asked at last turning to simmons yes and we managed to score one little point to-day what was that i found out that annie coogan the housemaid over there had a cousin on the force so i got him out here and he managed to have a talk with her he didn't find out anything he added that is anything we don't know but she promised to leave the door of her bedroom open at night and if anything happened to show a light at her window splendid i said and of course she'll keep her eyes open in the daytime sure she will she's a bright girl the only thing i'm afraid of is that the hindu will get on to her and fire her but she's been warned to be mighty careful if they don't suspect her maybe she'll have something to tell us in a day or two perhaps she will i agreed and i drew a breath of relief surely with all these guardians inside the house and out miss vaughan was safe the least outcry would bring swift assistance besides i could not bring myself to believe that silva was such a brute as godfrey seemed to think him i had been attracted by him not repelled and i have always believed in the accuracy of these instinctive feelings and godfrey himself i reflected did not seem to be very clear in the matter if silva was merely a faker and a charlatan there was no reason why he should wish to induct miss vaughan into the mysteries of a religion which he wore only as a cloak to be dropped as soon as his plans were accomplished on the other hand if he was sincere and really wished to convert the girl it was only reasonable to suppose that he was sincere in other things as well it reduces itself to this i said finally to godfrey if silva is a charlatan there is no reason why he should hypnotize miss vaughan but if he really wishes to make a priestess of her then by the same token he is sincere and not a charlatan at all godfrey nodded there's a twist there which i can't seem to get straight he admitted we'll have to watch silva a little longer to find out what his game really is of course it's just possible that he'd be glad to get rid of the girl but that she really is obsessed by the idea of carrying out her father's wish if that's the case silva is rather up a tree that's where we'd better be getting broke in simmons who had taken out his watch and held it up to the light it's nearly twelve o'clock and i don't want to miss the fireworks besides you fellows don't gain anything by all this jawing you've been at it for an hour and you're more tangled up now than when you started my motto with a case of this kind is just to sit quiet and watch it and pretty soon the rat thinks the coast is clear and pokes out his head and you nab him there's a good deal in that agreed godfrey with a little laugh i admit that our arguing doesn't seem to lead anywhere come along and he led the way out among the trees 
now take these fireworks went on simmons in a low tone when we were sitting side by side on the limb i don't understand what they mean but they must mean something am i laying awake nights worrying about them not me i'm just going to keep on watching till i find out what the meaning is i know you're a great fellow for theory and deduction and all that sort of thing godfrey and i know you've pulled off some mighty clever stunts but after all there's nothing like patience yes it's dogged as does it agreed godfrey patience is a great thing i only wish i had more of it it would be a good thing assented simmons candidly when we fell silent gazing out into the darkness surely said godfrey at last it must be twelve o'clock simmons got out his watch and flashed upon it a ray from his electric torch yes he said it's four minutes after i felt godfrey's hand stiffen on my arm then there's something wrong he whispered you remember lester what happened the other time that light failed to appear a man was murdered the darkness into which i stared seemed suddenly to grow threatening and sinister full of vague terrors even simmons grew uneasy and i could feel his arm twitching godfrey put his foot on the ladder and began to descend simmons and i followed him silently i'm going over the wall he said when we were on the ground something's wrong and we've got to find out what it is how will we get down asked simmons there's no ladder there godfrey considered a moment we can stand on top of the wall he said at last and lift this ladder over it won't be easy but it can be done go ahead lester and be careful of the glass i mounted the ladder felt cautiously along the top of the wall and found a place where i could put my feet simmons followed me and then came godfrey his was the difficult part to draw up the ladder and lower it again as for me it was all i could do to keep from falling i felt absurdly as though i were standing on a tremulous tightrope high in the air but godfrey managed it somehow and started down and at that instant there shrilled through the night the high piercing note of a police whistle it rose and fell rose and fell rose and fell and then came poignant silence the sound stabbed through me without hesitation or thought of peril i let myself go and plunged downward into the darkness end of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three deadly peril there must be a providence which protects fools and madmen for i landed in a heavy clump of shrubbery and got to my feet with no injury more serious than some scratches on hands and face which at the time i did not even feel in a moment i had found the path and was speeding toward the house ahead of me flitted a dark shadow which i knew to be godfrey and behind me came the pad pad of heavy feet which could only belong to simmons and then from the direction of the house came the crash of broken glass i reached the lawn crossed it and traversed the short avenue which ended at the library door three men were there and simmons came panting up an instant later the detectives had their torches in their hands and i saw that they had broken one of the glass panels of the doors and that one of them had passed a hand through the opening and was fumbling about inside there was a sharp click and the hand came back there you are he said threw the door open and stood aside for his superior officer to lead the way what's wrong simmons asked i don't know but the girl showed a light at her window you heard nothing not a sound simmons hesitated no doubt the same thought occurred to him as to me for the lawyer tartarin in me suggested that we scarcely had warrant to break our way into a sleeping house in the middle of the night but no such doubt seemed to disturb godfrey without a word he caught the torch from simmons's hand and passed through the doorway simmons followed i went next and the two other men came last their torches also flaring three beams of light flashed about the library and showed it to be empty one of them godfrey's lingered on the high-backed chair but this time it had no occupant then godfrey switched on the light passed into the hall and switched on the light there the hall too was empty and only the ticking of a tall clock disturbed the silence i was faltering and ready to turn back but to my amazement godfrey crossed the hall at a bound and sprang up the stair three steps at a time make all the noise you can he shouted over his shoulder and the clatter of our feet seemed enough to wake the dead the upper hall was also empty and then my heart gave a sudden leap for the circle of light from godfrey's torch had come to rest upon a white-robed figure which had stolen halfway down the stair from the upper story it was the maid holding her nightdress about her and her face was as white as her gown godfrey sprang to her side what is it he asked what is wrong 
i heard a cry gasped the girl down there somewhere and a scuffle in the dark a woman's cry it was choked off short godfrey leaped down among us and as the light of a torch flashed across it i saw his face was livid who's got an extra gun he demanded and one of the detectives pressed one into his hand ready now men he added crossed the hall threw open the outer door into silva's room and flung back the drapery beyond my heart was in my throat as i peered over godfrey's shoulder at what lay within and then a gasp of amazement from my companions mingled with my own for the crystal sphere was glowing softly and seated cross-legged on the divan his hands folded his eyes fixed in meditation was silva we all stood for a moment staring at him then godfrey passed his hand dazedly before his eyes you two men stay on guard here he said one of you keep your torch on this fellow and the other keep his torch on the floor there's a cobra around somewhere an arc of light swept shakingly across the floor as one of the men turned his torch toward it but i saw no sign of toto lester you and simmons come with me godfrey added stepping back into the hall and tapped at the door of miss vaughan's bedroom there was no response and he tapped again then he tried the door found it unlocked and opened it he sent a ray of light skimming about the room then he found the switch turned on the lights and entered the room was empty as were the dressing-room and bathroom adjoining the covers of the bed had been turned back ready for its occupant but the bed was undisturbed godfrey glanced about the room again a sort of frenzied concentration in his gaze and then went out leaving the lights burning it took but a moment or two to look through the other suites they were all empty if miss vaughan was anywhere about and unharmed said godfrey the noise we made would have brought her out to investigate there's only one place she can be and he led the way resolutely back to the door of silva's room the yogi had not moved godfrey contemplated him for a moment with his torch full on the bearded face then he crossed the threshold his torch sweeping the floor in front of him let's see what the thug is up to he said crossing the room drew back the drapery and opened the door into the little closet where we had seen mahboob once before there was a burst of acrid smoke into the room and godfrey stepped back with a stifled exclamation come here you fellows he cried and simmons and i sprang to his side for a moment i could see nothing the rolling clouds of smoke blinded and choked me i could feel the tears running down my cheeks and my throat burned as though it had been scalded then the smoke lifted a little and i caught a glimpse of what lay within the room in the middle of the floor stood an open brazier with a thin yellow flame hovering above it now bright now dim as the smoke whirled about it before the brazier sat mahboob his legs crossed with feet uppermost his hands pressed palm to palm before his face but he'll suffocate i gasped and indeed i did not see why any human being could breathe in such an atmosphere and then as the smoke whirled aside again i saw the snake its head was waving slowly to and fro its horrible hood distended its yellow lidless eyes fixed upon us simmons saw it too and retreated a step we'd better keep out of there he gasped till that little pet's put away in his basket but godfrey seized his arm and dragged him back to the threshold of the door look simmons he cried rubbing his dripping eyes fiercely there against the wall is there something there or is it just the smoke i looked too but at first saw nothing for a cloud of smoke rolled down and blotted out the light from godfrey's torch then it swirled aside and against the farther wall i fancied i saw something a shape a huddled shape grotesque horrible somehow i heard godfrey's startled cry saw his hand swing up saw a tongue of yellow flame leap from his revolver and with the echo of the shot came a scream a scream piercing unearthly of terror unspeakable i saw the thug spring into the air his face distorted his mouth open i saw him tearing at something that swung from his neck something horrible that clung and twisted he tore the thing loose it was only an instant really but it seemed an age and still shrieking flung it full at us i was paralyzed with terror incapable of movement staring dumbly but godfrey swept me aside so sharply that i almost fell and that foul shape swished past us fell with a thud and was lost in the darkness end of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four kismet words cannot paint the nauseating horror of that moment fear cold abject awful fear ran through my veins like a drug my face was clammy with the sweat of utter terror my hands clutched wildly at some drapery which tore from its fastenings and came down in my grasp three shafts of light swept across the floor and almost at once picked up that horrid shape it was coiled with head raised ready to strike and i saw that one side of its hood had been shot away 
i have more than once referred to simmons as hard-headed and wanting in imagination not always i fear in terms the most respectful for that i ask his pardon i shall not make that mistake again for in that nerve-racking moment he never lost his coolness revolver in hand he crept cautiously forward while we others held our breath then the pistol spoke once twice thrice and the ugly head fell forward to the floor at the same moment godfrey sprang to the door from which volumes of heavy scented smoke still eddied and disappeared inside i scarcely noticed him i was staring at that foul object on the floor and then i stared at francisco silva motionless on the divan his eyes fixed on the crystal sphere undisturbed amid all this terror and tumult it is impossible for me to remember him as he was in that moment without admiration yes and a little awe but godfrey's voice shrill with excitement brought me around with a start lester he shouted lend a hand here wondering what new horror lay in wait i fought my way into the other room stumbled over the body of the thug barely saved myself my scalp prickling with terror from falling upon it and pitched forward to where godfrey was bending above the huddled shape i had glimpsed through the smoke catch hold he panted and choking staggering suffocating we dragged it into the outer room get a window open he gasped get a window open and simmons whom nothing seemed to shake groped along the wall until he found a window pulled the hangings back threw up the sash and flung back the shutters quick said godfrey over there now hold the torch and as i took it and pressed the button with a trembling finger the halo of light fell upon a bloodless face the face of marjorie vaughan simmons was supporting her and godfrey with frantic fingers was loosening her robe at the throat my terrified eyes staring at that throat half expected to find a cruel mark there but its smoothness was unsullied the robe loosened godfrey snatched his cap from his head and began to fan the fresh air in upon her pray heaven it is not too late he murmured and kept on fanning watching the white lips and delicate nostrils so drawn and livid we must try artificial respiration he said after a moment but not here this atmosphere is stifling take her feet lester we staggered out with her somehow across the hall into her room and laid her on her bed godfrey kneeling above her began to raise and lower her arms with a steady regular rhythm open the windows wide he commanded without looking up wet a towel or something in cold water and bring it here simmons threw open the windows while i went mechanically to the bathroom wet a towel and slapped it against her face and neck as godfrey directed the moments passed and at last the lips opened in a fluttering sigh the bosom rose with a full inhalation and a spot of colour crept into either cheek thank god said godfrey in a voice that was almost a sob now simmons go out and bring that irish girl and send one of your men to phone for hinman simmons sent one of his men scurrying with a word and himself dashed up the stairs to the other floor he was back in a moment almost dragging the frightened girl with him her teeth were chattering and she started to scream when she saw that still form on the bed but simmons shook her savagely there's nothing to be afraid of godfrey assured her your mistress isn't dead she'll soon come around but you must get her undressed and to bed and then keep bathing her face with cold water till the doctor comes understand yes sir faltered the girl but oh and a burst of hysterical sobbing choked her simmons shook her again don't be a fool annie krogan he said get hold of yourself godfrey stepped off the bed and picked up one of the limp wrists her pulse is getting stronger he said after a moment it will soon hello what's this clasped tight in the slender fingers was something that looked like a torn and crumpled rubber glove he tried to unclasp the fingers but when he touched them they contracted rigidly and a low moan burst from the unconscious girl so after a moment he desisted and laid the hand down again you understand what you're to do he asked the maid and she nodded mutely then come along boys he added and led the way back to the hall his face was dripping with perspiration and his hands were shaking but he managed to control them and now for signor silva he said in another tone taking the torch from my hand i fear he will have a rude awakening he sat there like a statue even when i shot the snake remarked simmons he's a wonder he is yes agreed godfrey as he stepped into the entry he is a wonder then he stopped glanced around and turned a stern face on simmons where's the man i left on guard here he asked why faltered simmons i remember now he helped us carry the young lady but we were all right there in the hall you don't mean 
godfrey stepped to the inner door and flashed his torch about the room the divan was empty simmons paused only for a single glance he can't be far away he said he can't get away in that white robe of his come along tom and followed by his assistant he plunged down the stairs i saw godfrey half turn to follow then he stopped ran his hand along the wall inside the door found the button and turned on the lights his face was pale and angry it's my fault as much as anyone's he said savagely i might have known silva would see the game was up and try to slip away in the excitement i ought to have kept an eye on him your eyes were fairly busy as it was i remarked besides maybe he hasn't got away godfrey's face as he glanced about the room showed that he cherished no such hope let's see what happened to mahbub he said maybe he got away too and he crossed to the inner door the flame in the brazier had died away and the smoke came only in fitful puffs heavy with deadening perfume the thug had not got away he lay on the floor a dreadful sight he was lying on his back his hands clenched his body arched in a convulsion his head drawn far back the black lips were parted over the ugly teeth and the eyes had rolled upward till they gleamed two vacant balls of white at the side of his neck just under the jaw was a hideous swelling godfrey's torch ran over the body from head to foot and i sickened as i looked at it i'm going out i said i can't stand this and i hurried to the open window godfrey joined me there in a moment i'm feeling pretty bad myself he said putting the torch in his pocket and mopping his shining forehead it's plain enough what happened i caught a glimpse of miss vaughan on the floor there realized that we couldn't do anything with the snake in the way and shot at it but i only ripped away a portion of the hood and the thing mad with rage sprang upon the hindu nothing on earth could have saved him after it got its fangs in his neck ugh he shivered slightly and stood gazing for a moment down into the garden then he turned back to me with a smile it's a good night's work lester he said even if we don't catch silva i fancy miss vaughan will change her mind now about becoming a priestess of siva but godfrey i asked what happened what was she doing in there what he stopped me with a hand upon my arm i don't know but she'll tell us when she comes around i only hope they'll get silva that would make the victory complete he paused for the hum of a motor car came up the drive and an instant later we caught the glare of the acetylenes then a voice hailed us hello there it called shall i come up was that you doctor asked godfrey leaning out yes come right up then to miss vaughan's room we met him at the stairhead oh it's you he said recognizing us what has happened now it's miss vaughan she's been half suffocated but how did you get in the gates were open hinman answered so i drove right through is miss vaughan in here and when godfrey nodded he opened the door and closed it softly behind him open repeated godfrey staring at me open then that is the way silva went yes yes i agreed he had the key it was he who let me out and locked the gate after you yes i heard the key turn without a word godfrey hurried down the stairs at the foot we met simmons we've searched the grounds he said but haven't found anyone i've left my men on guard i phoned for some more men and notified headquarters he's not in the grounds said godfrey he went out by the gate and he told of hinman's discovery i'll stretch a net over the whole bronx said simmons i don't see how a fellow dressed as he is can get away and he hastened off to do some more telephoning well we can't do anything said godfrey so we might as well rest a while and he passed into the library and dropped into a chair i followed him but as i sat down and glanced about the room i saw something that fairly jerked me to my feet a section of the shelving had been swung forward and behind it the door of the safe stood open in an instant i had flung myself on my knees before it groped for the locked drawer pulled it out and hurried with it to the table the five packets of money were gone what is it lester asked godfrey at my side there was fifty thousand dollars in money in this drawer i answered trying to speak coherently godfrey took the drawer from my hands and examined its contents well it isn't there now he said and replaced the drawer in the safe sit down lester and he pressed me back into my chair and flung himself into another i wish i knew where vaughan kept his whiskey he murmured and ran his fingers furiously through his hair this is getting too strenuous even for me he fell silent for a moment and sat looking at the open safe what astonishes me he mused is the nerve of the man stopping at such a moment to work that combination think what that means lester 
to work a combination a man has to be cool and collected a man who could sit without stirring through that scene upstairs i said has nerve enough for anything nothing silva does can surprise me after all i wonder how he knew the combination i was sure he knew it i had to stop miss vaughan to keep her from telling it to me well he lessened his chance of escape by just that much every minute he spent before that safe was a minute lost ah here's simmons what do you think of that simmons he added and pointed to the safe senor silva stopped on his way out to gather up fifty thousand dollars in cash to pay his travelling expenses simmons walked over to the safe and looked at it fifty thousand he repeated but vaughn must have been a fool to keep that much money here oh i don't know it's a fireproof safe and mighty well concealed i'll tell you what i think i said i think he intended to give the money to silva he was going to give him a million left him that in his will you know so silva was only taking what belonged to him eh and godfrey laughed well i hope you'll get him simmons it was at this moment that dr hinman entered a curious repressed excitement in his face and his eyes shining strangely how is she doctor godfrey asked she'll be all right in the morning she is still pretty nervous so i gave her a sleeping draught and waited until it took effect godfrey looked at him more closely did she tell you anything he asked not much said hinman i wouldn't let her talk but she told me enough to let me guess one thing she is the bravest girl i ever knew or heard of what do you mean i mean cried hinman his eyes glowing more and more that she stayed in this house and faced the deadliest peril out of love for that man swain i mean if he's cleared as he's certain to be now it will be she who clears him i meant that if the real murderer is brought to justice it will be because of the evidence she stayed here to get and did get his voice mounted shrilly and his face was working as though he could scarcely keep back the tears wait a minute doctor broke in godfrey don't go too fast what evidence for answer hinman flipped something through the air to him godfrey caught it and stared at it an instant in bewilderment then with a stifled exclamation he sprang to the light and held the object close under it by all the gods he cried in a voice as shrill as hinman's own the fingerprints end of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five the blood-stained glove i do not know what it was i expected to see as i leaped from my chair and peered over godfrey's shoulder but certainly it was something more impressive than the soiled and ragged object he held in his hand it was apparently an ordinary rubber glove such as surgeons sometimes use and it was torn and crumpled as though it had been the subject of a struggle then i remembered that i had seen it crushed in miss vaughan's unconscious fingers and i recalled how the fingers had stiffened when godfrey tried to remove it as though some instinct in her sought to guard it even in the face of death but i don't understand said simmons who was staring over the other shoulder what's the thing got to do with the fingerprints look here said godfrey and held the glove so that the ends of the fingers lay in the full light then i saw that against the end of every finger had been glued a strip of rubber about an inch in length and half as wide and bending closer i perceived that the surface of each of these strips was covered with an intricate pattern of minute lines forged fingerprints that's a new idea in crime isn't it simmons and godfrey laughed excitedly simmons took the glove got his pocket glass and examined the finger tips minutely you think these reproduce swain's fingerprints he asked skeptically i'm sure they do you see it's the right hand look at the thumb you see it's a double whirl wait till we put them side by side with swain's own and you'll see that they correspond line for line yes and look at these stains do you notice what these stains are simmons they're blood did you notice the stains doctor yes said hinman i think they're blood stains that will be easy enough to determine whose blood is it asked simmons and i could see that even his armour had been penetrated well answered godfrey smiling science isn't able as yet to identify the blood of individuals but i'd be willing to give odds that it's swain's blood my idea is that silva got the blood for the fingerprints from the blood-soaked handkerchief which swain probably dropped when he fled from the arbour and which silva picked up and dropped beside the chair after he was through with it as an additional bit of evidence 
that's reasonable enough agreed hinman with a quick nod but what i can't understand is how he made these reproductions godfrey sat down again and contemplated the glove pensively for some moments then he turned to me where is that book of fingerprints you spoke about lester he asked i went to the bookcase and got it out godfrey took it and began to turn the pages quickly swain's name is in the index i said and he glanced at it and then turned to the place where the page had been which reminds me said hinman with a rueful smile that i concocted a very pretty theory to account for that missing page i felt quite chesty about it i'm glad it didn't throw miss vaughan off the scent so am i agreed godfrey for it must have been this missing page which gave miss vaughan her first suspicion of the truth perhaps it was pure inspiration or perhaps she knew that silva could reproduce fingerprints we shall learn when we hear her story in any event it's a clever trick and easy enough when you know how like standing the egg on end i suggested precisely every trick is easy when you work it backwards but just think simmons he added what problems the police will have to face if gloves like these become fashionable among cracksmen simmons groaned dismally you haven't told us yet how it's done he said i bit back a smile for simmons's tone was out of a pupil to master well said godfrey slowly it might be done in several ways the first thing is to get a good set of the prints to be reproduced that silva got from this album the moulds might be made by cutting them in wood or metal but that would take an expert and besides i fancy it would be too slow for silva he had a quicker way than that perhaps by transferring them to a plate of zinc or copper and then eating them out with acid once the mould is secured it is merely a question of pressing india rubber mixture into it and then heating the rubber until it hardens just as a rubber stamp is made the whole process would take only a few hours simmons drew a deep breath it may be simple he said but that fellow's a genius just the same he's much too clever to be at large we've got to get him be sure of one thing retorted godfrey you'll find it harder to catch him than it was to let him go he won't walk into your arms not that i blame you simmons he added but i blame those muckle-headed men of yours and i blame myself for not keeping my eyes open here's the glove take good care of it it means swain's acquittal and now there is one other thing i want to see before we go to bed suppose we make a little excursion to the roof to the roof what for demanded simmons as he wrapped the glove in his handkerchief and put it in his pocket you know how fond you are of fireworks retorted godfrey smiling and started to the door i haven't the slightest idea what you're talking about said hinman but i'm as curious as an old woman and i like fireworks too come along then laughed godfrey and led the way up the stairs this time we'll go as quietly as we can he added over his shoulder in the entry at the top of the stairs leading to the attic story was a heavy closed door and godfrey looked at it with a smile do you suppose those two german servants have slept on through all this excitement he asked and we found afterwards that they had the flare of godfrey's torch disclosed a third flight of stairs at the end of the entry and when we reached the foot of these and looked up we found ourselves gazing at the stars ah said godfrey i thought so the stage was set ready for the curtain and then the leading lady failed to appear so the villain went in search of her found her with the glove in her hand and started to suppress her when our timely arrival interrupted him gentlemen i think i can promise you a most interesting demonstration what did miss vaughan call it lester an astral benediction i said that's it said godfrey and led the way up the stairs there was a wide hinged trap door at the top lying open and we stepped through it out upon the roof here had been built a platform about eight feet square with a low railing around it i saw godfrey's torch playing rapidly over the boards of the platform then he marshalled us in the middle of it stand here in a row he said facing the west extend your arms to the heavens and concentrate your gaze upon that big star up yonder go ahead doctor he urged as hinman hesitated we're trying to persuade an astral visitor to pay us a call and it takes teamwork we stood silent a moment with our arms above our heads and i could hear godfrey shifting his feet cautiously along the boards of the floor what's that cried simmons for from the darkness at our feet had come a soft whirr as of a bird taking flight look cried hinman look 
high above our heads a point of flame appeared brightened and burned steel blue for a moment it hung there then it grew brighter and brighter and i knew that it was descending lower and lower it came until it hovered in the air just above us then it burst into a million sparks and vanished for a moment no one spoke then i heard hinman's voice and it was decidedly unsteady what is this anyway he demanded the arabian nights no said godfrey and in his voice was the ring of triumph it's merely a device of one of the cleverest fakers who ever lived take the torch simmons and let us see how it works he dropped to his knees while simmons lighted him and i saw that there was a hole in the floor about three inches in diameter godfrey felt carefully about it for a moment and then with a little exclamation of triumph found a hold for his fingers pulled sharply and raised a hinged section of the floor about eighteen inches square now give us the light he said and plunged it into the opening in line with the little hole was an upright metal tube about a foot long ending in a small square box beside the tube a slender iron rod ran from the platform down into the box that's the lever that sets it off remarked godfrey tapping the rod a pressure of the foot did it he pulled the rod loose seized the tube and lifted the whole apparatus out upon the platform let's take it down where we can look at it he said and carrying it easily in one hand led the way back to the library cleared a place on the table and set it down then after a moment's examination he pulled back a little bolt and tilted the top of the box with the tube attached to one side a curious mechanism lay revealed there was a powerful spring which could be wound up with a key and a drum wound with filament-like wire and connected with a simple clockwork to revolve it two small dry batteries were secured to one side of the box their wires running to the drum why it's nothing but a toy catapult i said that's all and godfrey nodded it remained for silva to add a few trimmings of his own and to put it to a unique use instead of a missile he loaded it with his little aerial shell attached to the end of this wire then he shot it off with a pressure of the foot where it reached the end of the wire the pull brought this platinum coil against the battery wires and closed the circuit then he shot it off with a pressure of the foot when it reached the end of the wire the pull brought this platinum coil against the battery wires and closed the circuit the spark fired the shell and the drum began to revolve and pull it down that explains lester why it descended so steadily and in a straight line the fellow who could devise a thing like that deserves to succeed here's health to him he ought to be behind the bars growled simmons the cleverer he is the more dangerous he is well retorted godfrey i admire him anyway and he isn't behind the bars yet no doubt you'll find some of his shells to-morrow about the house somewhere and you might amuse yourself by shooting one off every night at midnight on the chance that he sees it and comes back to see who's stealing his thunder but this brilliant suggestion didn't seem to appeal to simmons who merely grunted and continued his examination of the catapult silva had loaded it for tonight's performance godfrey went on but as i remarked before the leading lady failed to answer her cue and it remained for us to touch it off there it is simmons i turn it over to you it and the glove will make unique additions to the museum at headquarters and now he added with the wide yawn of sudden relaxation you fellows can make a night of it if you want but i'm going to bed i glanced at my watch it was half past four another dawn was brightening along the east hinman ran upstairs took a look at his patient and came down to tell us that she was sleeping calmly she'll be all right in the morning he assured us and while i don't want to butt in i'd certainly like to hear her story adventures like this don't happen very often to a country doctor may i come most surely i assented warmly i think we were very fortunate to have had you in this case doctor so do i echoed godfrey while hinman flushed with pleasure and don't forget lester that it was i who picked him out with nothing better than the telephone book to guide me that was my infallible instinct suppose we say ten o'clock then i suggested smiling at godfrey's exuberance but then i was feeling rather exuberant myself i'll be here said hinman and thank you and a moment later we heard his car chugging away down the drive we listened to it for a moment then godfrey yawned again come along lester he said or i'll go to sleep on my feet can i give you a bed simmons no thanks said simmons i'm not ready for bed i'm going to comb this whole neighborhood as soon as it's light 
Silva can't escape unless he just fades away into the air. You found no trace of him? I've had no reports yet, and Simmons walked beside us down the drive to the gate. But my men ought to be coming in pretty soon. There's a thick grove just across the road where he may be hiding. He stopped, for a man was hastening toward us, carrying under one arm a small white bundle. Simmons quickened his pace. What's that you've got? he asked. The man saluted. I found it just now, sir, in the bushes near the gate. Looks like a dress. Simmons unrolled it slowly. It was the robe of the white priest of Siva. Godfrey looked at it, and then at Simmons, whose face was a study. Then he took me by the arm and led me away. I'm afraid Simmons has his work cut out for him, he said when we were out of earshot. I thought so from the first. A fellow as clever as Silva would be certain to keep his line of retreat open. He's far away by this time. He walked on thoughtfully, a little smile on his lips. I'm not altogether sorry, he continued. It adds an interest to life to know that he's running around the world, and that we may encounter him again some day. He's a remarkable fellow, Lester, one of the most remarkable I ever met. He comes close to being a genius. I'd give something to hear the story of his life. That wish was destined to be gratified, for three years later we heard that story, or a part of it, from Silva's lips as he lay calmly smoking a cigarette, looking in the face of death, and without flinching. Perhaps some day I shall tell that story. But Godfrey, I said as we turned in at his gate, all this scheme of lies, the star, the murder, the fingerprints, what was it all about? I can't see through it even yet. There are still a few dark places, he agreed, but the outlines are pretty clear, aren't they? Not to me. It's all a jumble. Suppose we wait till we hear Miss Vaughn's story, he suggested. After that, I think we can reconstruct the whole plot. There's one foundation stone that's missing, he added thoughtfully. I wonder if Miss Vaughn uses a blotting book. It all depends upon that. A blotting book, I echoed, but I don't see. He shook himself out of his thoughts with a little laugh not now lester it's time we were in bed look there's the sun and he led the way into the house i'll have you called at nine he added as he bade me good night at my door end of chapter twenty five chapter twenty six the mystery clears godfrey's powers of recuperation have astonished me more than once and never more so than when i found him at the breakfast table as fresh and rosy as though he had had a full night's sleep but even I felt better by the time the meal was over. It is wonderful what a cup of coffee can do for a man. I phoned a message to Swain as soon as I was up, Godfrey said, telling him in your name that we had the evidence to clear him, and that Miss Vaughan was safe. I must go down to him, I said, and start proceedings to set him free. I'll get Simmons to go with me before Goldberger, and then before the magistrate. We ought to get an order of release at once. "'You've got something to do before that,' Godfrey reminded me. "'We're to hear Miss Vaughan's story at ten o'clock. "'I'm taking it for granted,' he added with a smile, "'that I'll be welcome as well as Hinman.' "'That doesn't need saying,' I retorted, "'and ten minutes later we were on the way to Elmhurst. "'There was a man on guard at the library door, "'but he allowed us to pass when we gave our names, "'having evidently had his instructions from Simmons.' in answer to godfrey's question he said that so far as he knew no trace had been found of silva we went on into the room and found that someone simmons presumably had closed the safe and swung the section of shelving back into place before it it was not locked however and i opened it and went through its contents carefully with the faint hope that the money might have been thrust into some other compartment but i found no trace of it and was replacing the contents when a voice at the threshold brought me to my feet mr lester it said and i turned to behold a vision which made me catch my breath a vision of young womanhood with smiling lips and radiant eyes a vision which came quickly toward me with hands outstretched miss vaughan i cried and took the hands and held them can you forgive me she demanded for what for treating you so badly oh i could see what you thought of me and i longed to tell you it was only make-believe but i didn't dare i could see your grimace of disgust when i fell on my knees beside the chair yonder miss vaughan i broke in whatever my sentiments may have been and i was an idiot not to suspect the truth they have all changed into enthusiastic admiration you were wiser and braver than all of us a wave of colour swept into her cheeks i might add i went on that i thought white robes becoming but they were not nearly so becoming as this gown 
it is of the last century she protested but anything is better than that masquerade and when when i think i can get swain free this afternoon i answered i'm going to try anyway mr godfrey phoned him the good news the first thing this morning this is mr godfrey miss vaughan i added and very eager to shake hands with you very proud too said godfrey coming forward and suiting the action to the word there was a step on the walk outside and dr hinman appeared at the door well he cried coming in his face beaming there's no need for me to ask how my patient's doing i'm afraid you haven't got any patient any more doctor i laughed i'm afraid not agreed hinman i'll have to go back to my office and wait for another one but before i go miss vaughan i want to hear the story mr lester promised me i should miss vaughan looked at me we all want to hear it i said how you came to suspect how you got the glove everything her face grew sober and a shadow flitted across it suppose we sit down she said and just then the sentry at the door saluted and simmons stepped into the room i saw him shake his head in answer to godfrey's questioning look and knew that silva had not been found then i brought him forward to miss vaughan and introduced him mr simmons i explained has been in charge of this case and it was he who arranged to watch the house for fear some harm would befall you i know broke in miss vaughan clasping simmons hand warmly annie told me all about it this morning i don't know how to thank you mr simmons oh it wasn't me especially protested simmons red to the ears it was really godfrey there and mr lester they were worried to death we were rather worried godfrey admitted especially after we saw you at that midnight fireworks party you saw that she asked quickly but how oh we had seen the show every night for a week it was its failure to come off last night which first told us something was wrong well said miss vaughan with a deep breath sitting down again and motioning us to follow her example it seems to me that you have a story to tell too but i'll tell mine first where shall i begin begin i suggested at the moment when you first suspected the plot that was when you were telling me of fred's arrest when you told me of the handkerchief and then of the fingerprints i knew that someone was plotting against him and then quite suddenly i thought of something you jumped up i said as though you were shot and ran to the bookcase over there and got down that album of fingerprints and found that swain's were missing that seemed to upset you completely it did and i will tell you why my father for many years had been a collector of fingerprints all of his friends were compelled to contribute and whenever he made a new acquaintance he got his prints too if he could he believed that one's character was revealed in one's fingerprints and he studied them very carefully it was a sort of hobby but it was for some reason distasteful to senor silva he not only refused to allow prints to be made of his fingers but he pooh-poohed my father's theories and they used to have some terrific arguments about it one night after a particularly hot argument senor silva made the assertion that he could by hypnotic suggestion cause his servant mahboob to reproduce any fingerprints he desired mahboob's fingertips had been manipulated in some way when he was a child so that they showed only a series of straight lines yes i said his prints were taken at the inquest father said that if senor silva could show him proof of that assertion he would never look at fingerprints again senor silva asked for a week in which to make a study of the prints in order to impress them upon his memory at the end of that time the test was made it was a most extraordinary one senor silva father and i sat at the table yonder under the light with the book of prints before us mahboob was placed at a little table in the far corner with his back to us and senor silva proceeded to hypnotize him it took only a moment for he could hypnotize mahboob by pointing his finger at him he said mahboob was a splendid subject because he had hypnotized him hundreds of times and had him under perfect control then he placed an ink-pad on the table in front of him nothing else my father wrote his name and the date upon the top sheet of a pad of paper and senor silva placed it before mahboob then he sat down with us selected a page of prints and asked us to concentrate our minds upon it at the end of a few moments he asked me to bring the pad from before mahboob i did so and we found the prints upon it to be identical with those on the page we had been looking at my father touched them with his finger and found that they were fresh as the ink smeared readily his name was on the corner of the page where he had written it there could be no doubt that in some way mahboob had been able to duplicate the prints 
senor silva repeated the experiment with another set of prints and then with another i think there were six altogether and every one of them was successful was swain's one of them no but when mr lester told me that fred was suspected because of those fingerprints the thought flashed into my mind that if senor silva and mahbub could imitate those of other people they could imitate fred's too and when i looked at the album and found that sheet torn out i was sure that was what had happened and so you decided to stay in the house to win senor silva's confidence by pretending to become a convert and to search for evidence against him i said that was a brave thing to do miss vaughan not so brave as you think she objected shaking her head i did not believe that there would be any real danger with the three servants in the house only at the last did i realize the desperate nature of the man she stopped and shivered slightly tell us what happened i said it was on sunday afternoon she continued that i went to senor silva and told him that i had decided to carry out my father's wish renounce the world and become a priestess of siva i shall never forget the fire in his eyes as he listened they fairly burned into me ah said godfrey so that was it she looked at him inquiringly except upon one hypothesis he explained that action on your part would have embarrassed silva and he would have tried to dissuade you he had left him by your father's will this valuable place and a million dollars if money had been all he sought that would have satisfied him and he would have tried to get rid of you that he did not that his eyes burned with eagerness when you told him of your decision proves that he loved you and wanted you also a brighter colour swept into miss vaughan's cheeks but she returned his gaze bravely i think that is true she assented in a low voice it was my suspicion of that which made me hesitate but i finally decided that there was no reason why i should spare him and let an innocent man suffer for him especially when you loved the innocent man i added to myself but managed to keep the words from my lips as soon as i told him of my decision miss vaughan continued he led me to the room where the crystal sphere is placed me on the divan sat down opposite me and began to explain to me the beliefs of his religion meditation it seems is essential to it and it was by gazing at the crystal that one could separate one's soul from one's body and so attain pure and profound meditation was that your first experience of crystal gazing godfrey asked yes both he and my father had often tried to persuade me to join them they often spent whole nights there but it seemed to me that the breaking down of father's will was due to it in some way i grew to have a fear and horror of it and so i always refused the change in your father was undoubtedly directly traceable to it godfrey agreed during those periods of crystal gazing he was really in a state of hypnosis induced by silva with his mind bare to silva's suggestions and as these were repeated he became more and more a mere echo of silva's personality that was what silva desired for you also i felt something of the sort though i never really understood it said miss vaughan and as i sat there on the divan that sunday afternoon with his burning eyes upon me i was terribly afraid his will was so much stronger than mine and besides i could not keep my eyes from the crystal in the end i had a vision a dreadful vision she pressed her hands to her eyes as though it was still before her the vision of your father's death i questioned she nodded with swain as the murderer how did you know she asked astonished because he induced the same vision in me the next evening but don't let me interrupt i don't know how long the seance lasted she continued some hours i suppose for it was dark when i again realized where i was and after dinner there was another and then at midnight he led me to the roof and invoked what he called an astral benediction a wonderful wonderful thing godfrey smiled dryly you were overwrought miss vaughan he said and straight from a spell of crystal gazing no wonder it impressed you but it was really only a clever trick i realize now that it must have been a trick she agreed but at the time it seemed an unquestionable proof of his divine power when it was over i had just sufficient strength of will remaining to tear myself away from him and gain my own room and lock the door you mean he tried to detain you not with his hands but i could feel his will striving to conquer mine even after i was in my room i could feel him calling to me in the morning i was stronger i lay in bed until nearly noon trying to form some plan but i began to fear that i must give it up i realized that after a few more nights like the night before i should no longer have a will of my own that what i was pretending would become reality i decided that i could risk one more day perhaps two 
but i felt very weak and discouraged you see i did not know what to look for where to look i wanted evidence against him but i had no idea what the evidence would be i wanted to search his room but i had not been able to because he was scarcely ever out of it except when he was with me and besides mahbub was always squatting in the little closet next to it i got up at last and after breakfast he met me here in the library he suggested another seance but i pleaded a headache and he walked with me about the grounds i remembered that you were to come in the evening mr lester and i determined to leave you with him on some pretext and search his room then i told him you were coming that i had asked you to take charge of my affairs and it was then he told me of the legacy he believed my father had left him adding that whether the legacy should stand or not was entirely in my hands then i began to feel his influence again and managed to excuse myself and go indoors do you know what happened in the evening mr lester as soon as i left you i flew to his room determined to search it at any cost but i was scarcely inside when i heard the outer door open and i had just time to get behind the curtains in one corner when someone entered peering out i saw that it was mahbub he looked about for a moment and then sat down on the divan folded his feet under him and fell into a contemplation of the sphere i scarcely dared to breathe i was always afraid of mahbub she added far more than of senor silva about senor silva there was at least something warm and human but mahbub impressed me somehow as a brother to the snake he seemed so cold and venomous you knew he was dead i asked as she paused yes and he told me and she shuddered lightly the cobra too is dead added godfrey i agree with you miss vaughan there was a kinship between them though the cobra turned against him in the end how long did he sit there i do not know but it seemed an age to me finally in despair i had made up my mind to try to steal away when i heard steps in the entry mahbub slipped from the divan and disappeared behind the curtains and then the door opened and signor silva and mr lester entered i saw at once that there was to be another seance and that i could not escape for signor silva sat down facing the corner where i was i could only brace myself against the wall and wait it was a dreadful ordeal but it had its reward she added with a smile and that was i asked the discovery of the glove signor silva suddenly switched on the lights and i knew that the seance was over but he had some difficulty in arousing you the trance must have been a very deep one and finally leaving you lying on the divan he went to the wall drew aside the hangings and pressed his hand against the panel a little door flew open and i saw that there was a cupboard in the wall he filled the glass with some liquid pulled the hangings into place and went back to you and made you drink it it seemed to do you good yes i said it brought me around at once and then and then as soon as you went out together i ran to the cupboard and looked into it but for a moment i was confused i saw nothing which seemed of any importance some bottles and decanters and glasses a glass tray or two a pile of rubber gloves i couldn't understand i picked up one of the gloves and looked at it but it was just an ordinary glove then farther back i saw some others their fingertips were stained with ink and then another lying by itself i looked at it saw the patches on the fingertips i saw the stains and then i understood i do not know how i understood or why it was like a flash of lightning revealing everything and then as i stood there with the glove in my hand i heard senor silva returning she paused a moment and i could see the shiver which ran through her at the recollection it was not that i was afraid she said it was that i seemed to be lost i let the draperies fall ran to the divan and sat down before the sphere i could think of nothing else to do i can still see his astonished face when he entered and found me sitting there i was waiting for you i said trying to smile you remember i was to have another lesson to-night yes he said and looked at me his eyes kindling i was trembling inwardly for suddenly i began to fear him i knew that i must keep my head that i must not yield to his will or i would be swept away i thought mr lester would never go i said he came to the divan and sat down close beside me and looked into my eyes did the time really seem so long he asked it seemed very long i said he gazed at me for another moment then rose quickly and turned on the light sit where you are he said and i will sit here fix your eyes upon the sphere and your mind upon the infinite mind so shall great wisdom come to you i felt my will crumbling to pieces i closed my eyes and crushed the glove within my hand and thought of this man's villainy and of the part i must play if i were to defeat him his voice went on and on 
but gradually i ceased to hear it i was thinking of the glove of escape of fred yea love is strong i told myself and it giveth to the dove the wisdom of the serpent else how had this child come victorious from such an ordeal i do not know how long i sat there miss vaughan continued but senor silva rose suddenly with an exclamation of impatience and switched on the light there is something wrong he said coming back and standing over me some hostile influence is at work what is it i do not know i said i cannot lose myself as i did last night something holds you to earth some chain perhaps it is your own wish no no i protested let us try again he switched off the light and sat down facing me and again i felt his will trying to enter and conquer me and again i clasped the glove and kept my mind upon it thinking only of escape you can guess how we were leaning forward listening breathless to this narrative i fancied i could see her sitting there in the darkness with silva's evil influence visibly about her but held at bay by her resolute innocence as christian's shield of faith turned aside the darts of apollyon it was indeed a battle of good and evil the more terrible because it was fought not with bodily weapons but with spiritual ones at last senor silva rose again miss vaughan continued and turned on the lights and i shivered when i met his gaze you are defying me he said very low but i will break you yet and he clapped his hands softly together mahbub appeared at the inner door received a sharp order and disappeared again a moment later there was a little swirl of smoke from the door of his room and a sharp overpowering odour which turned me faint and then senor silva who had been pacing up and down the room stopped suddenly and looked at me his face distorted is that it he muttered can it be that and he strode to the curtain which hung before his secret cupboard and swept it back i knew that i was lost i sprang for the outer door managed to get it open and set a foot in the hall before he seized me i remember that i screamed and then his hand was at my throat and i suppose i must have fainted she added with a little smile for the next thing i remember is looking up and seeing dr henman i sat back in my chair with a long breath of relief my tension during the telling of the story had been almost painful and it was not until it was ending that i saw two other men had entered while miss vaughan was speaking i was on my feet as soon as i saw them for i recognized goldberger and sylvester simmons telephoned me this morning that i was needed out here again goldberger explained but first i want to shake hands with miss vaughan you have met mr goldberger miss vaughan i said as he came forward but dr hinman didn't tell you that he's the cleverest coroner in greater new york he doesn't really think so miss vaughan goldberger laughed you ought to read some of the things he's written about me but i want to say that i heard most of your story and it's a wonder about that glove now simmons he added turning to the detective i'd like to see it and sylvester here is nearly dying to here it is said simmons and took it from his pocket and passed it over goldberger looked at it then handed it to sylvester who fairly seized it carried it to the door and examined it with gleaming eyes then without a word he took an ink pad from his pocket slipped the glove upon his right hand inked the tips of the fingers and pressed them carefully upon a sheet of paper from an inner pocket he produced a sheaf of photographs laid them beside the prints and carefully compared them finally he straightened up and looked at us his face working do you know what this does gentlemen he asked in a voice husky with emotion it strikes at the foundation of the whole system of fingerprint identification it renders forever uncertain a method we found absolutely safe it's the worst blow that has ever been struck at the police you mean the prints agree with the photographs asked godfrey going to his side absolutely said sylvester and mopped his face with a shaking hand end of chapter twenty six chapter twenty seven the end of the case to sylvester head of the identification bureau it seemed that the world was tottering to its fall but the rest of us who had not really at the bottom of our hearts perhaps believed in the infallibility of the fingerprint system took it more calmly and presently we went upstairs to take a look at the contents of silva's secret cupboard when he had first come to the house miss vaughan explained he had been given carte blanche in this suite of rooms he had them remodelled installed the circular divan and crystal sphere selected the hangings and had at the same time no doubt caused the secret cupboard to be built its contents were most interesting 
there was a box of aerial bombs which godfrey turned over to simmons with the injunction to go and amuse himself for sylvester's contemplation and further confusion were the gloves with which silva had managed his parlor mystification scheme six pairs of them and there was also the very simple apparatus with which the fingerprint reproductions had been made an apparatus as godfrey had suggested similar in every way to that used for making rubber stamps there too were the plates of zinc upon which the impressions of the prints had been etched with acid and finally there were various odds and ends of a juggler's outfit as well as various bottles of perfumes essences and liquids whose properties we could not guess godfrey looked at the gloves carefully as though in search of something and at last selected one of them with a little exclamation of satisfaction i thought so he said and held it up look at this glove sylvester you see it has never been used there is no ink on it do you know what it is it's the print of swain's left hand sylvester took it and looked at it that's a left hand all right he said but what makes you think it is swain's because silva expected to use both hands till he learned that swain had injured one of his but for that the blood needed to make the prints would have come from the victim and silva would have worn this glove too but swain's injury gave silva a happy inspiration wonderful man he added half to himself goldberger and simmons went on into the inner room to arrange for the disposition of the body of mahbub but godfrey and miss vaughan and i turned back together for we did not wish to see the thug at her boudoir door godfrey paused the case is clear he said from first to last provided you can supply us with a final detail miss vaughan what is that she asked did you write that note to swain in your own room yes and will you show me the table at which you wrote it certainly and she opened the door come in i wrote it at that little desk by the window godfrey walked to it picked up a blotting book which lay upon it and turned over the leaves ah he said after a moment i was sure of it here is the final link have you a small hand mirror miss vaughan she brought one from her toilet table and handed it to him in evident astonishment what do you see in the mirror he asked and held a page of the blotting book at an angle in front of it miss vaughan uttered an exclamation of surprise as she read the words reflected there mr frederick swain ten ten fifth avenue new york city if not at this address please try the calumet club tall oaks from little acorns grow quoted godfrey tossing the book back upon the desk but for the fact that you blotted the envelope miss vaughan young swain would never have been accused of murder i do not understand she murmured don't you see he pointed out the one question which we have been unable to answer up to this moment has been this how did silva know you were going to meet swain he had to know it and know it several hours before the meeting in order to have those fingerprints ready i concluded at last that there must be a blotting book and there it is miss vaughan stared at him you seem to be a very wonderful man she said godfrey laughed it is my everyday business to reconstruct mysteries he said shall i reconstruct this one please do she begged and motioned us to be seated godfrey's face was glowing with the sort of creative fire which i imagine illuminates the poet's brow at the moment of inspiration where did you first meet silva he asked in paris what was he doing there he was practicing mysticism my father went to consult him he was much impressed by him and they became very intimate and silva of course at once saw the possibilities of exploiting an immensely rich old man whose mind was failing so he comes here as his instructor in orientalism he does some very marvellous things by continued hypnosis he gets your father completely under his control he secures a promise of this estate and a great endowment he causes your father to make a will in which these bequests are specifically stated then he hesitates for during his residence in this house a new desire has been added to the old ones it had not often been his fortune to be thrown in daily contact with an innocent and beautiful girl and he ends by falling in love with you he knows of your love for swain he has caused swain to be forbidden the house but he finds you still indifferent at last by means of his own entreaties and your father's he secures your consent to become his disciple 
he knows that if once you consent to sit with him he will in the end dominate your will also but you ask for three days delay and this he grants during every moment of those three days he will keep you under surveillance almost at once he guesses at your plan for you return to the house you write a letter and the moment you leave your room he enters it and sees the impression on the blotter he follows you into the grounds he sees you throw the letter over the wall and suspects that you are calling swain to your aid more than that lester he added turning to me he saw you in the tree and so kept up his midnight fireworks on the off chance that you might be watching yes that explains that too i agreed thoughtfully when he realizes that you are asking your lover's aid godfrey continued to miss vaughan a fiendish idea springs into his mind if swain answers the call if he enters the grounds he will separate him from you once for all by causing him to be found guilty of killing your father he hastens back to the house tears the leaf from the album of fingerprints and prepares the rubber gloves that night he follows you when you leave the house he overhears your talk in the arbor and he finds that there is another reason than that of jealousy why he must act at once if your father is found to be insane the will drawn up only three days before will be invalid silva will lose everything not only you but the fortune already within his grasp he hurries to the house and tells your father of the rendezvous your father rushes out and brings you back after a bitter quarrel with swain which silva has of course foreseen you come up to your room your father flings himself into his chair again it is silva who has followed you who has purposely made a noise in order that you might think it was swain and he carries in his hand the blood-soaked handkerchief which swain dropped when he fled from the arbor up to this point godfrey went on more slowly everything is clear every detail fits every other detail perfectly but in the next step of the tragedy one detail is uncertain whose hand was it drew the cord around your father's throat i am inclined to think it was mahboob's if silva had done the deed he would probably have chosen a method less oriental but mahboob even under hypnotic suggestion would kill only in the way to which he was accustomed pardon me he added quickly as she shrank into her chair i have forgotten how repellent this must be to you i have spoken brutally please go on she murmured it is right that i should hear it i can bear it there is not much more to tell said godfrey gently whoever it was that drew the cord it was silva who moistened the glove from the blood-soaked handkerchief made the marks upon your father's robe and then dropped the handkerchief beside his chair then he returned softly to his room closed the door put away the glove cleansed his hands made sure that mahboob was in his closet took his place upon the divan and waited i think we know the rest and now lester he added turning to me we would better be getting to town remember swain is still in the tombs you are right i said and rose to take my leave but miss vaughan her eyes shining stopped me with a hand upon my sleeve i should like to go with you mr lester she said may i the colour deepened in her cheeks as she met my gaze and i understood what was in her heart so did godfrey i'll have my car around in ten minutes he said and hastened away i have only to put on my hat said miss vaughan and i found her waiting for me in the library when i entered it after arranging with simmons and goldberger to appear with me in the tombs court and join me in asking for swain's release godfrey's car came up the drive a moment later and we were off the hour that followed was a silent one godfrey was soon sufficiently occupied in guiding the car through the tangle of traffic miss vaughan leaned back in a corner of the tonneau lost in thought it was just six days since i had seen her first but those six days had left their mark upon her perhaps in time happiness would banish that shadow from her eyes and that tremulousness from her lips every battle leaves its mark even on the victor and the battle she had fought had been a desperate one but as i looked at her she seemed more complete more desirable than she had ever been i could only hope that swain would measure up to her at last we drew up before the grey stone building whose barred windows and high wall marked the prison here we are i said and helped her to alight godfrey greeted the doorkeeper as an old friend and after a whispered word we were allowed to pass a guard showed us into a bare waiting-room and godfrey hastened away to explain our errand to the warden won't you sit down i asked but my companion shook her head with a frightened little smile and paced nervously up and down her hands against her heart how riotously it was beating i could guess with what hope what fear 
there was a quick step in the corridor and she stood as if turned to stone then the door was flung open and with radiant face she walked straight into the outstretched arms of the man who stood there i heard her muffled sob as the arms closed about her and she hid her face against his shoulder then a hand was laid upon my sleeve come along lester said godfrey softly this case is ended end of chapter twenty seven end of the gloved hand by burton e stevenson